<laughs> uh, hey, boys and girls, it's me, uh, Mr. Creepypasta, and, uh, Billy. Billy and I are ready for the holidays, if you can't tell from the lovely tree and all of our festive nature. I'm sure all of you have plans as well, but, you know, I guess... Oh. What is... You guys heard that too, right? Billy, I think we might have an intruder! Merry Christmas! Santa Claus? <laughs> MCP and Billy, is it? Yeah, that's us. That is definitely us. I need your help restoring the spirit of Christmas. And as you know, Christmas, the Christmas spirit can only be restored with one thing. Horror. What truly brings families together is fear. <laughs> well, if Santa Claus needs our help, we can't turn him down, can we? Don't you worry, Santa. We got your back. Uh, it's horror story you want, horror story you get. We're restoring the Christmas magic. We're going to save Christmas. You ready, guys? That's right, Billy. Finally getting what we've always wanted. Saving Santa. Uh, let's see now. What's a, what's a good one? A nice Christmas spirity store. Ah! <laughs> I got one. This is going to be a good one, too. You ready, kids? Because... Ah, yes. Here it is. A Christmas I'll never forget. Winter was always the hardest time of year for me out there. Growing up in the north of Britain, the month of December always held connotations of snow and ice to me, but out in the vast Mojave Desert, the winter seemed like a world away. Now don't get me wrong, I loved the way the heat singed horizon smashed into the virgin blue sky, the dizzying expanse of bright yet distant stars above my trailer and the comfortable emptiness of the sands. But every year, when winter rolled in, I always felt like something was missing. I'm not exactly sure when it began, so to speak. These things never have a concrete start date. A man does not simply wake up in the morning having lost his mind. No, insanity, like most of the horrors in the world, is slow. It creeps. It grows. I think, though, the first time I saw it was December 19th. I love to hike, see? On weekends, I pull on my walking boots, grab my map, and just walk out into the desert. There's no better place in the far-flung reaches of the sand wastes to think, to be alone with your thoughts. The 19th was no different. I trudged through the heat, my mind far away, far, far away. For nearly an hour, I wandered wherever my legs took me. Across the brilliant sands, up steep slopes, past the skeletal figures of cacti, lost in thought, the figurative ghosts of my past swirling in the dust, kicked up by my footfalls. I was snapped out of my semi-aware state as my feet set the pebbles in front of me, plummeting down a sheer drop, the dusty rocks giving way to thin air. I swore as I watched the loose chunks of rock tumble into the chasm before me. Disequilibrium washed over me and I stumbled back away from the edge. Once I was back a good distance from the precipice, I took a deep breath. The view was amazing. I could see for at least 50 miles, maybe more. The straight rods of road pierced the irregular contours of the distant hills. Sand was blown into smooth curves, punctuated by the dark brown pores of scrub and desert grass. The magnificent desolation as Aldrin had described the surface of the moon truly felt like the surface of a far distant planet. It was so alien to me, a foreign inhospitable beauty. Of all the things that view had made me feel there was there was one that stuck with me the most. I felt like I was alone. Like I was the first man to set foot on this earth. 
The first man to feel its heat beneath my feet, to trace its curves with my thirsty eyes. There was no one else for a thousand miles. Something caught my eye a little up on the ridge. In my distraction, I hadn't noticed the dark outline that pierced the skyline like a needle. Tearing my eyes from the allure of the titanic desert for a second, I saw the viewing tower. It was a haphazard construction of bleached wood perched on the very edge of the cliff. About ten meters tall, a set of steps ran to a small covered observation deck at the top. Grinning at my discovery, I decided to try my luck and set out in a brisk walk towards it. Once I had straddled the small wire fence that surrounded it, I jogged towards the tower and started to ascend the steps. They creaked loudly, a horrendous cry that echoed across the desert. I could see through the slits down to the floor below as I climbed, my long, ingrained fear of heights beginning to raise the hairs on the back of my neck. Slowly, I made my way to the top and tried the door. It swung inwards on ancient hinges. The observation deck smelt of dust and dry mold. A thin layer of sandy sediment coated the floor and windows, sent swirling into incorporeal shapes by my forceful entry. In could see the mass graves of flies on the windowsill. Their long dried and decayed bodies lay, becoming part of the dust. A small magazine rack in one corner was the only furniture. But that didn't matter because the view, oh, the view was amazing. It was a little after lunch now and the bright sun reflected off the dunes creating a glittering mosaic of terracotta and pure white sand. I don't know how long I stood admiring the view. I was probably nearly half an hour mesmerized by its allure. Eventually, I felt myself drifting back into awareness and blinked rapidly to shake off the sense of disorientation. My interest wandered, eventually falling on the leaflet rack in the corner. That was entirely picked clean, save for one dog-eared pamphlet. Absent-mindedly, I picked it up and gazed on it. The grime-colored surface. Bright red text splashed across the cover displayed the words, Santa's Christmas Land. My face split into a semi-mocking grin at the unintentionally hilarious photo of the man himself on the front. He looked half asleep and the false beard strapped to his face was a mangy shade of off-white. Unfolded the flaps. I saw a map listing the park's attractions. Santa's workshop. Reindeer's pen. Elves village. The Christmas house. Winter pitch and putt. Polar ice tunnel. Nativity scene. I raised my eyebrows to the list of attractions. The photos were equally as laughable as the one on the front cover. Everything looked cheap or worn out. The so-called elves village appeared to be a couple of garden sheds dressed up in tinsel and plastic Christmas trees. The reindeer were plastic as well. Everything was made more bizarre by the fake snow that littered the building despite the sandy ground and the view of the searing desert behind them. Eyeing the address that was printed on the leaflet's rear, I saw the park was only about an hour's drive away from my trailer. With a chuckle, I folded the leaflet into my pocket and started off back down the steps, stealing one last glance at the unforgiving sand. I awoke at about half twelve on December 23rd, to the sight of a full ashtray and an empty ibuprofen packet. With a still throbbing headache, I picked my way across the darkened room towards the open bathroom door. Shit, I muttered, coughing up a wad of thick phlegm from the back of my throat and spitting into the nearby sink with a grimace. My reflection stared back at me through the cracks of the mirror, its eyes dark and baggy behind the grime. I gave it a grin, then regarded it instantly, recoiling at the sight of my plaque-coated teeth. Retreating back towards the bathroom, I straightened out my duvet on the mattress, then looked around the floor for a pair of jeans and a fresh shirt. I pulled on the least creased one and wandered out into the kitchen barefoot, running my hands through my rat's nest of hairs. 
The linoleum was cold under my feet, yet slightly sticky. As I fell down onto the worn sofa, I felt something sharp pressing into my back pocket. In annoyance, I slid in my hand and pulled out the junk that had prodded me. The offending item was a broken toothpick, which I discarded onto the floor. I rooted around and pulled the rest of the pocket's contents out. There were a few nickels, a tissue, but most interestingly, a folded leaflet. The memory of my hike up to the view tower came flooding back to me, and I smiled despite myself. I smoothed it out and tossed it onto the kitchen counter, distracted by the lure of the TV. Rooting around the litter-strewn floor for the remote, I retrieved it and pushed the big red button. The black box flicked on in front of me, accompanied by an angry hiss of static. I looked up and saw the TV was displaying just the blurry snowstorm that the sound signified. Piece of crap, I muttered, flicking through the channels, all displaying similar grainy screens. After checking a good twenty channels, I hissed in irritation and tossed the remote control away. My attention quickly turned back to the leaflet. I'll be the first to admit it made me curious. I wanted to see it for myself if it was anything near as entertaining as I had found the leaflet. It would be worth a look. I checked my watch, then pulled the plug on the TV and left the trailer, locking the door behind me. It took me a couple of hours to get to the park. I ended up taking the completely wrong road and heading away from it. After getting in the right track again, I soon pulled up in the car park. It was in the middle of nowhere, quite literally. There were no other buildings as far as the eye could see. A rusty sign hung over the parking lot, which was half blown over by sand. The park itself was set about 50 meters back from the road, encapsulated by a tall fence of wooden boards decorated by badly painted pictures of children playing amongst snow-dappled conifers. A huge gate in the middle held a pair of turnstiles underneath the banner of Santa's Christmas Land. I pulled out a cigarette from the pack in my pocket and leaned against the side of the car, smoking it and surveying the scene. There were only two other cars in the car park. They both looked like they had been there for some time, or at least as far as I could tell across the sea of discarded wrappers and burger cartons. It was silent, except for the sound of the hot wind. After finishing my cigarette, I stamped it out on the ground and went for the front entrance. The turnstile swung loosely in the breeze on rust-caked hinges. I pushed through hesitantly, seeing a small table next to the entrance, a dirty plastic ice cream tub labeled Honesty Box, $5. It contained only a couple of dead spiders and a single solitary dollar bill. Coldly, I rooted through my wallet and scraped out a few dollars to toss into the box. After I had paid my way in, I looked around. The park was built from porta cabins and old shipping containers arranged around a large, darkened house that slumped decrepit on a sea of dried scrub. The jauntily arranged plastic snowmen, icicles, and tinsel gave the entire scene an air of the bazaar. Dust swirled in the thick air, lazy and silent in the afternoon sun. I approached one of the nearest buildings labeled Nativity. The door was slightly ajar, so I pushed on it, and it creaked open. Throwing light onto the darkened room, a low wattage bulb hung flickering on the roof. As my eyes adjusted to the light, I closed the door behind me and entered into the heavy silence. The room contained several dusty dioramas of the Nativity, all flaking and covered in spider's webs. I looked at them disinterestedly already beginning to doubt the quality of this theme park. Somewhere in the distance I could hear the hum of an air con. The tiny motes of dust that coated the floor were distributed by my footprints into tiny clouds in the dim light. I was beginning to notice things like this in the uncomfortable silence. I progressed into the next room where things took a turn for the weird. The entire room was striped here. I could see Stands where dioramas had been, but they had all been spirited away. It was odd, but not entirely unsurprising from this crappy place. After looking through three more empty rooms, I gave up and left that cramped building. It looked like 
everything except the first diorama had been torn out. Like someone had decided they needed a tiny plastic Jesus in their life so much that they leaned over and stuffed the characters of the nativity scene into their jacket. It was almost laughable in its pathetic nature. I wandered over to the reindeer pen and stared at the plastic animals for a few minutes, lighting up another cigarette as I did so. The silence hanging heavily in the air was overwhelming. I could feel a hundred tiny pinpricks on my back, like the pressure of someone's eyes burrowing into me from behind. I turned to look in paranoia, but still, the big house remained dark and empty. Not a soul in sight. On the horizon, the sun, a golden bullet hole in the flesh of the sky, was melting away into the distant mountains, setting my fragile world into a squalid half-light and casting dark dancing shadows across the walls and window frames. Lighting another cigarette to replace the burnt-out one, I took deep, shaky breaths. Coming here had been a bad idea. I saw that now. I felt the sticky evening heat crawling over my body, and my flesh quivered slightly. My next stop, according to the rusty signs that covered the park, was the Elves' Village. The Elves' Village was, in reality, a set of garden sheds, as depicted so humorously by the leaflet. In real life, though, they just looked sad. As I approached the nearest one, there was a clatter from within. I hesitated, realizing someone might be inside. As I approached the nearest one, there was a clatter from within. I hesitated, realizing someone might be inside. Hello? I called nervously through my clamped teeth. Anyone there? There was another sharp banging followed by a smash. Are you alright? I tried the handle. It was stiff. But with a bit of force, I hit it open and half stumbled into the shed. The place was a mess. There was torn up wrapping paper coating the floor along with a few smashed snow globes. Animal feces was stained all along the wood. And it reeked. I saw the source of the noise, a small disheveled cat huddled in the corner. It meowed at me loudly before jumping up and sprinting out in between my legs. I half laughed in relief following the animal as it disappeared round the big house with my eyes. It was gone. I looked around inside, recoiling once more at the smell before slamming the door. It must have been living in there for some time. It seemed odd that such a small animal could have survived out here. The place seemed completely empty, and coyotes that ate cats like that for a light snack were on the wastelands at night. It was certain that I wasn't going back in through those vomit-inducing sheds. So I followed the cat in the direction of the big house. When I got to the front door, though, I was dismayed when I was met with the spray-painted words, Closed for Repair. A hefty padlock further dissuaded anyone who dared to doubt the words. I raised an eyebrow in annoyance, and was almost ready to call it a day when I heard the noise coming from that house. It sounded like the cat again. From somewhere within the derelict structure, it was wailing pitifully. The noise was like nails being dragged down a chalkboard, but definitely came from an animal. An animal that was, by the sound of it, in some kind of indescribable pain. What can I say? The next thing I knew, I was skirting the edge of the house. The next thing I knew, I was levering open the basement window. Next thing I knew... I was lowering myself down onto the dusty floor. And next thing I knew, I was inside. The basement was lined wall to wall with cardboard boxes, all overflowing with Christmas decorations with only the fading light of the window to illuminate the room i picked my way around the maze of boxes and went for the light switch there was a flick and a sharp buzzing from somewhere within the building but no light came on shit i hissed nervously eyeing the dark crevices not wanting to be caught in an abandoned house in the pitch dark 
My eyes fell on a small electric lamp shaped like the head and shoulders of Santa Claus. Praying it still had batteries, I flicked the switch and it spilled a feeble orange glow out onto the room. Well, anything was better than using my lighter. The stairs up were covered in dust like everything else, but on the third step from the top I saw a pair of footprints in the sediment, like someone had been walking down, then changed their mind. I felt a bit foolish as I emerged into the hallway, covered in cobwebs and toting a kid's Santa lamp. The desperate screeching came again, though, and it spurred me on. The hall seemed like any other at Christmas, albeit abandoned. Leaflets for Santa's Christmas land littered the floor, trampled into the threadbare carpet. Some faded fairy lights were strung along the walls, and much to my surprise, they were blinking weakly. Hello? I felt bile rise in my throat as I came to the realization that my assumption of emptiness may have been premature. Are you alright? I decided my best option was to find this goddamn cat and get the hell out of here. Somewhere from the depths of the house I could hear, all I want for Christmas is you, drifting through the seemingly abandoned halls. It was muted by thick walls and carpets, but still recognizable. I repeated my greeting, but there was no response. Stealing myself, I glanced down the hallway, trying to discern where the noises were coming from. Eventually, I elected to head in the direction of the kitchen. This place had at least three floors, so I had to search them one by one. The kitchen door was half ajar, so I approached. I took a nervous glance inside, fingers playing apprehensively on the door handle. Like the hall, the kitchen was lit by cheap Christmas lights which pulsed maddeningly, shining on the cracked tiles in sticky orange, pink, green, red, and blue. Plastic food was arranged jauntily along the work surfaces, adding to the artificial air. With a creak, I pushed into the room and looked around. Empty. I breathed a sigh of relief and raised my Santa's lantern to look. The room seemed like any other kitchen save for plastic food and overabundance of Christmas decorations and dust. Footprints crisscrossed the floor in seemingly random patterns. God knows how long they've been there. The rest of the first floor seemed normal enough, similarly decorated. There was a living room, a small crappy toilet, a cloakroom, and a single locked door which I left in state. Although the sign on the entrance had read dining room. It was only when I got to the stairwell that things started to get weird. A Santa Claus lawn ornament hung from one of the banisters. As in, hung with a noose. In this case, a noose made of tinsel. I gulped slowly at this macabre sight, rubbing my own neck skittishly. I kept my eyes firmly glued on the executed ornament as I climbed the stairs, half expecting it to come to life. Fortunately, no such sinister reanimation occurred, so I sidestepped it, leaving it still swinging in thin air. The landing was cordoned off with those ropes that you often get in theme parks or at airports, directing you into the rooms in specific order. The first room I entered was completely empty, as bare as the nativity scene had been. I crossed the landing and tried the next room. This one, oh, this one, was slightly more sinister. It was filled with puppets, just ordinary marionettes or finger puppets, many of them dressed as Santa Claus or elves. I felt a shiver crawl down my spine as I entered. In the fading light, their painted eyes glinted dangerously. That's when he came from behind. He must have been hiding amongst the puppets or something. I felt a set of strings slip around my neck. 
tangling across my head. I struggled as whoever was on the other side pulled tight. They snapped, flicking across the room. Suddenly free, I jumped forward away from my would-be strangler, but he was still upon me. He slammed the puppets against my temple, impact jarring my vision. I slipped, legs buckling beneath me. The attacker was atop me. He grabbed my collar. He began to assault me with a marionette once again. The vicious blows resounding through my skull as the man straddled me and began to put more and more weight into his impacts. I could just see the Santa lamp rolling away from me on the floor as I blacked out. I don't know what time it was when I awoke. A pair of thick curtains cast the room in perpetual gloom, nor did I know exactly where I was. I was lying on a bed, underneath a duvet cover. My hands were bound by duct tape, so were my legs, so was my mouth. I couldn't feel the reassuring weight of my phone in my pocket. Resisting the urge to scream silently and writhe, I steadied my breathing and tried to let my eyes adjust to the low light. As my pupils dilated, I saw that I was in a child's bedroom. The walls were basted with wallpaper depicting Santa Claus and toys were strewn across the floor. There was a fireplace in one corner with a wooden board in front of it. As I looked down, I saw the quilt was a child's also depicting several teddy bears having a picnic. The entire scene was lit once again by Christmas lights. It's hard to describe how scared I was right then. My entire body was shivering my mind though. My mind was even worse. It reeled nauseatingly, my vision swirling in a sickening dizziness. I started to sob. I felt... No. No, I knew. I was going to die. It was horrible. There was a plate of cookies on the nightstand and a tall glass of milk. It looked like they had been there for years. Cobwebs covered the biscuits where they had brown and caked with some kind of hairy mold. I swear, one even had a mushroom sticking out of it. And the milk, though, the milk was even worse. It was nigh on solid, streaked with dark, curdled veins, and had a thick sheen of green growing on the surface. The smell emanating from them was almost enough to make me vomit through my gag. The plate was labeled by a small index card. For Santa. I spent the next few hours before he came, sobbing out of fear. I was I was nearly in shock when he opened the door, breathing raggedly and heavy through my clogged nose. He was wearing one of those overhead masks, rubber or latex or something. This one was modeled after a reindeer. Heck, he'd even taped on a red nose. I moaned loudly through the gag when I saw him. Eyes wide, I shook my head desperately and began edging backwards further into the bed don't worry his face was high and slow it definitely belonged to a man though don't worry he repeated we're just going to celebrate christmas he tried to stifle a giggle but failed we're, we're going to have a great christmas <laughs> approached me, boots squeaking on the floor. It's gonna be the best Christmas ever! He muttered through gritted teeth as he closed in. The man reached out and threw back the duvet cover. Briskly, he grabbed me by the scalp and tossed me to the floor, my head hitting the carpet with a crack. I let out a muffled scream as he slammed my head against the floor again. I think that was about when I blacked out for the second time. When I awoke, my captor was gone. I was still on the floor in a pool of dried blood. He must have removed my gag and the duct tape from my limbs when I was out. I jumped up, running straight for the door. The adrenaline coursing through my veins imbued me with an unprecedented strength, and I rattled the handle with the ferocity of a lion. It wasn't enough. The wooden slab stood firm. Fuck you! Fuck you, I yelled repeatedly, sobbing loudly as I did, and slamming my fist against the door. Fucking let me out, you bastard! As I roared, someone on the other side hit play on the stereo, and I heard Slade's Merry Christmas Everybody begin to blast, drowning out my anguished cries. Shit. <laughs>
it. I muttered, tears running down my face. Slade was on loop for a couple of hours. In that time, I attempted climbing out of the windows. An escape attempt rapidly halted by my crippling vertigo. Yelled myself hoarse, tore down the wallpaper. But most of all, I sat huddled in the corner. Sobbing. I think I must have listened to Slade nearly a thousand times. But it finally stopped. I looked up from my corner at the door. Hello, I whispered. Are you there? There was a light tapping on the door before whoever was on the other end retreated into silence. Dawn broke outside the window. I could still see my car in the parking lot from, from the vantage point. I must have been on the third floor or, or even the attic. On the distant highway, the occasional car passed. Desperately, I tried to catch their attention, but of course, it was in an effort in vain. They were never going to see me from this far away. He came again just after dawn. This time, when I heard him approach, I ran to the door and pressed myself against it, trying to stop him from getting in. He was too strong and kicked open the door. I stumbled to the floor, weak and bruised. He burst in and began once again raining blows on me. I curled into the fetal position, trying to protect myself. He pulled out a rag and pressed it against my face, holding me down. The harsh chemical smell filled my nostrils and sent my mind reeling. My head began to spin and the room became a blur. I wasn't in the room when I awoke. I was somewhere else. It looked like a dining room. A long table stretched in front of me, piled with the same plastic food that I'd seen in the kitchen. In the corner, a TV blared loudly, showing the movie It's a Wonderful Life. Warmth spilled out from a traditional fireplace. Once again, though, I had been gagged and bound. He sat at the other end of the table. For the first time, I could see his face. He looked maybe 40, with a, with thinning blonde hair, a, a strong chin, a mustache on his upper lip. He had lines on his forehead, but now he was smiling a thin, vicious grin. I groaned through my gag. My eyes stared daggers into him. D don't look at me like that. I had to take special measures to get you into the Christmas spirit. You're, you're going to be Scrooge on Christmas Eve, aren't you? I continued boring into him with my dark eyes. I, I talked to Santa. It seems that you've been a very naughty boy this year, haven't you, Jack? I shook my head, wanting him not to go there. He chuckled slowly, standing. <laughs> you know what naughty boys get for Christmas, don't you? He approached the fireplace. Pulled out a pair of tongs from the rack. He prodded the fire for a minute before, before tightening them around one of the embers. <laughs> they... they, they they only get coal. <laughs> he laughed, holding a chunk of burning coal up to the light. It glowed dangerously. The heat searing my skin as he brought it close to my face. I closed my eyes, bracing for the inevitable impact. He laughed at first quietly, then louder, shaking his head. He moved the burning coal away from my face and tossed it back into the fireplace. Relax. I wouldn't do that to you. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> Not on Christmas. <laughs> His laugh echoed loudly in my ears. Dropped the tongs on the floor. I breathed heavily in relief. Let's have, let's, let's have a bit of Christmas dinner. <laughs> I merely nodded obediently. Good, good, good. He purred and went towards the plastic turkey. 
I wriggled my hands while he was distracted, trying to free them from the duct tape that kept me bound to the chair. I twisted my wrist, and after a few seconds, my hands... Oh, my hands were free. Looking up, I saw my captor was still preoccupied, but before I went to unpeel my other hand, I spotted a steak knife on the mess of junk on the table, checking. He still wasn't looking. I reached up and grabbed it just as he looked up. I pulled my arm back behind me. Slipped the knife under my sleeve. Do you want some turkey? I dropped the plate down in front of me. It looked like he had attempted to, to serve the plastic turkey. Tearing into shreds and had piled the shreds of polymer onto my plate. We sat in silence for a moment as the man pretended to eat the turkey. <laughs> <It's> right. <laughs> Enough of this bullshit. We'll get, we'll get our presents out. He pulled out a neatly wrapped gift from underneath the table adorned with fancy bow and a label. It says... It says, To Jack from Carl Winters. <laughs> he smiled warmly at me, placing it down in front of me. Go on! Go on! Open it! He motioned. After a few seconds, he raised his eyebrows and sighed. Fine. I'll open it for you. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> he muttered darkly to himself as he tore through the wrapping paper, just too quietly for me to hear. As the brightly colored wrapping paper fell away, I saw the shape of a high-end food processor emerge. He smiled proudly at me as it was fully removed from its wrapping. It's a food processor top of the range. I thought you could use it in the in the the <laughs> trailer. A trailer of yours. <laughs> His voice trailed off as he saw my expression. What? <laughs> what? Don't you like it? He asked me. His smile now strained, and his teeth gritted. After a few seconds of silence, he nodded slowly. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's fine. It, it was it was expensive, you know. <laughs> I paid for it with my right hand, you know. <laughs> but you don't like it? That's fine. That's fine. I put a lot of work into the wrapping, but it's okay. You didn't even want to open it. His voice began to raise. Getting closer and closer to shouting, after a few seconds of fervent nodding, he sat and raised his eyebrows expectantly. Well? He sat there looking at me. What if he got me? The man searched me with his eyes. What? 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 Have you got me? He said again more firmly. There was a second or two of silence. Suddenly, he snapped, tossing the chair across the room. What have you fucking gotten me for Christmas? The man roared. Tell me, you insolent piece of shit! I must have cowered back away from him because his face suddenly twisted in rage. You haven't gotten me anything! He screamed loudly. You wouldn't get your own father a Christmas present! He ran to the fire and grabbed the poker from the rack. I'll teach you the Christmas spirit, you insolent little brat! The man raised the poker above his head. That was when I struck with a knife. I slammed it into his abdomen about where his kidney should be. He squealed in pain and dropped the poker, clutching desperately at his wound. What have you done? I just, just, just wanted the family together at Christmas. I cut him off again with another stab at the abdomen, this time in the area of his digestive tract. Using what precise time the attack afforded me, I peeled off my hand and started at my leg. The man just stood there, blood running down his shirt and pooling on the floor below him. His face was pale. Slowly, he began to hum. I recognized the tune of Jingle Bells. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, I was free. He looked up from his wound at me, still humming. Slowly, he leant down for the poker. I kept at the same pace as him, backing for the door. Neither of us making a sudden movement. Jingle bell, jingle bell, began to murmur. His fingers clasping on the poker, mind the doorknob. Jingle all the way. 
He roared loudly and raised the poker. I tore open the door and sprinted through. Just seeing him jump at the table and come at me, I slipped away down the corridor. I had no idea how to get out of that labyrinth house. I guessed we were somewhere on the third floor still, so I searched desperately for the stairs. When I found them, I took them two at a time, my captor right behind me. I could almost feel his breath on the back of my neck and heard the whoosh as he swiped with the poker. I saw the hanging garden ornament once again, and some bastion of hope in my heart opened when I realized I was on the ground floor. The main entrance was just 10 meters away. I ran to it, but suddenly I felt the ground fall from beneath my feet. The rug that covered the floor slipped and sent me tumbling to the ground. He was on me and prepared a blow with the poker. I brought the knife to his throat with a wet shock. His eyes widened. I pushed him off, blood gushing down onto my clothes and face. Through his fluid cough, I heard a murmur. Merry... <laughs> Merry Christmas to all. To all. A good... A good... And to this day, Marie should still be the queen of a country in which shimmering Christmas forests and glazed marzipan castles, in short, the most marvelous thing you can imagine, can be seen if you only look. The end. With a sigh, little Timmy slowly closed the book, gets up, and places it on his corner of books, as his mother calls the pile at the corner of his room where Timmy puts his books. Did you finish that already, honey? Yeah, Timmy responds, his soft voice trembling from the cold. Did you like it? I'll take you to the bookshop to get another one for the holidays when the weather becomes better, Timmy's mother said, before she's struck by a coughing fit. It's been snowing heavily for days now, and the two of them have been trapped in their home, while the old stove in the basement has broken down and there's no heat in the house. It's okay, Mom. I don't need one right now. Timmy, despite his young age, knows his mother doesn't have much money and doesn't want to put pressure on her. He jumps on the couch next to his mother and she strokes his hair affectionately as the two of them huddle together to fight off the growing cold. During the night. It was just past midnight and little Timmy is laying in his bed tightly clutching his ragged blanket close to his chest. He's having trouble going to sleep. His mother's muffled cries and raspy coughing can be heard through the wall. He pulls the blanket over his head to fend off both the lingering cold and his mother's suffering. Having trouble sleeping, little one. A voice speaks up from the foot of the bed. With a swift move, a wooden nutcracker toy soldier climbs onto the bed and sits on little Timmy's leg. Little Timmy peeks out from under the blanket. Hi, Alexander, the boy says with a frail voice. Worried about your mother, huh? The toy soldier says, readjusting the wooden hat on his wooden head. Little Timmy nods in agreement. She's having another rough night, isn't she? Alexander pauses for a second. But I heard you just finished your book. How was it? It's good. You're not in the mood for talking, eh? Alexander scratches off a wood chip from his knee. He looks sternly at little Timmy. Tell you what, lad. I'll take care of this. I'll go down to the basement and see what I can do about the stove. I want to help too, little Timmy says, his voice stronger. That's the spirit, lad. Have a good night's sleep now. With that, Alexander takes a bow and jumps off the bed. Little Timmy is very glad he has Alexander. He's shy, sickly, and small in frame. He doesn't have many that he can call friends. Alexander is there for him ever since he can remember, taking care of him since he was young. 
These thoughts float in Timmy's mind as he falls into the warm embrace of a deep sleep. The morning comes. Little Timmy spends the day taking care of his mother. He cleans around the house, cooks, and caters to her needs. Her condition has worsened during the night. She is feverish. She can't stop coughing. She is stuck to her bed for the whole day. To keep her warm, Timmy gives her his blanket. No matter how she refused. Still, the house is terribly cold. And the stove remains broken. Night falls again. Timmy bids his mother good night and goes for his bed. He has no blanket. Instead, he uses the heaviest clothes that he can find in his wardrobe. Still, the cold is stinging and harsh. With a trembling breath, he lays down and closes his eyes. Psst. Rad, are you asleep? Alexander opens the toy chest and walks slowly toward the bed. Little Timmy groggily opens his eyes. The mustachioed face of the soldier greets him. Sorry to wake you up, but I think I found what the problem is with the stove. The basement is covered in snow. In snow? How? Timmy's timid voice speaks out. There's snow everywhere. On the floor, the shelves, everywhere, I say. Uh, how is this pot? Timmy's sentence is interrupted by heavy coughs from his mother's room. Alexander looks at little Timmy stoically. Tomorrow... I'll go down there and take care of it. Do not worry, lad. The toy soldier tries to soothe Timmy. Suddenly, the sound of a door slamming shut echoes across the house. Little Timmy gasps. It must have been the wind, Alexander says. Then outside the room, footsteps. Slow, unsteady footsteps like someone is dragging his feet. Little Timmy hides under the covers while Alexander stands up. The footsteps abruptly stop. The door to his mother's room creaks open. The footsteps... Resume. Someone has entered the room. Stay here, lad. Alexander whispers to little Timmy before he jumps down from the bed and goes for the door. He jumps to the handle and pulls it down, but the door does not open. Locked. The door to his mother's room closes shut. Timmy starts sobbing lightly. Alexander frantically jumps around the room, trying to find the key. Then, from his mother's room, a loud moan. Mom? Timmy cries. Alexander is livid. Eyes darting around and mind racing for a way out. The moan gets louder and louder until they suddenly stop. Replaced by rhythmic wheezing. Alexander moves a stool under the handle. Climbs on and jams his metal sword in the lock and frantically moves it around. The door clicks open and the toy soldier jumps out. His wooden boots clacking against the cold floor. He runs to Timmy's mother's room. But as he reaches the door, it swings open and a wild gust of wind blows into the hallway, lifting Alexander and slamming him against the wall. Then an eerie silence falls upon the house. Only the muffled crying of little Timmy and the heavy breathing of his mother disturb the stillness of the cold night. The weak morning sun rays break through the dark clouds. Mom? Mom, please wake up. Little Timmy begs his mother. She's grown deathly pale. She's very cold. She's breathing with difficulty and... She's shaking. I warmed you some milk. Please drink it. It'll do you some good. She does not respond. Lost deep in feverish dreams. Little Timmy places the glass of milk on the nightstand and turns to leave. He has a lot of homework to do. During the day, though, he takes great care to stay away from the basement door. The moon shines brightly in the sky. Lad, is everything all right? Alexander jumps from the toy chest and sits on the windowsill next to little Timmy, who's been staring out of the window for the past hour. Alexander's left hand is bruised, and its red paint is scratched off, while a button is missing from his torso from the scuffle last night. I've gathered some wood and dry branches. I will light the old stove, and we will be warm again. What about the thing? Don't be scared, little Timmy. Alexander will take care of it, the toy soldier says with a warm smile. Anyway, I see you started writing the story you were telling me about, he says, pointing at the notebook by the nightstand. How's it going? This must be fun. It's great. I'm at the part where Jack sneaks into the Mouse King's castle to save Eliza. 
Oh. I'm so eager to read it. Jack sounds like a very fine lad. He is very brave. But he's not as brave as his guardian. Little Timmy says, his gaze wandering off into the distance. Alexander sighs. Ah. <laughs> I'll go fire the stove up for a moment and I'll return to talk about your story more. Right, lad? Little Timmy gives Alexander a fleeting, nervous gaze, and Alexander bows his head and backs away. An hour has passed, and Alexander still hasn't returned, nor is the stove lit. Little Timmy is growing more anxious by the minute. He fears the worst. Thinking of what Alexander would do for him, he decides to go to the basement. With trembling hands, he opens the door. His mother is fast asleep. Little Timmy covers her exposed to the cold body with her blankets and starts the long walk toward the basement. Time seems to have stopped while Timmy makes his way to the basement door. The incessant wind has ceased blowing and the house is plunged into complete silence. He takes a deep breath and with shaking hands reaches for the doorknob. The old door opens, the rusty hinges groaning under the weight of the metal door. The cold breath of the darkness below hits little Timmy in the face. For a moment, his will falters, but he steals himself, and he pushes his legs down the slippery stairs. The open, dark mouth of the basement below stares back into his little heart. Slowly, but steadily, little Timmy descends into the abyss. The further down he goes, the colder and darker it gets. Snow and ice have formed on the stairs. Then, Timmy reaches the floor of the basement. He gets on his toes to reach the little switch, but it's completely frozen and stuck in place. Darkness and cold envelops the little boy. In front of him stands the old stove, asleep and dormant. All the boxes and old shelves around it are just shadows in the dark. Alexander, though, is nowhere to be seen. Timidly, little Timmy takes a step forward. As soon as his foot falls, a gust of wind blows from the back of the basement, swirling snow and stuff around. Timmy covers himself as best he can. When the ruckus stops, a tall, white silhouette stands in the middle of the room. The man-like creature is crouched over, its thin torso almost floating on its lean limbs. Its skin has a parch-like texture and breaks up here and there. The creature sniffs the air and turns towards Timmy. Its black eyes meet with his as the creature starts to move towards Timmy. You can only watch. Paralyzed. Over here! Alexander's voice echoes in the basement, pulling Timmy out of his trance. Little Timmy follows the voice and finds the toy soldier hiding under a shelf, a pile of wood by his side. He is in a very dire state. His torso is cracked, wooden splinters spurting out from his body, and his right leg is severed from the knee down. To stand up, he's using a branch as a crutch. We don't have much time. You need to go and put the wood into the stove. That will drive the creature away and heat the house. I will distract him. Quickly! Alexander starts hopping over to the other side of the room while little Timmy grabs the wood and branches and sneaks his way over to the stove. Over here, you big snowflake! Alexander shouts at the creature, which turns and gallops towards him, its bony spine arched back and its sharp claws clicking on the floor. Little Timmy is halfway to the stove, but he slips and the branches scatter across the floor with a loud noise. The creature stops in its tracks and turns towards the boy. It glances at the pile of wood on the floor and then to the stove. With a gritty laugh, it grabs the wood, which dissolves under its touch. It then moves closer to Timmy, who backs away as fast as he can. Alexander sprints as fast as one leg allows and gets between the creature and Timmy. Over my dead body! The soldier unsheathes his sword and stares down the vile beast. The beast falls on all fours and slowly prowls towards Alexander, who stands tall. Its shoulder blades bobbing up and down, it stops right in front of the soldier and looks down on him, its black eyes examining the little thing that stands between it and its prey. Alexander assumes a defensive stance. The beast goes to move over to him, to little Timmy, uninterested in the soldier. Alexander strikes its arms with two quick slashes, and two red streaks spatter across the floor. The beast lets out an angry cry. The soldier moves back on the defensive and steadies himself for little Timmy. 
Be strong. The little Timmy, he whispers under his breath. The beast lets out another bone-chilling cry and stands on its feet. When it comes back down, it strikes at Alexander, throwing him to the side. His head hits the hard wall, his hat splinters into a thousand pieces, and his sword thrown way out of his reach. The last thing the soldier sees before his strength leaves him is the creature lunging towards little Timmy, who screams in fear. Alexander's eyes close, and his world fades to black. Little Timmy is now backed against the corner of the basement. Clutching a box as a shield in front of him. The creature tears the box apart. Little Timmy starts crying, and the creature grabs his leg. The creature smashes Timmy against some cardboard boxes. Before it can grab him again, little Timmy opens his tearful eyes. On the opening of the stove stands Alexander. Both his legs broken off, half his torso gone, and his head cracked. Somehow he managed to climb the stove. Below him on the floor where he crawled are wooden splinters and parts of toy soldier. You made it, Little Timmy thinks as his heart is filled with new hope. The eyes of Alexander meet with Little Timmy. The wooden nutcracker soldier smiles warmly. I'll take care of it, lad. I promised. And with that, Alexander pushes himself into the old stove. Where the burst flares up powerful red flames, a blinding white light shoots out and the wave of heat that follows shakes the foundation of the whole room. First the stalactites quickly melted off, the snow evaporated into mist, then the wave engulfs the creature, its white skin catching fire like parchment. It lets out a scream of agony, flames shooting out of its body. A big hole of fire opens up at its chest as it falls to its knees. It looks at its hands as they're burning off of its body, scattering and evaporating upon hitting the floor. The creature finally evaporates into a dark smoke. Only little Timmy now stands in the basement. After he collects himself, he shakily exits. The house is now warm. He walks into his mother's room. The mother, the mother has set up on her bed calmly drinking the warm milk Timmy made for her earlier. Little Timmy runs to her, gives her a hug. In his warm, starlit room, little Timmy finishes writing his story. He gets up from his desk and he walks towards his toy chest. He carefully places the notebook on the wooden box. With the Mouse King defeated, Jack and Eliza lived happily ever after with Alex always watching them from above. Smiling warmly. Jack's ever-loving guardian. The end. If there was anyone to be found on Santa's naughty list, it was surely Cindy's older sister, Maddie. Cindy was eight, and Maddie was three years more and had never said a nice thing to Cindy in her life. Or so it seemed. Cindy is my favorite. Cindy is so pretty. Cindy this, Cindy that. These were the words from Maddie's mother that rang in Maddie's head through every day of the year. But especially around Christmas time, when Cindy was talking sweetly of gift giving and decorating and loving her family and friends. Cindy was sweet. But it was authentic. All she really wanted was to be loved by Maddie, the way she herself loved Maddie. Since Cindy was a baby, Maddie hadn't talked to her. Some of Cindy's earliest memories revolved around the constant sideways looks she would receive from Maddie, the passive aggression, the endless competitions of mother's affection. Cindy was always the one to receive it. But on certain days, she would ask her mother to pay Maddie some attention. Oh, your sister's fine, her mother would say. Your sister gets plenty of attention. And after saying this, her mother would usually give Maddie a half-hearted pat on the head. And then go right back to giving Cindy all the affection a child would ever need. It left a hollow place in Cindy, and when she tried to give Maddie the love she so desperately needed... Maddie would shun Cindy as if she were a leper. Now this year, Maddie had been extra bitter. Perhaps it was the additional attention Cindy garnered from her performance in the school's Christmas play, or it was the way Mom constantly bragged about Cindy's acting. 
She's the next Meryl Streep, I'm telling you. Cindy's mother would brag. For whatever the reason. Maddie took every chance she saw to torment her younger sister. Cindy woke up one morning with gum in her hair. Another day, she found that her underwear was soaked in honey. Her favorite dolls would go missing. The TV in her room, which Maddie wasn't allowed to have, was constantly unplugged. Yet Cindy's desire for her sister's acceptance continued through the month of December. She continued to be kind. She persisted in giving Maddie compliments when Mother did not. The gift at the top of Maddie's Christmas list was a brand new makeup kit. Cindy made sure that she would be the one to give it to her Christmas morning. Despite all this, Cindy had felt a wear and tear from all of Maddie's torments throughout the month, and it all came to a breaking point on Christmas Eve. The family sat at the Christmas Eve dinner table and ate ham and mashed potatoes and Christmas cookies. Cindy's mother had been bragging shamelessly all night long about Cindy's acting. There was no mention of Maddie, not at any point. Maddie was stewing and Cindy could see it. At one point, through all the bragging and praising and gloating, Maddie chimed in. I don't think Cindy's acting is that good, she said, matter-of-factly. It was as though a bomb had gone off in the room. Everyone looked at Maddie like they were unsure they'd heard correctly. It was like blasphemy. What kind of a thing is that to say? Asked Mother. Maddie shrugged. I don't know, said Maddie. I just think you're exaggerating a bit. I mean, she's decent. All the memories of Maddie's torments began to broil and fester in Cindy's mind. And now, here was Maddie, disparaging Cindy at the dinner table in front of the entire family, in front of the aunts and uncles and cousins and friends. At least I'm good at something, Cindy blurted. And just like that, Maddie retracted into a pile of shame. Cindy's words ring true and humiliating. Mother added fuel to the fire by shrugging at Maddie in a matter-of-fact manner. Your sister's got a point, said Mother. Cindy felt horrible as she watched Maddie sulk and trudge off towards the bathroom like a beaten dog. Cindy hated the power she held in her hands. That night, everyone hunkered down in their beds and waited for Santa to leave his gifts below the tree, but Cindy had trouble sleeping. It was midnight now. Cindy rarely found herself awake at this hour, but she knew why. Cindy removed her covers and hopped out of bed and tiptoed across her room. She was careful not to wake anyone. She opened her closet and grabbed Maddie's wrapped gift. She tiptoed down the dark hallway and dragged her fingers along the wall so as not to stumble around in the dark. I'll give Maddie her gift and tell her I'm sorry. And tell her I love her, Cindy thought to herself. That's what I'll do. And she'll be happy. And she'll forgive me, and maybe... She'll even say... She loves me, too. When Cindy arrived outside of Maddie's door, she heard strange shuffling noises coming from inside. Perhaps, Maddie was preparing another prank for Cindy. It was no matter. Cindy was going to walk in and give Maddie her present and try to make amends. Cindy opened the door just a crack. She was careful not to startle Maddie. It was so dark inside the room she couldn't see anything, but she could hear a great deal of shuffling inside the room. Cindy stared into the room for quite some time, patiently waiting for her eyes to adjust to the gloom. When her eyes adjusted, she saw an empty bed. She saw Maddie's wide, open window. She saw a seven-foot figure standing in the shadows. She saw the rounded cage upon its back. She saw Maddie sitting in the cage like a frightened bird. As Cindy's terrified eyes further adjusted to the dark, she saw the figure more clearly. It had a goat's head with large horns on top. Its eyes were red and impish and hostile. It wore a suit much like Santa Claus, and it even had jingling sleigh bells hanging from a few ends of its garments. 
Cindy stood frozen with fear as the creature glanced at her and gave her a nod and a wink. The creature made its way towards the window. As it did, the last Cindy saw of her sister with a look of fear and sadness and regret. And the creature left as Cindy stood there with the present in her hand. Down the chimney he will come with his great big grin. And you'll find that even the kitty are very liable to sin. What will Krampus say when he finds everyone sinning? What will Krampus say when he hears them sin, sin, sinning? My eyes shot open, reflexively tightening up and looking towards the door. It's 12.01 a.m. Christmas morning, and at any moment the door to the bedroom will burst open and my two beautiful children will run in, giggling with presents already in hand. Seconds passed. And nothing happened. It took a full minute before I could remember no one would be coming through the door this year. The kids' accident was only a couple months old. I wake up most mornings for the briefest moment every day. And I forget they're gone. I find myself just lying in bed, listening for their laughter. The cries for breakfast before the pain of losing them hits me as fresh as the day it happened. It was a car accident. I was supposed to pick them up after school, but work was running late. I called my daughter Samantha, who was 13, three years older than her brother Ryan, and told her they would have to walk home that day. It was only a couple blocks, and they had done it plenty of times before. It wasn't a big deal. Except that day, it would be. She was only a kid probably around the age of 24, and didn't see them crossing the street. She was probably texting, eating, or doing one of the hundred other things people do while driving, other than paying attention. It didn't matter. She hit both of them. And they didn't make it. Ryan died, there on the road, while the ambulance tried to bring Samantha to the hospital to save her life. which is not fast enough, and in the span of 15 minutes, my life was destroyed. Janet, my wife at the time, blamed me, of course. It wouldn't have happened if I had just picked them up from school like I was supposed to. She made it through the funeral and burials before leaving, and thinking back on it, I couldn't blame her. I can't stand the sight of myself, either. That's why all the mirrors in the house were shattered, and why the gun I bought last week was already loaded and waiting in the nightstand by the empty bed. All of these thoughts rushed through my head as I dragged myself out of bed and put my head in my hands. It's the first Christmas, spent alone. The house dark and empty. Last year, at this time, the kids were awake already and opening that one special present they picked out at the start of Christmas. The tree would be lit, casting a festive glow in the small living room. The smell of cocoa and coffee would be strong, but it was... It was the laughter and joy that would make me... wake up the most. See, as a parent, there's nothing better than seeing your kids excited and happy. And nothing does that more than opening presents on Christmas Day. I closed my eyes and I tried to collect my thoughts. 
but a sound from the living room grabbed my attention. It sounded like the soft thud of little feet trying to be quiet as they snuck through the house. A sound I hadn't heard in months. Shuffling off the bed, I made my way towards the sound, opening the door to the bedroom and looking out into the open living room. This is where they'd be sitting. Right under the tree. Presence in hand. Waiting for a sign that they could start ripping away the wrapping paper. Of course, no one is there now. The room was dark, the fake tree was still in its box, propped up against the wall and unopened. It hurt too much not to get ready for Christmas without them. And it hurt too much to try. Looking at the empty living room, I can almost feel them there, sitting, legs crossed, looking towards our room, waiting to see that we were ready. They would each get to open their one present and then get whatever was in their stockings, most likely dollar store toys and candies, but it was still exciting to them even though they were getting too old for the trinkets. It was never going to be that way again. This holy day of love and joy for everyone else would be a constant reminder of what I lost. Made worse by the fact that all other families, neighbors, and even strangers are coming together and putting aside their differences and problems to have this one special day, and here I am alone. The weight of the gun in my hand snaps me back from the cold, dark room that is my life now and reminds me that there is still a way out. I look towards the tree and I imagine that it's like it was last year. Blue and silver twine, circling bright blue LED lights, superhero and Disney character ornaments from theme parks and rest stops the kids always had to have, decadent glass orbs that were a wedding gift, and the two angels looking back at me, smiling and waiting for me to join them. You're coming, I thought, as I felt the metal gun pressed against my temple, and I pulled the trigger. <laughs> the sound was louder than anything I had ever experienced, and it came before the pain. So loud I couldn't see. The world went black as all of my senses faded until all I could experience was the roar between my ears. When the pain finally came, it was almost a relief. The sound didn't stop, but my focus shifted on what was an earth-shattering rumble to a drill-like sensation that started in my temple and was boring inward. The combination of sound and pain dropped me to my knees and the gun slipped out of my hands. Reflectively, my hand shot up to the source of the pain and found nothing. Not a mark at the spot. Just seconds ago, I shot a bullet. Can we open our presents now, Dad? A voice cut through the pain, and I struggled to open my eyes and find the source. The dark, empty room I was in moments ago was transformed. When my eyes finally pried open, the first thing I noticed was everything was bathed in a red flickering light. The glow coming from the back wall where the unopened Christmas tree used to sit, now in its place with a fully decorated tree. Instead of the blue and silver of years past, the tree was now dressed in red tinsel and lights that contained actual flickering flames that gave the appearance of the tree being consumed by fire. Blood-red ornaments seemed to drip the light throughout the tree and reflected the glow around the room. Sitting on the floor in front of me, presents in hand, were my children. Their matching green Christmas pajamas tinged red from the glowing tree, making them look muddy and unclean. Their backs were to me, but from where I was standing, I could see something was not right. Ryan's small right arm was bent unnaturally at the elbow, giving it an insect-like appearance, and the hand that rested on his present was twitching uncontrollably. The fingers tapping on the wrapping paper of the present at first seemed like he was trying to open it, but I could tell it was more of an involuntary spasm of pain. The floor under Samantha's crossed legs were covered in blood. I couldn't tell if it was coming from her or, or the present on her lap, maybe both. Her head turned towards me. When I could just about see her face, her neck gave out, and her head flopped back on a clearly broken bone. Empty jet black eyes looked directly into mine. A thin red trail of blood escaped her mouth, traveling upwards on her face, and started to pool in the corner of her right eye. Can we open our presents now, Dad? She asked again, her voice deeper than I remembered, with none of the joy or light she had while she was alive. I had to get out of the house. The pain in my head was unbearable and diluting my equilibrium. I managed to stumble out the front door. Outside was almost pitch black. All the lights on the street and neighborhood, they were off. The only light was coming from a full, 
blood moon casting an odd orange glow over everything in sight. A loud, wet-sounding thud caught my attention down the road, and I slowly made my way to the neighboring apartment building down the street. The pain came in waves, pressure building up in my skull and blinding me. It got so bad I fell to my knees. There wasn't anything around that could help. The streets were empty. All the houses and businesses' lights were off, and most looked boarded up and abandoned. Nothing looked like it did just yesterday. Once I was finally able to get moving again, I saw a light on in a living room a couple of houses down on the right where I fell. I walked towards the light. I could see a figure standing at the window looking out towards me, out towards the road. It was a woman, pale white skin, wearing a white wedding dress, and as I got closer, she raised her hand as if waving to me, and I saw the marks on her arm. There was a long, four-inch slit, starting from where her palms met her wrist, down to about her mid-forearm, blood slowly pumping out in thick rivulets down her arm and onto her white dress, staining it instantly. The pain flared up again, and I fell to a knee in front of the window. She looked down at me almost understandingly before she turned and disappeared inside her house. We couldn't help each other, but just as she seemed to understand what I was going through, I felt that I understood her loss as well. It was this day, Christmas Day. For most, it was a reminder of what they had, but for us, it was too much of a reminder for what we'd lost. I collected myself for a moment before another loud, wet thud brought me back. I pushed onward, trying to find a way out of this nightmare. The street's Christmas decorations were still up, but all the lights were dead. The usual joyful colors of green, red candy canes, and forest green wreaths looked dull and corroded on the seemingly abandoned buildings, ripped and haphazardly hung tinsel clung in patches to the dark street lights. Movement above me caught my attention. Hanging from the street light, almost hidden by moss-colored tinsel, was a slightly overweight man. He appeared to have been dead for some time, his dark features made even more obscure by the pooling of blood in his face and around the noose that he hung by his neck from. His large, fat tongue stuck out between his thick, swollen lips like a diseased, overgrown worm. He was dressed in a dirty Santa suit that seemed to have a lot of wear and not enough care on it, and I could smell the sweet and vile mixture of alcohol and vomit. Another wave of pain and pressure made me collapse into a ball directly under the man. The unkempt Santa's eyes shot open and he looked at me. He began to struggle and kick his legs, rocking himself violently back and forth, grunting for help. Just another soul, flamed by this unholy night. All I could do was crawl forward. The pain kept me from getting to my feet. I couldn't help the man. I couldn't help my family. I couldn't help myself. I heard the thud again, this time right behind me, the wet smack of flesh hitting a solid. I rolled over on my side and tried to get a good look on what was making the noise, and found myself staring into the bloodshot eyes of a man in a bloody and ripped up tailored suit. His body was smashed and broken. Blood leaked from his eyes and mouth into a dark, neatly trimmed goatee. He must have fell from the building off to my left. Some kind of business I couldn't tell, and reading or moving my head just caused the pain to intensify. As I looked into the man's eyes, his pupils began to shift. He seemed to be trying to focus on me. The bones seemed to rearrange themselves in his face, and his mouth twisted into a surprised frown. He tried to raise himself up on his hands and knees, but the bones in his forearms were breaking through the skin, and he shrieked in pain and collapsed back down. I could hear more grinding and tearing as his body shuddered. I watched in horror as the bones retreated back into his skin, and while screaming, he forced himself up once again. Standing in front of me, I could only see his body was almost completely healed. His left arm still hung lower off his shoulder socket, and he was standing with his left ankle completely bent sideways, but the pain seemed to have left him. Instead, what replaced the agony in his face was bewilderment. And as if I wasn't even there, he searched the surrounding area as if he was looking for something he lost. He quickly found what he was looking for and straightened himself out. I could see he was standing there with a worn and battered briefcase in his hand. He adjusted what was left of his Christmas tie and walked back into the building. I suspected that he fell from. If you couldn't see the dark spreading splotches of blood over the rip and tears in his suit, it would have looked just like any other corporate businessman going to work on Christmas morning. I needed to get out of here no matter what it took. 
I ignored the pain. I stood up. I blindly started running, not caring about the direction I was going in, only trying to get away from the awful things I was witnessing. Nothing could slow me down. Not the pain, not the roar in my head, not even the, the loud, wet thud of a body hitting the pavement again behind me. I ran until my legs wouldn't carry me anymore, and out of breath, I stumbled up to an abandoned house. The pain was too intense. I needed to lie down. Using my shoulder, I forced my way into the house and into the living room. The living room was dark. The fake tree was still in its box, propped up against the wall, unopened. It hurt too much not to get ready for Christmas without them. And then it hurt too much to try. Looking at the empty living room, I can almost feel them there. Sitting, legs crossed, looking towards our room. Waiting to see if we were ready. We would each get to open their one present and then get whatever was in their stockings. Mostly little dollar store toys, candy bars, but it was still exciting to them. Even though they were getting too old for the trinkets. It was never going to be that way again. I felt the weight of the gun in my hand. I imagined seeing the kids sitting by the tree. Imagine Christmas. How it was supposed to be. The best day of the year. The time when you're with your loved ones and all the pain is gone. I wanted their smiling faces to be the last thing that I thought about and I put the gun to my head with tears welling up in my eyes. I pulled the trigger. The sound was louder than anything I've ever experienced. And it came before the pain. Dear Santa Claus, have I been a good boy this year? I'm very curious, because the past few weeks, there have been some serious problems at home, and it seemed that I was the only one who knew what to do. I didn't want to do it. I knew it was wrong, but I had to. I just had to. My big brother Derek is at the hospital right now, sick as a dog. Nobody's quite sure if he'll live, but at least I know that I have some private time in a safe place where he can never pick on me again. Last time he did, it was on a snowy day. I begged and begged him to stop jumping up and down on my snowman, and to top it off, he swiped the carrot out of my hand and jammed it into his mouth. He said that he was just trying to get my attention because he found something amazing deep in the woods. Something beyond my wildest imagination. Out of curiosity, I followed him back into the woods. A jumble of trees and their long, leafless branches that seemed to imitate reaching arms. The journey seemed to take hours, and the sky quickly got darker. I was about to yell at Derek and call him an idiot for not bringing a flashlight, but I've learned from experience to never start an argument with him. We stopped at a wide, bare circle in the woods, where there were no trees, just one big piece of root protruding in the middle. Since it was so hard to see in the dim moonlight, it looked more like a hand with its bony fingers outstretched. Derek directed me to the root. He said he could grant wishes, and he could tell because when he first visited the area, he wished he knew the way back home, and when he first saw this root emerge from the ground, he just happened to know the way. It was like magic, he said. I squinted as I took a closer look at this thing, studying it. I thought maybe if we can pull it out, we'll keep it as a good luck charm. Derek told me he already tried that, and it stuck there, but that didn't stop me. We both grabbed onto it, and with all of our strength, it popped out, along with a loud, sickening snap. The force nearly threw us on our backs, but the magic root was ours now. I held it tight in my hands, and wished we knew the way back home. And just like Derek said, we did. I couldn't get over the worried expression from Mom, wondering where we were, but I thought for the first time it was worth it. Later that night, Derek and I kept the magic root under our bunk bed, the safest hiding spot for it, and hopped right into bed. Hours later, 
I was sound asleep in my bottom bunk until I felt something moving under my bed like a jumping bean. My eyes shot open when it started making bumping noises. Lucky for Derek, he was a heavy sleeper. My curiosity faded when the moving and jumping stopped. I was too tired to check it out, so I fell back to sleep, back in peace, hearing nothing but the winter wind blowing outside, which soon sounded a little more like screaming, as if there was somebody out there, somebody in pain. Next day was Monday, and Derek and I were too busy with our Christmas wish list to finish our homework, until I had an idea. I took the magic root from under our bunk beds and squeezed it tight, wishing our homework was done automatically. We looked over our unfinished math problems. Nothing happened. I wished harder. Still nothing. Annoyed, Derek rudely grabbed the root from my hand, saying that we should forget about it. But he still had it in his hand when he went back to his wish list. And suddenly, before our very eyes, right in front of us, was a video game system. We both wanted to burst out in amazement, but we also wanted to make sure Mom wasn't around, so we quickly locked the bedroom door, hooked the system up, and started playing. We also kept the volume as low as we could. Using the multiplayer mode for Nebula Zapper, Derek started to get frustrated because my high score was now four times higher than his. When I won the next round, Derek finally lost his temper and stomped on his controller, over and over, until nothing remained but a pile of plastic and wires. Then there was a knock on the door. It was Mom wondering what was going on. I tried to hide the video game system as fast as I could, but Derek rushed for the door and unlocked it, and Mom came into the room. Derek pointed at me, saying that I broke one of his video games, and Mom believed it. She even found our magic root and threw it in the trash. As usual, I didn't get a say in any of it. I was grounded from video games for the rest of the week, even when Derek took the root back out when Mom wasn't looking, and tried wishing again. It didn't work, causing him to stay mad a little longer. I still had trouble sleeping that night, but this time, I was wide awake and ready when the moving and bumping came back from under the bed. I quickly grabbed a flashlight and crouched down to take a look. The magic root was jumping, up and down, hitting the bed from beneath as if it were alive. I reached out and took the root by the stump, and the long, skinny ends of it curled up like fingers. I was going to wake up Derek and tell him about this, but before I could ponder any more, the other end of the root bent down, and the fingers wrapped themselves around my wrist, grabbing me tighter and tighter by the second. The tips dug into my flesh. With intolerable pain, I screamed at the top of my lungs, causing Derek to wake up. My mom must have heard me too, because she scrambled into the room with a handgun. She flipped on the light. I was going to show her the root that wouldn't let go of me, but... But it was gone. I glanced down to the floor around the room to see where it went. I just wasn't there. I explained to mom all that happened, where Derek found the magic root, its ability to grant wishes, and now it seemed to have a will of its own. Of course, Mom didn't believe me. She just scolded and lectured me, not only for wandering off in the woods last evening, not only breaking one of Derek's favorite video games, but now making up stories about a magic good luck charm. Good luck? Yeah, right, I thought. Soon enough, I was back in bed with tears running down my face. Hopefully I could still sit right tomorrow. The moving and bumping stopped, but the harsh wind outside still bothered me. As I was slowly drifting off to sleep, the whistling of the wind turned into screaming again. This time, whoever was out there sounded angry. Give it back. Give it back. Give it back. Shivering with fear, I pulled my covers up to my chin and placed my pillow over my head, wishing wishing the screams would go away. Tuesday afternoon. I was lying down on the sofa looking up at the ceiling, examining the cracks. Dr. Blackenship, the child psychologist whom mom called up, could tell I was not pleased having him here. 
Sitting on the chair, taking notes and scratching his beard now and then, he asked me if I was having any problems at school, or that my behavior was due to sibling rivalry with Derek. I shook my head and kept telling him about the magic root, and the fact that it really can grant wishes, and how it tried to hurt me last night. Feeling anxious, I rushed upstairs to the bedroom and found the root under the bed right where it shouldn't have been, and showed it to Dr. Blackenship. I squeezed it tight, closed my eyes, and tried to concentrate. I wished that Dr. Blackenship would disappear. Nothing happened. He was still sitting there, giving me a stern look. I wished for a thousand dollars. Nothing. World peace. Nothing. Free ice cream. Still nothing. With a scowl of frustration, I repeatedly banged the root against the wall and threw it on the floor. I jumped up and down on it, demanding it to work. I then noticed that my heart... My heart was beating very heavily, wondering why the root wasn't doing anything. Dr. Blackenship looked down at his notebook with a confused expression. He jotted down extra notes regarding what a fool I had just made of myself. I didn't want to eat my dinner that evening. I just looked down at my spaghetti, poking at it with my fork. When Derek's cup was empty, he took mine and slipped up all my hot chocolate. You could have just asked for a refill, jerk, I thought. I hoped maybe skipping to dessert might clear me up a bit, but Derek impatiently took both of our chocolate bars and shoved them into his mouth. Wrappers and all, my fury began to build up as he laughed with a mouthful. That's it, I screamed in my mind. I'm not going to take this anymore. I sprinted to Derek's side of the table and punched him right in the stomach as hard as I could. Derek fell out of his chair and landed hard on his shoulder, curled into a ball and let out a muffled scream of agony, but I didn't stop there. I kicked his back again and again before he had a chance to fight back. Even when Mom came into the kitchen to break up the fight, I didn't even glance at her. I gave Derek one last kick, then scrambled upstairs. I could hear Mom calling me to come back down and apologize, but I just went into the bedroom and locked the door. And a pitch black solitude. I leaned against the wall facing the door and sat down on the rug giving myself some time to calm down, taking deep breaths, relieved that I'd finally gotten my revenge. Drowning in my thoughts, I almost didn't notice how cold it was in this room. It was freezing cold. I turned to the window and saw that it was pried open. I stood up and closed it. I wrapped my arms around myself to stay warm. Suddenly, the wind was back. Only this time, it sounded like it was inside the room, right behind me. I slowly turned around, and what I saw in the dim moonlight, right in front of me, was a tall, skinny figure in a long, dusty old cloak, partially caked with dirt. I could still see the fading snowflake pattern on the collar and sleeves. It looked like an ancient. The pointy hood was down, so I, I couldn't see his face. But soft, eerie moans trailed off from the hood. Where is it? Where is it? I was standing stiff, trembling in fear. My throat was so dry I couldn't even whisper. I just shook my head as if to say, I don't know. The old sorcerer raised a thin, bony hand and pulled back the hood, revealing a bare skull with empty eye sockets and coal-black teeth. The jaws moved up and down. The black teeth clicked as it spoke again. speak. I couldn't move. In horror, I just stared straight ahead, watching as that sorcerer raised his other arm, revealing a cracked stump where a hand used to be. He used his other hand to point to the stump. This time, he screamed, Where is it? The jaw nearly unhinged itself. Just then, more bumping noises, a little louder than before. Finally, I caught my senses. I took a flashlight and looked under the bed. There was the root, jumping and squirming around. I reached out and pulled it out again. Even without eyes, it was like the sorcerer could see what I was holding, which I then realized was his hand, not a root, his hand. There it is, he whispered. There it is. The fingers were curling up again, 
as a sorcerer came closer to reclaim what rightfully belonged to him. Suddenly, we both heard a pounding on the door. It was Derek coming to fight me back. Let me in, he shouted. Let me in, you idiot! With that wish, the door swung open, filling the room with light from the hallway. With fury in his eyes, Derek stomped into the bedroom, ready to teach me a lesson, but stopped when he caught sight of the skeleton in the cloak and its empty eye socket staring down at him. Whimpering with fear, Derek quickly swiped away the hand and squeezed it, trying to wish the sorcerer away, but he still stood there, giving Derek that same look. He wished again. Nothing happened. Scared and confused, Derek dropped the hand on the floor, giving the sorcerer a chance to pick it up and place it back on his stump. The two pieces connected, making a sickening click sound. Poor Derek stood stiff, wondering what was going on. And it was at that moment I finally understood the method of his sorcerer's magic. He grants wishes individually. He takes turns. Derek already used his magic to open the door, and it won't work for him again unless someone else makes a wish. So that means it's my turn now, I thought. And the sorcerer knew it too. He turned to me, patiently waiting for me to make one last wish before he goes. With a smile on my face. I knew exactly what I wanted. All I wished for was joy and peace. And with that, the sorcerer opened the window dissolved into a mist and blew away into the cold, silent night, leaving a soft whisper in the wind. Thank, Thank you. you. The doctors couldn't figure out how, but Derek was soon down with extreme hypothermia. He can't seem to get warm even by a fire. His skin was now a cold shade of blue. He's getting short of breath and coughing blood every now and then. Mom pleaded me for the truth about what happened and what brought Derek to such a poor state. Well, like a good boy should, I told her the truth. She still didn't believe me. She even called the doctors on me and had them take me away like I was some kind of a crazy person or something. But it's the truth, Santa, I swear. If there really is a jolly fat man at the North Pole with elves and flying reindeer, then there sure as heck can be wish-granting sorcerers. On the other hand... I guess I did get my joy and peace as promised. Sitting back in my own little room, where I'll never have to worry about Derek again. And I hope you have a Merry Christmas too. Sincerely, Jimmy. Oh, P.S. Also, Santa, can you bring me a pocket knife? You know, so I can get out of this straight jacket. I was only a child when I saw Krampus. My family just immigrated to this country. We had left our every earthly possession behind with memories and stories of our homeland followed, followed us on our journey. Once we arrived, we immediately settled into the same ghetto that so many others from the Eastern European village had. A decrepit row of four-storied slums along an alleyway that was more sewer than street. Our father, during the few hours that he was home from the mill, said that we were better off here. My sister and I missed the deep forests and high mountains that we used to play in only a short time ago. Even when I tried to imagine myself back at home, my real home. The noise of the city always broke through my thoughts and brought me back into the alley. My mother tried her best to remind us of the old life. Often my sister and I would crawl into the bed that we shared. She would tell us the stories. The same stories she said that her mother had told her. Some of the stories were exciting. Others made us laugh. 
but a few terrified us. The most awful story told of an evil one who went to the deepest parts of winter to kidnap naughty children. We shuddered as she told us of how it would torment children just like us. Sometimes, he'd even pretend to fall asleep in the desperate hope that she would stop. But she always finished the story. Our father would often tell her not to fill our heads with such horrible things. Some tales from our homeland should remain there. Mother, though, would shake her head and quietly insist that it was dangerous to forget where we came from. Our lives continued like this for the next several months. I believed that I would eventually come to see our forgotten alleyway as home. But a sense of forgiveness persisted. In fact, it felt as though hardly anything had changed since we arrived. Our lives had neither improved nor gotten worse. And I still felt like an unwanted stranger in my own neighborhood. The only thing that had changed was our behavior. My sister and I had recently begun getting into trouble more often. I never meant to hurt anyone. It was just that we had so little and sometimes we had to steal if we wanted to eat that day. Usually our misdeeds were my sister's idea and I followed along. I guess one always looks up to their older sibling. I never believed that our petty crimes would ever have serious consequences, but looking back now, I can see that we were walking blindly down a dark path. I can even remember when things took an ominous turn. Ever since All Saints Day, our mother had been warning us to be good children. She pleaded with us to stop our bad behavior. I remember her crying a lot. Early in December, my sister got caught stealing a piece of fruit, and I thought my mother's heart would break. She began to shake and pull her rosary beads from her pocket. For the rest of the night, she clutched the beads tightly and desperately, repeating her prayers. When I finally asked her what was wrong, she paused, just long enough to glance at the window and hiss. He knows. He knows. It might be too late. I didn't know what she meant. But I was scared. My sister didn't seem to care. The days passed and the temperature dropped. It was the night before Christmas. And snow had begun to fall. The heat had already gone out several times and the flickering lights threatened to go out as well. As we would be attending the sunrise mass the next morning, my father told my sister and I to go bathe. Suddenly my mother began shrieking for us not to be alone. I heard my father quickly move towards her and began trying to comfort her with his deep, soft voice. She quieted down some, but still insisted that we not be alone. My father told us to take our baths quickly, and then join them. As we headed down the hallway towards the washroom, my sister sprinted ahead of me and stood in the doorway. I go first, she said. I won't be long, she laughed. I stomped my foot but said nothing as the door closed. On the best of days, there was barely enough warm water for everyone in our family to bathe. With the heat going out, there was... There was likely only enough warm water for a single bath. My sister knew this. I bounced from one foot to the other as I stood outside the door trying to warm them. I heard her draw the water and then begin singing softly to herself as she dipped in. After a few minutes, the singing had stopped and I began to fear that she had fallen asleep in the bathtub. But then I heard a noise, a sharp, clacking noise, like someone was wearing wooden shoes. It was slow, 
but deliberate. Almost like it was sneaking up on something. I knocked on the door and the clacking stopped. No answer. I assumed my sister was just ignoring me or possibly trying to irritate me as she often did. Then the noise began again. This time. Even slower. I pressed my ear to the door and held my breath. The clicking noise had stopped. But I could now hear a light tinkling sound, like the chime of a hundred bells playing in the distance. I listened until I could hear my own heartbeat. Then I heard a song splash. She hadn't fallen asleep. She was playing a game, waiting to see how long I would stand out in the cold hallway while she turned her fingers and toes into warm prunes. I knocked again louder this time. Still no answer. I was quite frustrated and cold by the time, and so, without another knock, I swung open the door and stepped inside. As I did, the power in our building went out. The hallway behind me plunged into total darkness and I heard my mother give a cry of fright. I blinked my eyes a few times, the small heater in the corner of the washroom cast an eerie orange glow across the room. Feeling my way until my eyes adjusted, I stepped around the curtain at the end of the tub and began to scold my sister for taking so long. But then I saw it. It was standing beside the tub, though it was hunched over. It must have stood nearly seven feet tall, with its horns adding another foot or so. Coarse black fur, like the pelt of a goat, covered its body. It had powerful legs that ended in hoofs, the source of the clicking noise. A thick tail whipped through the air behind it, like a cobra circling its prey. Heavy chains wrapped around its muscular shoulders and torso. As it inhaled and exhaled, the chains produced their bell-like chimes. Yellowed eyes that burned with a smoldering rage stared down from above its twisted nose. A wheezing, bubbling sort of breath passed through its fangs and incisors that extended so far from its molted gums that I didn't believe it could have possibly closed its mouth completely. A long pointed tongue hung down past its scarred and disfigured chin like some grotesque dog and thick globs of spittle collected at the corners of its mouth. One of those globs broke free and fell into the tub. It looked down. I saw its hands, long and hairless. Each finger ended in a sharp nail and was wrapped in the same kind of corpulent skin as a vulture's bald head. The result of too much exposure to rotting flesh. Then I noticed the thin wisps of hair floating up beneath its fingers. My sister's hair. The beast was holding her head under the water. I screamed only at this point did it look at me. It was not alarmed but rather seemed almost whimsically bemused, as if I was asking it a riddle that it already knew the answer to. Looking directly at me, it stood up its full height. Its horns now brushed the ceiling as it stood. It lifted my sister out of the water, my screams caught in my throat, and I began to choke. It held her with a single hand, each of its five sharp nails having pierced completely through her body. Strangely, the only coherent thought that passed through my mind at that moment was the hope that my sister had already drowned and could not feel the pain. The beast took a step towards me and gave a dry, shrill laugh that sounded like an animal being strangled. It held my sister out as if it were cruelly offering her body to me. Then we both heard the footsteps in the hallway. My parents were running to see what was the matter. The beast quickly wrapped heavy chains around my sister's lifeless body and cinched her to its back. Then, with surprising agility, it threw open the window and leapt onto the narrow ledge. It balanced there for a moment. 
and then turned to look at me one last time. Her eyes met in that moment. It burned the full horror of itself into my very soul. Then it leapt from the ledge and disappeared. My parents were already in the washroom before I realized the beast was gone. They held me tight and began asking me what was the matter. I could not speak, but only pointed towards the tub and then the window. My mother was the first to notice my sister's clothes laying beside the tub, instantly ran to the open window. I heard her scream curses in her old language at the darkness. Then she collapsed, and my father ran to her, begging for someone to tell him what was going on. My mother was near to fainting. He could only point to the hoof-like print in the snow upon the ledge and speak a single word. Krampus. I don't remember much after that. Four days later, my sister's body was found by a sewer grate. There was no investigation, no arrests made. To this society, she was just another dead immigrant child, no different in their eyes than a drowned sewer rat. Not that it mattered much. No manhunt would ever turn up that creature. That creature which was not a man. I am old now. Over the years that I've seen all of my friends from that hellish ghetto die, some of them in horrible accidents. Yet I've always found some measure of peace with each one of their deaths. I do realize that death is inevitable. But there's one fact that keeps me from finding peace with my sister's death. When the police officer came to visit my family, he said, and my sister had only been dead an hour before they found her body. On Christmas Eve, after Mom and Dad would tell us the story the night before Christmas, my grandfather would put us to bed. And every year, he would wait by our door with the lights out and the fireplace crackling behind him for us to fall asleep. When I turned ten, I asked him why he would spend his nights watching us and not go to bed. Was he waiting to see Santa Claus? And if he did see him... Did that mean that he wouldn't get any presents that year? He thought for a moment before he decided that I was old enough to hear his story. He set me up in bed, and he explained to me that he was waiting up for Santa Claus, but it wasn't the Santa that I wanted to see. It was a Santa that he saw when he was my age. The town was very small. My grandfather used to live in a little mountain cottage he would tell us of how long it took him to ride his bicycle from his home to school. When he returned home, the sun would already be setting behind the trees. The shadows were long, and reached from the tree line across the clearing to tickle the edge of his small stone house. He lived in that home with his mother. My grandfather always talked highly of her. In the summer, she worked hard to keep food on the table for both of them. In the winter, she cut the wood for the fire keeping the chimney hot with smoke. He had little to complain about, but as boys do, would still be one to make trouble. His mother warned him of creatures like the boogeyman, or the woman in the cellar that took little boys that didn't listen to their mothers. Like all cautionary stories to keep children in line, he heard, feared, and in the end, 
ignored all of them. However, in the winter when the nights were long, and the tree shadows crept up to the edge of his house, and the smoke from the fires in the fireplace darkened the sky like a rain cloud, his mother's warnings would always grow more serious. The stories his mother told stopped being of the boogeyman below his bed, or the little old woman under the stairs. Instead, she told him of the Krampus. I knew the story of Santa Claus. I had been told his tale every Christmas Eve. A jolly man in a red suit with eight tiny reindeer who traveled across the world to deliver toys to every good boy and girl. If you were naughty and didn't listen to the warnings your mother gave, old St. Nicholas would leave you a lump of coal. My great-grandmother told her story a little differently. Santa Claus came to the house of good boys and girls. He would leave toys in exchange for their good deeds throughout the year. From the hearth of the fire, he would eat the cookies that was left and drink the milk. With a smile and laying a finger aside his nose, he would rise back up the chimney. The beating of hooves on the roof would sound his departure, and he would travel on to the next house. But if you were bad, you would hear the beat of hooves once again. The jingle of bells were not the bright brass that glistened on the sleigh of the gift bringer. Instead, the bells would be iron and heavy. The cloak that the monster wore would share the color of dried blood, and the furs would smell of chimney soot. His teeth, almost human, were horribly misplaced like broken china, haphazardly positioned in his mouth. And worst of all, his eyes glowed yellow, beacons of piercing color to spot those who deserved their punishments. His mother kept the fires hot in the fireplace to be sure no one would come down the chimney a second time. My grandfather was a mischief maker. The parents of those mischief makers and naughty children would receive something to help discipline them. The stories she told would speak of a creature with horns like a goat and a sharp pointed tongue. His beastly body was coated in dark fur, his feet hard heavy hooves, and across his back he carried his own sack of gifts. These were not toys for children, but branches of trees for parents to whip naughty kids with, or chains to punish those who were worse. For those boys and girls that were a nightmare to their parents, the Krampus, as she called it, would give parents the gift of relief by taking their children to only God knows where. One Christmas night, as my grandfather told it, he was awakened by the sound of hooves on the roof. As any good child would imagine, he sprang from his bed to catch a glimpse of Santa Claus by their Christmas tree. To his surprise, the fire of the chimney was down to embers, and stomping the remaining embers out was not the boots of a merry elf in red, but the dark, heavy stomp of goat hooves. His mother gripped his arm from somewhere in the darkness and pulled him out of sight. The house began to shake and the walls around the hearth cracked from the movement of something large. She pulled him from the cottage, through the windows, and into the snow outside. My grandfather said that he wasn't wearing a coat or any clothes for the snow, and neither was his mother. Nonetheless, she pushed him into the snowbanks and then climbed in herself. They shivered in the cold, and the only light was of the sky that showed in the clear night. The moonlight reflected off of the new fallen snow of Christmas. Had he not been so terrified, my grandfather would have thought it beautiful. As if sensing the perfection of the holiday scene, a barking broke through the silence of the night. My grandfather's dog called out to defend them from the intruder inside their home. A part of my grandfather wanted to rush back inside to save the brave hound, but the other part, the part that remembered the stories, was frozen in fear. And so he remained, buried in the snow. Minutes passed of barking, before atop their house, two clawed and fur-covered hands reached from the opening of the chimney. Attached to those hands were arms, attached to those arms was a body, and attached to that body emerged a horned head. As the beast pulled itself from the chimney, its bones seemed to snap back into place, and it inflated back to its monstrous size. To this day, my grandfather says he doesn't understand how a creature can break itself to fit into a home when it was nearly as tall as the house itself. 
The Krampus drug its feet as it moved from the chimney across the roof, leaving scrapes in the snow. The sound of the heavy scratches it made as it crossed the tops of the cottage caused the trees to shake. The earth around them shuddered as Krampus flung itself from the cottage to the ground. Its hooves thudded into the snow. Stretching its back to its full height, it stood tall, nearly nine feet. Its head turned this way and that, searching the clearing of the cottage for any other signs of life. Its eyes were yellow spotlights, and my grandfather's mother pressed her face into the snow to not be seen. Even the barking of the dog through the window of the house turned to a whine as the beams of its eyes scanned the surroundings. My grandfather was mesmerized by the scene. He watched as the creature turned its body and stretched itself to look at the other side of the house. When it did, the thatch pack it carried came into view. My grandfather explained that it was terrible. The sack writhed, twisted, and shook as if it contained a million angry insects all looking for a way out. He says he knew they couldn't be insects. If the stories were true, they could only be children. From small holes in the bag, he could see hands. Some were larger than his. Some were smaller. Some had darker skin. Some were fairer. But all of them were unmistakably human. And just before the beast turned away, he swore he could hear their voices. The beast, growing impatient, began its walk back towards the tree line. My grandfather could feel tears dripping down his face and freezing on his cheeks. With the sweep of its hand, it pushed a large branch aside and disappeared into the night. That's why I stay and watch you at night, he said. In the winter, when the nights are longer... The tree shadows tickle the edge of the house, and the smoke from the fires in the fireplace darken the sky above like a rain cloud. I make sure you sleep soundly. I make sure the fires are hot. And I protect you from what could be out on Christmas Eve. Once again, Eric travels into the icy wasteland. He begins his journey. A vast plain of white lies before him. He's made this journey annually for around 30 years now. It's done more out of necessity than anything else. Spending his Christmas trekking through thousands of miles of snow is not his ideal vacation. This journey was his birthright. He was born to make it, and he will most likely die making it. As long as he can remember, he's been told that he was born to do great things. Mostly by his father. Eric remembers his father as a stern and stoic man. His father was a man of few words. He had always believed that only those who had nothing to say talk longer than necessary. A man who has anything to say tried to keep his observations brief and to the point. Since he was a child, his father had been absent on Christmas Day. Christmas was mostly celebrated with his mother's side of the family, the only side of the family that Eric knew. Most of his father's side of the family was either dead or in hiding. For good reason, too. There's one Christmas that Eric will always remember. When Eric was a young man, returned from a long tour of duty in the military, his father sat him down and told him the truth about himself. This had been the longest conversation that he had ever had with his father. His father told him the truth about the beast. I know this will be hard for you to understand. I mean, hell, I still can't believe it myself. But our family has been keeping a secret for hundreds of years now. It started with your great, great, great grandfather. His name was Alexander. I don't know much about the man before he came to Alaska. The only thing I really know about him was 
that he was born somewhere in Vladivostok. Most of what I know about him comes from his journal, which has been passed down in our family for generations. He came to Alaska and ended up in charge of a group of settlers there. The group traveled farther north looking for somewhere to settle. The winters were hell, but they managed to survive. After a few months, their numbers began to dwindle. The supplies were scarce. If they were to survive the winter, they needed more food. Alexander gathered all the men of the settlement and set out to hunt. Along the way, they found some game, but not enough to survive on. And they kept hunting, hoping they could find something to keep themselves and their families alive. After a while, the men began to grow weak and tired. In the middle of the night, about half the hunters had left the camp. They'd taken what little food they had left with them. The tundra started getting to the rest of the men. Some of them would wake up in the middle of the night, screaming as if they'd seen a ghost. One night, they heard more screaming, but when they got up, they realized that it wasn't them. And they followed the direction of the screaming until they ended up at a cave. I'll try to spare the crew some details, but they found the deserters dead. When they got there, it was dead silent, and the only thing they could hear was the howl of the wind. And that is, until they heard the screaming again. This time it was coming from inside the cave. The men went deeper into the cave, hoping to find some sign that any of them were alive. Sure, they had abandoned them, but they were family. They were friends, people they'd known for years. Alexander couldn't just leave them to die. Inside those dark caves, they found something. They found something that's haunted our family for generations. I don't know what it is. I have no idea why it does what it does, but I know one thing for sure. I know that if that thing is left unchecked, we'd all be dead. There's never been a formal name for it. My father called it the Beast. The journey continues. His bones ache and the cold is becoming unbearable. Just a little while longer, he thought. He needs to do something to pass the time. If the cold doesn't kill him, the boredom will. Eric thinks about what's to come. He stops for a moment to rest. The chill of the winter air stings his nostrils. Eric reaches behind him and grabs his bag. He opens it up, pulls out a locked wooden box. Eric reaches into his pocket, pulls out the key, and then inserts it into the keyhole. Inside the box, there's something wrapped up in a purple cloth. He unwraps it, revealing the icy dagger within. He wraps his fingers around the handle. The blade shimmers in the sunlight. This was his inheritance. This was his birthright. He thinks back to his father's words on that fateful night. They went deeper into the cave. Alexander eventually found what was left of their supplies, completely untouched. He thought that the men must have come here to get away from the blizzard. Deeper in the cave they went. The stench coming from deep within the cave was becoming more pronounced. The screaming had stopped a while ago. The only sound now was the sound of snow being crushed under their boots. The men finally stopped at the body of one of the deserters. From the looks of it, he was recently dead. The face was butchered beyond recognition. They found a knife on his body. They had no clue what it was made of, but as far as they knew, nobody from their settlement owned this blade. 
There was another trail of blood near the remains, but no body. It looked like it went further into the cave. The men started to question if this was a good idea. Alexander reassured them that it must be a wolf or bear looking for food. Either way, potentially it would serve as a good meal. The men hadn't eaten in days. The supplies that they found at the entrance of the cave weren't enough to survive on. This was their only hope of survival. Ironically, the only way for them to survive was to put themselves in danger. Eric tried to think about what was waiting for him back home. Missing Christmas was hard enough. Being away from Sharon was much worse. There was something about that woman that had always made him happy. It was always like she radiated this infectious kind of joy that always made him smile. She isn't without faults, none of us are, but she just makes everything worthwhile. They've been married for about five years now. He still remembers the look on her face when he proposed to her. Sadly, his father didn't attend his wedding. Eric's father was dying. He remembers that as the year he took up his father's mantle and started the great hunt. It was a hunt for the beast. His father's words came to him once again like he was really there. The words came to him from a man long dead. And the deeper they went, the worse things got. Bones were littered along the twisting caverns. There was something in this cave that didn't want them there. Some of the bones were shattered like glass. They thought this had to be a bear. Nothing else could have done this. Nothing is strong enough to have done this. And they were wrong. The men heard rumbling from deeper in the cave. They'd come too far. It knew they were there now. Bullets did nothing to it. Nothing could pierce the beast's thick hide. Eventually, all his crew was dead, and he was out of bullets. The beast came lumbering towards him, ready to kill Alexander. In desperation, he stabbed it with the blade he found at the entrance of the cave. It worked. The monster stumbled back, and he was able to get a glimpse of it. The beast looked almost like a man, but distorted in the worst way imaginable. It was covered from head to toe in thick white fur and had a prominent scar over its right eye. Alexander charged at the beast, stabbing it again and again. It ended up being a tough fight, but in the end, he won. The man hobbled back to the settlement with a broken leg, three broken ribs. He barely survived the night. He eventually recovered, but it wasn't over. The next year around Christmas, Alexander once again woke up to screaming. He got dressed, grabbed his gun, and even the knife that had saved his life all those months ago. The beast was alive. He knew it was the same beast he had killed last year. He knew it because of the scar over its right eye. The settlement was wiped out that night. Alexander, his family, and a few others were the only ones who survived. But once again, the beast was dead. This time, he was sure. They moved to a neighboring settlement, hoping to put it behind them. But once again, around Christmas, the beast destroyed the settlement. Alexander was haunted by the idea that death and destruction would follow him wherever he went. Each year, it got harder to kill. The same amount of wounds that had killed it the last year barely bothered it the next. Alexander decided that the only way to ensure his family and friends' safety was to find out how it had come back to life. The previous two years, He'd burned its body, 
in hopes it would not come back. That year, he even spread the ashes in different locations so that he could be sure it would never return. He concluded that there could only be one place where it could be. He made the journey to the cave that year. The first journey our family has made. Sure enough, the beast was there, and once again he killed it. He trained his son to take up his mantle when he was gone, and his son did the same with his son. And now, it's come to you. Son, this may be hard for you to understand, but I'm dying. I've been diagnosed with cancer. The doctor's telling me I only have a few years to live. I've tried to prepare you to take up my mantle without getting you too involved. I know my father ruined my life with his training. I wanted you to have a life, son. I wanted you to have something that I could never have. A choice. Please, I hope you can understand why I'm telling you this. Lately, I've been growing weaker. If I can't make the journey this year, I won't return. I need you to do this, Eric. This year, I need you to kill the beast. Things haven't been going well with Eric lately. Unfortunately, he learned from his doctor that he's infertile. In a family where lineage is held in such high regard, this was troubling for him. He lost his job as well. It was supposedly about the community, needing better assets or something along those lines. He doesn't hate his boss or the company, it's just that these trips to Alaska each year don't pay for themselves. This year he even had to take out a loan to make the trip. He doesn't want to bring a child into his life in such a dark time, so adoption is out of the question for the moment. The thing that's troubling him the most is the idea that he'll leave this world without a successor. Last year he almost died. The beast was too strong for him. He remembers the metallic taste of blood pooling in his mouth. He remembers the searing pain of his broken wrist. He remembers the concussed haze he was in for the remainder of the fight. He barely made it out of there alive. His wounds have healed, but Eric is not so sure of himself. Eric stopped and dropped his bag. He was at the cave, at the entrance of the cave. There was a stick that he had left from the previous year. Eric grabbed the stick and some duct tape from his bag. He then proceeded to wrap the duct tape around the hilt of the knife, making a makeshift spear. He also pulled something else from his bag, C4. It was hard to get, but he needed a backup plan in case he failed. He got it from one of his war buddies. When his friend asked him why he needed it, Eric grinned and simply said that he was going hunting. He placed the C4 near the entrance of the cave. His plan was to seal them both inside if the beast got the other hand. He knew that it might not stop the monster, but it was worth a shot. The nerves were starting to get him again. The first year he made the journey, he stood in front of the cave, not moving for almost 20 minutes. He wasn't a coward. It's just that only an idiot wouldn't be afraid of this thing. He had to wake up every morning in a cold sweat, remembering that thing's face as it was getting ready to maul him to death. Eric took a deep breath and grasped his spear. Walking into the cave, he began to pass the bones. He never got used to seeing them. The lonesome path in front of him almost called to him. It beckoned him deeper into the cave. He didn't want to go deeper. He thought of everything that was waiting for him back home, but it was, it was his duty. He was torn between two things. He wanted to pass the quest on to someone else, make it someone else's burden to bear. He just wanted a normal life, a quiet life. His family had warned him about the repercussions of telling anyone about his trips. They couldn't take the risk of this thing being kept alive or experimented on. It needed to die. The rumbling came from within the cave. Despite the cold, Eric began to sweat under his coat. Each step brought him closer to the inevitable. He felt the cold steel of his revolver on his hip. The gun wasn't for the beast, the gun was for him. He had decided that if he had to, he'd rather end himself quickly than be mauled to death by that monster. 
he grew closer to the monster. He could feel it growing closer to him. He eventually reached the end of the cave. He turned on his flashlight to see a pool of water. But the beast wasn't there. It's impossible, he thought. He wasn't late. The beast couldn't have escaped. Even if it did, he would have seen it on his way out. Well, even when he arrived at the nearby town. It didn't make any sense. Was the beast gone for good? Just then, he heard a rumbling. The water started to splash around the rocks of the cave. Something was moving under the water. A shape began to form below the surface. It was almost as if it was growing in size. Finally, bubbles rose to the surface. Before he knew it, the beast rose up from the water. It crawled out, screaming in pain. The monster arose, soaked from the pool. It staggered once it got onto its feet. It looked up into the light, covered its face. It was adjusting. It then began to slowly walk towards Eric, grunting along the way. Eric stood frozen for a moment. He wasn't expecting this. The beast was picking up speed. In a few moments, it was almost in a full sprint. Eric prepared his spear and got ready to defend himself. The beast came charging towards him. He stabbed it in the shoulder, but it kept going. It pushed itself further onto the spear. The beast grabbed Eric with its free hand and threw him against the wall. Eric blacked out for a second, quickly waking himself up. He stood on his feet in a haze when he felt the burning sensation in his thumb. It was broken. Luckily, it wasn't his dominant hand. He began to run towards the entrance of the cave. Running to get the spear would be suicide, and his gun was useless anyway. He had messed up. There was nothing to do but run. The beast was clearly faster than Eric, almost catching up to him in a matter of minutes, but Eric trained for this. He picked up more speed as the haze wore off. Each stride grew larger as he began to move faster. He had to think quickly or he was dead. The only thing he could think of would be to blow up the entrance of the cave, but the beast was too close for him to detonate it at the safe distance. If he wanted to survive, he would have to take a risk. He was getting close to the entrance of the cave when he heard the beast behind him. He was closing the distance between them. It was coming for him. He pulled out the detonator from his pocket. He was almost at the entrance now. If he blew it too early, he'd be trapped in the cave with the beast, or the rubble would crush him. If he blew it too late, the beast would escape. His timing had to be perfect or he'd be dead. Just as he thought this, he tripped over something. Eric fell onto the ground, only to see the beast lumbering behind him. He got a glimpse of the beast's face. There was something he hadn't expected. Confusion. It was like the look on the face of a lost child, scared and afraid. Eric got back to his feet, just barely dodging the beast. Eric picked up speed once again, and this time, gaining a substantial lead on the beast, he approached the entrance to the cave, glancing behind him quickly to see the beast getting closer. As Eric reached the entrance, he detonated the C4. The blast propelled Eric forward. The haze came back, this time accompanied by a deafening ringing. The rocks crumbled on top of the beast as far as he knew it was dead. And even if it wasn't, it definitely wasn't strong enough to push those rocks off him. The dagger was gone now. The one thing that could kill the beast was gone. Eric sat in the snow and wondered what would happen next year. The unwelcome cold greeted him once again. He just wanted to get away from it all. Eric stood up, reaching for his bag. He pulled out his carton of cigarettes. Picking out the one closest to the front, he held it up, shaking from the nerves, and he lit it. He took a deep breath. Started a long journey. Home. It's the dead of winter, and here in rural Minnesota, the weather's been pretty much what you'd expect. So I'm not too worried about that, though. I lived up there long enough to know how to properly prepare for the season. And plus, since I generally work remotely, I really have much reason to leave the house to breathe the elements, even when the weather isn't god-awful. As such, I'm expecting a rather uneventful few months, bundled up on my couch with my laptop and a steady supply of hot cocoa. The only downside being that I live out here by myself, the, I've never been the type to be bothered too much by the solitude. However, it would seem I'm not as alone out here as I thought I was. For the past few weeks now, I've been waking up each morning to find that, well, at some point in the middle of the night, someone's been building a snowman somewhere on my property. Every single day I wake up to find a new one without fail. 
Now, this would be weird enough on its own, but as I've mentioned, I live in rural Minnesota. So the nearest town is about 20 miles from here, and my nearest neighbor is over five. The snow right now is two feet deep at a minimum. It's more than a little odd that someone would come all the way out here just to build a snowman, let alone in the middle of the night. For the past few weeks now, I've... Oh, shit. That being said, it didn't really bother me at first. I mean, from what I can tell from the traces left behind, the culprit seems to be a kid around the age of maybe like 12 or so. He always comes way of the forest that spans the land just north of my little plot. That in itself is odd, given the fact that I, I don't recall anyone living up that way. But it's not like I'm the most social person anyway. Wouldn't be a surprise to me if I just didn't hear about them moving in. I mean, besides, they're just snowmen. They aren't exactly the most threatening thing in the world. The snowmen themselves are actually pretty well made. I mean, they're more than a few levels above the clumsy, tossed-together lumps of snow that you usually see outside of some people's homes. Each of the three spheres that make up every snowman is perfectly formed. So much so that they almost look manufactured in a way. The kid didn't spare any expense on the decorations either. You see, each snowman has been outfitted with the works. Several bits of clothing, scarves, mittens, hats, sturdy branches for limbs, and carefully crafted facial features made of stones and other bits likely retrieved from around the forest. Now, admittedly, I did find the fact that they were all made to be frowning and, and facing towards my house well, a, a little unnerving. I guess I could have just destroyed them or something if they just started to bother me, but I was reluctant to do so. I mean, it sort of felt like, like, I don't know, kicking over a kid's sandcastle on the beach was, I mean, unless you're some kind of sadist, is anything but a good feeling. And besides, they were harmless piles of snow. It wasn't like they were going to get in the way or anything. Unsettling or not, they, they still weren't anything worth being seriously worried about. Well, I quickly changed my mind about that last night. See, after nearly a month of this going on, I was ready to confront this nightly visitor. I'd finished all the work I needed to get done that week, so I figured there wouldn't be any harm in pulling an all-nighter in order to try and catch the kid in the act. I still wasn't particularly bothered with what the kid was doing, but I was starting to get a bit concerned. See, the temperature was dropping more and more below zero each night, and I was starting to worry about the kid's safety. I had my suspicions as to the reasons behind the kid's odd behavior, and I certainly didn't want to deal with the legal troubles that it would bring if they you know, died on my property. I was hoping the weather would stay clear for my little stakeout, but I wasn't quite so lucky. As afternoon shifted into evening, the clear patch of weather that we'd been in for the past couple of weeks came to an end as the snowstorm rushed over the mountains and bore down on us. By the time night came around, the storm had begun in full. I could barely see more than a few yards out through my window, even with the high-powered flashlight I had on hand. I figured the kid wasn't going to be able to make it to his nightly trip on these conditions, but I decided to stay up just in case. It wasn't like I had anything better to do anyway. But by the time 2am came rolling around, though, I had lost all traces of this previous enthusiasm. I was most of the way through a bottle of wine, and I had, I had long tired of shining my flashlight through my windows and only seeing the figures of the nearest snowmen. I had more than less convinced myself that this is about time to give up and turn in for the night. I felt compelled to check one last time, though, if only to satisfy the little stubborn bit of my mind that didn't want to admit that I'd wasted an entire evening. God, I wish I'd just gone to bed. Drawing in close to one of my windows, I slowly swept my flashlight across the yard. The storm was still going strong, but the wind... The wind had started to die down significantly. It had been fierce, but it seemed as if the storm would be brief, too. I figured there was a good chance that it would be done by morning. The visibility had cleared up significantly, and I could now see some of the snowmen that littered my yard. In spite of the previously howling winds, not a single one of them had been tipped over. After slightly melting and then refreezing once more over the past couple of days and nights, the snowmen had all formed a resilient outer shell of ice. It could take more than a run-of-the-mill blizzard to make them budge. They'd probably last till spring. And somehow, they... They almost seemed closer to my house than before. Perhaps the decreased visibility was making me a bit claustrophobic or something like that. It's hard to say. I did find it a bit jarring, though. All the same. Caught up in my thoughts, I almost didn't notice it. 
A flicker of moment, something something in between the snowmen that most certainly hadn't been there before. I did a double take, not, not quite sure if I had seen what I thought I did. I swept the beam back towards the spot where I thought that I'd seen it, but it wasn't there anymore. If it had been there to begin with, that is. Perturbed, I continued to sweep my flashlight across the lawn. I had almost convinced myself that my lack of sleep was starting to get to me when I heard something. A rustling just to the left of my window. The beam of my light quickly flicked over to where I thought the sound had come from, but I was only able to just barely catch sight of it before it disappeared around the corner of my house. This time, I was certain of what I had seen. A flicker of movement, a human figure, and the smallish barefoot of a child just before it disappeared out of sight. I cursed under my breath, pulling on a cloak and a pair of boots. Not only was this kid out in this mess, but he was barefoot, if not worse. Where in the heck were this kid's parents, and why the heck weren't they keeping a better eye on him? I wasn't exactly eager to throw myself out into the blizzard, but I knew I had to. I wasn't even sure if this kid knew where the heck he was. And I sure as hell wasn't going to let this kid die out here on my lawn. Shivering, I went out my back door, ducked around the side of the house that I thought the kid was on. And I hoped that he'd be close to the house still, so I wouldn't have to venture too far off into the blizzard. But I wasn't so lucky. I found his tracks. They were quickly being covered up by the falling snow, but were still clear enough to tell that he'd wandered off further into the blizzard. Letting off more than a few expletives, I hurried off after the kid before I completely lost track of him. I followed the tracks further out, towards the edge of my property. I, I debated calling out for the kid, but decided not to, worried that I might spook him. I strained my eyes and ears to catch some sort of trace of him, but it wasn't easy in the howling blizzard. The snow muffled everything. The wind drowned everything out. My flashlight beam could only reach so far. I'd walked for a couple of minutes, and all I had seen were the snowmen. The tracks were fading fast, and I was worried that I might lose the trail entirely. It was then that I heard it. Sort of rustling and scraping, not like a small animal trying to dig itself a burrow. It was the kid. It, I mean, it had to be. I did my best to quiet my steps as I crept closer. We were near the woods at the edge of my property now. I near the source of the sound, which seemed to be coming from behind a few bushes. Quietly making my way around, I swept my light across the edge of the dark forest, hoping that the kid wouldn't run away again at the sight of me. See, I only see it now in retrospect that my entire perception of what had been going on was based on assumptions. I'd come across something unusual and unexplained in my otherwise normal everyday life, and I'd automatically done my best to rationalize it. I mean, sure, I may have felt uneasy about what was going on, but... But I never felt like I was in any sort of danger. But when my flashlight beam settled on that... That... Thing... I hunched over in the snow, I quickly realized... That I've been taking things far too lightly. The first thing I realized is that... It wasn't just barefoot. It was completely naked. From head to toe, there wasn't a thread to be seen anywhere. That was the least of my concerns, though, as I, as I realized under further examination that what I was looking at may not even be human. The skin was white with, with tinges of blue, barely indistinguishable from the snow around it. Its icy hide was pulled taut over a bony frame, which seemed to almost poke through in spots. Its spine stood out in particular, its bony ridges traveling down its hunched back and leading one's eye towards its strange, short and fleshy tail. It had the overall shape and size of a human child, but it was anything but. It was much more like a naked mole rat or some sort of hairless cat. It was bent over it, its gnarled, root-like hands clawing the surrounding snow together and forming it into a large ball. Its movements were frantic and erratic, like a rodent or a cockroach scurrying across the floor. It was so outside the realm of anything I was expecting, my mind couldn't figure out how to react. That quickly changed, though. The, the flashlight hadn't alerted the creature for whatever reason, but, but I wasn't able to mask my shock, my gasp of breath at the sight of it. It froze and it quickly whipped around to face me. Its face, it, it wasn't right. The proportions were all off. The eyes were too small, the mouth was, was far too big, the nose was practically non-existent. Its beady black eyes were fixed on my own, and its wide mouth, full of teeth like shards of ice, were fixed in its snarl. 
My mind caught up with itself, and I felt a fearful chill rush through me. It was so much colder than the blizzard around us. And then out a screech, not unlike nails on a chalkboard. I screamed right back, falling backwards as I desperately backpedaled away from it. My flashlight flicked like crazy before going out completely. A few frantic smacks got it working again, and I focused it once more on where the creature had been, but it was nowhere to be seen. I had no idea where it went, but I was, I was certainly not sticking around to find out. I rushed back to the snowmen to my house, and I swear, I swear they were all looking at me. Their frowns were deeper, they were angrier even. I didn't waste any time examining them in any great detail, though. Quickly, I made my way through the house. I locked all the doors, I closed all the curtains and blinds before, before hurtling up on the couch and end. Trying to shiver the chill of fear away. I had my fill of beady black eyes for the evening, on snowmen or otherwise. The night was uneventful after that, thankfully. I fell asleep at some point, my fatigue overcoming my fading panic. I've been trying to convince myself that last night was all just a bad dream or something like that, but, but I haven't quite been able to manage it. I mean, I just... I don't really know what to do about any of this. I mean, I guess I, I could call the cops. But even if they believed me, it's not like they could, they could even make it out here. The roads are impassable this far out. Not really sure if I'm in any sort of danger or anything, really. That creature... But it could have been just as scared of me as I was of it. Who knows? All this is just so far outside of my realm of experience. I don't feel confident enough to even guess. I'm sure as hell not leaving the house anytime soon. I mean, you see, when I woke up this morning, all the snowmen had disappeared without a trace. The snow around where they stood completely undisturbed, and it's, it doesn't look like they were knocked over. They weren't carried away, or anything like that. So I don't know what's going on. But I'm not setting a foot outside until I know for sure. Until I'm certain. Where they've gone. Staring at the tree, whiskey in hand, Pete was pleased that this year would be different from the last. It had been the strangest time of his life, but he truly felt like things were finally coming together, and when better to come together than at Christmas, the time that he loved more than any other. In some ways, the past year had been like an eternity, in others as if it had succumbed to time in the blink of an eye. But either way, he was glad to see the back of it. Staring at the Christmas tree, its beautiful lights casting a warm hue over the room and the snow quietly falling outside as the sun set, Pete began to think of this past year, of his daughter, Lana, and his wife, Janet. It had started with a very normal December, 12 months earlier the residents spending most of their days clearing driveways, and Pete's wife going off for one of her usual wanders. She had been gone for a couple of hours, but while Janet was utterly devoted to her family, she still needed moments to herself, to clear her head, to diminish the stress that comes with a loving yet disorganized husband and a little girl who was kind, but whom enjoyed trying her parents' patience as much as possible. When the tensions of a domestic life clouded her feelings or began to weigh on her spirits, Janet would wander out of the back door into the fields and woodlands, which characterized the entire area, and trek for a little while through the pines which dotted the landscape. It therefore wasn't unusual for her to be gone for fairly long periods, especially since it was around that time of year when she would take it upon herself to choose the Christmas tree. No matter how much Pete or Lana asked to help out, this was Janet's job. 
She loved the tradition of it, the process of choosing the best possible tree, cutting it down, and then seeing the bright smiles on her family's faces as they would gleefully take the tree indoor and decorate it with sparkling glitter garlands, warm glowing lights, and an array of festive baubles. It was a small highland town where they lived, far away from any major city, but Janet and the rest of her family loved their home, the simplicity of it, the feeling of being an integral part of a close-knit community, and of course, the beautiful surroundings. Lush during the Scottish summer and cold, crisp, stark, but yet awe-inspiring in the winter. Most importantly, she loved the pine woods nearby. Specifically, a collection of trees which sat at the top of a small hill within the walking distance from the house. Perfect for picking a Christmas tree. She would return there each year. And while their numbers thinned due to a few other neighbors going there for the exact same purpose, there were enough trees to last a good many years. When she had been gone for three hours, Pete began to grow nervous, as this was longer than usual. And since it was getting dark, he took it upon himself to venture outside, telling Lana to lock the doors after him and that he would not be long. Lana laughed when he told her that he expected that Mummy would be struggling through the snow with a huge tree, bigger than any that they had ever had before. Pete loved to see the excitement in his daughter's face at the time of year, and he told her to watch from her bedroom window to see what they would bring back. But this, she excitedly ran up the stairs, straight to her window before he had to call her back down to lock the door. Gazing at the beautiful tree, he could remember that night like it was yesterday. The snow was crisp on the ground and crunched under his feet as it began to freeze. Small flakes fell from the sky occasionally, but Janet's footprints remained uncovered. Even without them, Pete knew where they were heading. The hill where Janet returned each year was only a 40-minute hike away. She would pick a pine tree from there. In fact, sometimes she would pick two. One around six foot, and the other a young tree, about half the size. If they could find one suitable. It was difficult at the time to find smaller trees as they seemed to be rare in that area. And everyone in the town seemed to like the idea of having a small tree in their children's bedroom. So people would climb up there with an axe and take what they wanted. So there weren't many at hand. Lana at one time had thought that it was sad to cut down and kill the trees just for people to look at, but Pete explained to her about the tradition, and he was sure that more would grow back. With time, she forgot this protest and looked forward to the years when she could have one. If a smaller tree couldn't be found, they had a lovely synthetic one which would sit at her window. Secretly, she loved this just as much. But as her father had said, tradition is tradition. The larger tree would be placed in the living room and adorned with an assortment of baubles, glittered decorations, and lights. The other in Lana's room, which would be sprayed with a can of fake snow and covered in hanging candy canes and chocolates. Although she was always told that she could only have one a day before bed as a treat, of course, Occasionally, she would break this rule and just hope no one would notice. Janet could always tell, but she would let it go. Christmas time was the best of times after all, and it was so brief. As Pete approached the hill, he knew something was wrong. He felt it in his bones. As he climbed, the snow began to fall in greater volume, and the sky dimmed with it. Standing at the humble summit, a stillness spread, silence interrupted momentarily by the almost audible patter of snowflakes floating gently to the ground. He followed the footprints now with purpose, knowing that if the snowfall increased, that it would be nearly impossible to find Janet. Twilight fell, 
covering everything in a dark blue wisp of color as the frost began to nip at his new rosy cheeks. The footprints bobbed and weaved their way through the huge pines and finally stopping next to a wonderfully thick and vibrant tree, one which was perfectly suited for their purposes. The perfect size, almost seven feet tall, a dark, life-filled green and a thick abundance of branches and pine which made it almost impossible to visually penetrate its cover in such a light but yet janet was nowhere to be seen as far as pete could tell there was no other tracks in the snow leading away in any direction she had almost certainly been here but where had she gone it was both puzzling and worrying. It seemed impossible. But there they were. Janet's last two footprints engraved in the ground, with the snow all around, virgin, undisturbed, and lacking all signs of life. It was as if she had just vanished into the night. Looking at the base of the tree, Pete ran his fingers over a deep gash in its trunk. There was no doubt about it, Janet had taken a few swipes at it with an axe, then for some unknown reason she had left, or perhaps moved on to a tree that she felt was more suitable. Surely not though, this tree was perfect. That must have been it though, she must have moved on. Perhaps there was some random freakish flurry of snow which covered her tracks. That must have been it. But Pete knew this was wishful thinking. He had lived there for years, and in all of that time, he had never seen such a thing. And then he saw it. Several meters away, lying in the snow, was Janet's axe. He rushed over to the object, falling once as the snow deepened, rising to his feet. It was now unmistakable. Yes, it was partially covered in snow, but it was Janet's axe. It lay there much like the footprints, isolated, but with the absence of any human imprints. It was as if the tool had been dropped from a great height, but Pete did not care to speculate. The sense of growing worry permeated his mind as the thought of Janet lying somewhere injured increased his anxiety. Shouting his wife's name repeatedly drew no reply as darkness now began to creep even closer. If she was hurt, he would have to raise the alarm and get the town out looking for her along with the mountain rescue. She wouldn't survive long in the snow in that biting cold. At this thought, the panic grew. Worry, fear, hurt that could only be felt through love. With torch in hand, he continued in the direction the axe had taken him. As he entered a thick bend of pine trees, he noticed the broken branches littered on the ground as if something had been rushing past, tearing them apart and breaking them off on impact. Maybe Janet ran through here. The scale of the damage, however, looked too great to have been dealt by one person alone. Had there been any other... Had he been in any other country, he would have assumed a bear was nearby but they had been hunted to extinction in Scotland long ago, along with the wolves and any other predators. For a moment, his torch reflected off something scuttling under a bush, but it looked more like an insect than anything else, and again, far too small to cause such devastation. Pete fixed his scarf, trying to cover his face as the frost bit deeper. But just as he did so, something caught his eye, something on the ground, shining his torch on what at first he thought to be a dead animal, it was the crumpled body of Janet, lying still on the ground. A heart attack, they said. A heart attack. But Pete had seen her face. He had looked upon those eyes, once so filled with kindness, transfixed in a frozen stare, cold, glassy, black with fear. Her hands were clenched in front of her, and the pathologist told him that this was perfectly normal for someone suffering such a massive heart attack in, in such low temperatures, as was the contorted look on her face, although at the mention of this, Pete saw a flicker in the pathologist's eyes which gave away that he was as puzzled by that look as anyone. A look Pete would never forget. 
Darling Janet, love of his life, mother of his children, dying alone in the cold with lips pulled back over teeth in agony, frozen into an inhuman sneer. The whole ordeal was devastating for him. If it hadn't been for their daughter Lana, for the necessity of her needs to be met before his own, Pete would have found it nearly impossible to have gotten through it. The past twelve months have been cluttered with reminders of an aching loss. As with any bereavement, the first time of doing something once shared without that person made the pain more acute. The first Christmas, the first day at work, the first walk to school, the first family get-together, every person's face etched in concern, accompanied by the usual well-meaning but empty traditions of how are you holding up? It must have been so difficult. And if there's anything I can do. Helping his daughter through the loss of her mother was all he had to make sure that he could face another day. But they stopped now. They had been through the horror, through the denial, through the silent meals, through the lonely cries of despair at night, through the birthdays, empty and somber. They had been through it all. All these firsts were over. It had been over twelve months since Janet's death, and Pete felt almost exhilarated by this. He still missed her every day. The pain would never leave him, but the feeling of accomplishment, of strength, something which he thought had deserted him, that he had endured, filled him for the first time with thoughts of the future. Thoughts that life does indeed go on, even when our dearest have gone before us. And what of his beautiful daughter? Dear, kind Lana. He may have felt compelled to bring her through the past year. But her empathy and strength had left him in awe characteristics which someone so young had no right to possess, but which were thankfully present nonetheless. When she had cried, he had been there, and on more than one occasion, when he lay sobbing, staring at that empty void of space in his double bed at night, Lana would waken and climb in beside him, and they would both cry together until they fell asleep. She was his rock, and by God, she was going to have the best Christmas that she'd ever had. Pete had made a number of arrangements. He had spent a fortune on every gift imaginable. He had filled the house with every food and treat that she enjoyed, and both Janet's parents and his own were flying in for Christmas dinner to be with their brave, sweet granddaughter. He'd also organized for Lana's friends to have a sleepover on Boxing Day, which she had pleaded for, but Pete always knew that he would give in eventually. She never asked for much, but this year, this Christmas, she would have more than she could imagine. The house was perfect, but there was one thing left to do, one thing that Pete had dreamt of since the night that he found Janet's body. She had chosen this tree. It was going to be sitting in their living room, adorned with all manner of decorations. That was its purpose. Its very reason for being. Janet never finished cutting the damn thing down. It was, in many ways, her dying act. And Pete was going to make sure that it was fulfilled. On the anniversary of her death, he wandered through the snow, winding his way through the pines until he stood at the foot of the ominous little hill. The sun shone brightly, and it wasn't as cold as it had been the night Janet died, but each footstep was accompanied by a sickness in the pit of Pete's stomach. Each stride a morbid reminder of the previous year and that terrible heartbreak in the snow. Marching to its peak, 
he first walked to and observed the scene of Janet's untimely death. Standing there where her body had laid, Pete wiped the tears from his eyes and placed a small Santa figurine on the ground, burying it in the snow. It had always been hung from the branches of each yearly tree, and was her favorite decoration. It seemed only right that it be with her. After another few minutes of trudging, there it was. It was still standing, the damn tree, as if ravenous for revenge. Pete pulled Janice's axe from his backpack and charged at the pine. He battered and chopped at the cut which Janet had made the previous year, making it deeper with each slice, with every pound of pressure that he could muster. The tree groaned and creaked as if in pain, but Pete did not care. This tree was the final reminder of Janet's death. Whatever had happened that night, it happened because of that tree. As crazy as it seemed, it all made sense for a moment, and then clarity was clouded by mundane reality. She had simply died of natural causes. With the roar of cracking wood breaking under its own weight, the tree swooned and collapsed to the ground in defeat. Tying a rope around its trunk, and then using a string to fold its branches inward, Pete dragged this memory, that cold-hearted pillar of nature's brutality, through the snow, over grass and gravel, and finally to his back door. He was victorious. With little thought of carpet or furniture, he dragged it up the stairs into the house and placed it in front of the window in the living room, wedging it upright into an old wooden stump that they had used as a stand every year. Breathless and covered in sweat, he stood back, looking at the tree standing tall over all it surveyed. You picked a good one, love. You picked a good one. He held back the tear and waited for Lana to return home from her friends. Pete put an old Christmas film on the television as they both decorated the tree together, singing, laughing, and being a family. There were moments, fleeting glances, and they caught one another's stare. A glance which showed pain buried deep down inside, one which said, I miss her too. But it was Christmas, and the moments of grief passed, buffered by long, caring periods of happiness. Contentment caressed smiles from ear to ear, and festive spirits once more filled that home, which had for too long been host to loss and anguish. As night began to fall after Lana went to bed, earlier than usual because of the excitement had worn her out, Pete decided to reward himself for the day's efforts. The lights were dimmed, and after pouring himself a large whiskey, he sat down on the living room couch and stared at the tree, draped in tinsel, garland, and adorned with bright white Christmas lights. It really was a sight to behold the best tree they had ever had. Here's to you, gorgeous, Pete said, lifting his drink to the sky in a symbolic gesture. Staring at the Christmas tree, its beautiful lights casting a warm hue over the room, and the snow quietly falling outside as the sun set, Pete began to think of the past year, of his daughter, Lana, and his wife, Janet. Time passed slowly as he thought of all things gone, how they had led to this moment through pain and suffering, but now, hopefully onward to the future, and one filled with at least the briefest possibility of joy. The glow from the tree reflected off the window but it penetrated far enough to illuminate the now thick blur of snow, falling to the ground silently outside. The room remained dark, but the lights bathed everything subtly in a warm, yuletide radiance, which when accompanied by the orange 
clemency of the fire only served to cultivate the anticipation for Christmas even more so. For the first time in a year, Pete was happy. Something bothered him, though. There was a slight apprehension or annoyance at the back of his mind, something which was spoiling the display. Sipping at his whiskey, casting a glance at the entire room, he finally saw what the problem was. Two of the Christmas tree lights were occasionally flickering. Not constantly, but often enough to be noticeable. And more importantly, aggravating. Downing the rest of his drink, Pete rose to his feet, now feeling the aches in his muscles from the effort exerted while dragging the thing all the way home from the hill. Walking over to the tree, the lights were indeed flickering, but there was, there was something unusual about them. They seemed deeper than the rest, as if coming from the trunk rather than resting on the branches. Again, Pete was struck by how dark the interior of the tree was. That even in the presence of many lights placed upon it, he could not peer or adequately see between the branches. Even the two lights which set deeper behind the pines did not seem to illuminate their surrounding in any way. The empty glass slipped from his fingers, smashing on the floor. The lights were fine. They were not flickering at all, but the occasional blinking of two eyes amongst the branches had been enough to catch his attention. He froze to the spot, and it was as if the room grew somehow darker, something stirring between the pines, between the knotted wood and the scratching, porous surface. Something lived there. A feeling of utter paralysis now took hold, his feet firmly glued to the ground as the two eyes slowly pushed forward. Creaking and cracking, a face revealed itself from behind the pine and branches, as if seeping out from its innermost visceral point. Mold covered ancient, its features twisted in rage. Fear began to course through Pete's veins. His heart beat faster and faster as the face moved closer. Its eyes, devoid of pupils, now swamped in a maddening yellow, and from below, the protrusion of two thin, moss-covered legs arched out from between the branches. With a creak and snap, it straightened itself, now standing on all its terrible glory in front of the tree. It was now pitch black outside, and it would have been clear to Pete that this animal, this creature, was of a nocturnal nature. But in its stare, he found himself helpless. His heart skipped. First it was a palpitation. Then he could feel a, a searing pain in his left arm. He clutched his chest, but his feet remained adhered to the ground. It was impossible to look away from those yellow, unmarked eyes. Its gaze came closer still, and in the pain which it brought, Pete knew he was going to die. To be found like Janet Cold, face contorted, and the second victim of that which was living amongst the pine on that hill. The pain was now unbearable, but the paralysis removed the possibility of a scream. What little light there was from the fireplace now illuminated its head, elongated on the side, and pulsating on the other, its face dominated by a large, dark hole which appeared in place of a mouth or nose, one which no light could penetrate and its boil-ridden head stooped to meet his own, and the hole in its face almost touched his mouth. An involuntary sneer pulled Pete's lips up to reveal his teeth. As his face contorted into an entirely unnatural position, then that one word, a word so powerful, so pure, that even the most evil intention could be dispelled by it. Daddy? With a snap of wood, the gargoyle-like creature turned its wide yellow gaze to Lana. Standing at the bottom of the stairs in her pajamas, her scream echoed out into the night, arms outstretched, its odd-numbered fingers moved with a stutter, 
as its moss-covered legs groaned, carrying it forward in a peculiar, unbalanced motion towards her. Now Lana was paralyzed by its stare, and with each step closer, her face contorted more fiercely, and the pain in her chest brought her to the point of unconsciousness. As intense as its gaze was, it was focused. So focused that it didn't notice Pete clawing his way across the floor towards the kitchen. The wooden creature's unsure movements made it appear more like a puppet than a thing of autonomous purpose, and as it reached Lana, it cupped her face in an uneven hand and stared wide-eyed and pupilless into her face. Tears streamed down her cheeks. The sound of feet running filled the air, and as it twisted to investigate, a loud crack was heard as Pete ran up into the couch, jumping high into the air and bringing Lana's axe down deep into its spine. No blood ran or gushed, but a plague of unfamiliar insect-like critters poured out from the wound. Instead of a howling pain, the creature emitted a crescendo of strange squeals and clicks before throwing Pete to the ground and smashing through the door. Lana's father gave chase, but it was impossible as the wooden creature moved at an unimaginable pace, gliding on the ground with each stride, leaving no footprint in the snow. After a visit to the nearest hospital, both Lana and her father were given a clean bill of health. But they never returned to the house, filled with memories of good times, the happy times of, of a mother, a wife, a kind soul of birthdays, and a wedding, and of course, Christmas time. Pete didn't know what the creature was whether it was alive or dead, or something else entirely inconceivable to the human mind. But he had made a solemn promise to himself from that moment on. Never again would he cut down a tree, decorate it, and take enjoyment in its appearance as it died. Because no matter how pretty they are, no matter how much warmth they may give, no matter how much they might make people think of Christmas. You just don't know what may be living inside. One of the very few perks of living with a rare terminal illness is the way nothing ever seems important enough to get stressed about. See, I'm speaking from my own limited experience, and in no way would I recommend you go out and get your own rare terminal illness, if you don't already have one. But in my case, I was able to make peace with the reality of my impermanence early on. Before the diagnosis, when I was a young teenager, sometimes I would worry about living up to my own expectations for adulthood, which is absurd when you consider that the town I grew up in is the capital of lowered expectations, whose only claim to fame is being the home of a famous bloody civil war battle, and the place where it rained frogs that one time. Eh, don't ask. It's not nearly as interesting as it sounds. I work at the 24-hour gas station near the woods at the edge of town, and as far as jobs go, it's not the best. It's not the worst either. Knowing that I won't be here too much longer dulls any ambition to climb the corporate ladder. Yeah. Some days churn by without incident, moving the world one step closer to oblivion, or whatever. Those are my favorites, when I can pass an entire shift by reading a book and minding my own business. I don't need to climb a mountain or, or visit the Grand Canyon to know what Zen feels like. Tranquility is a quiet, empty gas station at four in the morning. Of course, some days aren't as uneventful. I've experienced rude customers, drunkards, vicious raccoons that fall on the chaotic evil spectrum of the D&D &D alignment, a handful of armed robbers, and some other things that I can only describe as... weird. I had one of the last type of days yesterday. We had been busier than normal in the weeks leading up to this. Some of the wildlife and fishery agents from nearby towns had been patrolling the woods pretty heavily. 
and our gas station is the only place for miles to get fuel or fresh coffee. I don't know what the hubbub was about, but I would guess everyone's been on edge ever since those cows were mutilated. Okay, I think that maybe mutilated is too strong of a word to use. Somebody has been sneaking into cattle farms and shaving the cows bald. Who knows why? Small towns get bored. I, mean, I wasn't paying attention to the time because I never do, but it was late in my shift in the middle of the night when the deer poked his head inside the gas station. I had just finished my book and was checking my phone for weather updates when it happened. The glass door was pushed slightly ajar and a large deer with an eight point rack of antlers was slowly inspecting the store, scanning its gaze from one corner to the other's nostrils flaring each sniff. It stopped moving and pointed its giant black eyes right at me. I remained perfectly still, except to put my phone down because this was more interesting than the possible snowstorm headed our way in the next few days. We stared at one another for just a moment longer until the deer pushed the door the rest of the way open and stepped one foot inside. Now whatever you're imagining right now, it's wrong. And I know that's my fault because I'm telling you this story, so I apologize. There were a few key details to this deer that I haven't mentioned yet. First, the deer's head was about seven feet off the ground, and second, I could see through the glass of the front doors that this deer was standing upright. From antler tip to pelvis, the deer was just like any other ordinary white tail that I had ever seen in the woods or the this side of the interstate. Tan fur, long neck, confused expression, but at the legs, he turned into something else. If kangarooish was a word, I would call his legs kangarooish. He stepped a kangarooish foot into the store and waited like he was making sure that the ground wasn't going to fall out from below him. When it didn't, he put the next foot forward. The door shut behind him and the deer started walking down the gas station aisle, his antlers barely missing the fluorescent lights hanging from the ceiling by millimeters. I didn't think much of it at the time, but when I got to work earlier that night, the other worker said something interesting. I was taking over the safe from the only other full-time clerk, Jerry, who according to what I heard from a pretty reliable source, has been pretty salty ever since his cult went and had a mass suicide without inviting him. Before he left, he told me that the lag was getting worse and maybe it was time we do something about it. See, there's something wrong with the mirror in the gas station bathroom. There's a delay in the reflection by about a half a second. Sometimes if the weather's acting up, it gets much worse, or at least more noticeable. We had plans to replace the mirror, but couldn't do it because we're lazy. And mirrors are expensive, and besides, how important is it to see your exact reflection anyway? It's a gas station bathroom, not a salon. That wasn't the weird thing, he told me. The weird thing was that a man had come by earlier wearing hunter's camo and left his number, telling Jerry that it was imperative he contact him in case we see anything unusual. I had dismissed that as being too vague to have any meaning at all. What is unusual at the gas station? A solar eclipse? A bipedal deer? A completely normal day? Besides, I don't work for him, and if he's looking for the deer creature, he can find it on his own. I watched the deer walk slowly towards the bag chips display and put his nose to it, sniffing voraciously before stepping back and scanning the entire store again. His arms, or, uh, or front legs, I'm not sure, dangled at his sides with, with cloven hooves as he walked over to the refrigerator drink case. He tapped the glass a couple times with his antlers before figuring out how to reach out and pull the door. It was like watching a toddler figuring out a puzzle. It's frustrating. I almost got up to help him, but then finally, mercifully, he got his hand, toe, clo, toe, foot finger around the handle and the door creaked open. I had to hold back my laughter as the deer fumbled at a bottle of water and somehow managed, barely, to pull it out of the case before sticking the top of it into his mouth and chewing at the cap until it ripped open. The deer leaned his head back with the bottle sticking out of his mouth and stared right at me as he guzzled the whole thing down in one continuous stream. Next, the buck sauntered over to the coffee machine and gave it a whiff. The smell apparently didn't 
G. Hall with his disposition, and he reared back and shook his head fiercely. Probably for the best. Finally, the buck finished his round and walked up to me and stopped on the other side of the counter. From this close, I could smell the creature, and surprisingly, he smelled like grape soda. He tapped his hooves. Fingers. Hands? On the counter a couple of times, then looked back to where he had dropped the bottle of water. Then back to me. Okay, I said. He tapped the counter again, so I went ahead and punched in the code for a bottle of water at the register. That's going to be 89 cents. The deer took a step back, looked down at himself, and started patting his body where his pockets would be, if he were wearing any pants. Then he looked up at me and blinked a few times. You're putting me in an awkward spot here, I said. Right then, the creature started belting out a strange animalistic noise that I can only describe as a combination between donkey and dolphin. I don't know what that means, I said over his noise. But then he just got louder and louder and then threw his head back, emitting this weird call into the ceiling. I don't know what you're saying, I said back. I don't speak deer. The creature threw its head back down, barfed up a green wet clump into the counter in front of me, and then it was silent. I looked at the clump. The deer looked at the clump. The deer looked at me, then back at the clump. Oh. I reached out, I grabbed it by the corner. Sure enough, the deer had coughed up a mucus-covered $1 bill. Okay. I wiped the sliminess off on a dish rag I kept near the register for spills, and then put the bill into the till with the rest of the money before fishing out two nickels and a penny, which I offered to the deer, in which the deer promptly ate out of my hand. He turned towards the door and flicked his tail a few times at me before I noticed the strange to blue outside the gas station. At least... Half a dozen other deer were out there, each standing tall on two kangaroo feet and staring right at me. There was another stag, a pack of does, at least one fawn, only four feet tall. The buck struggled for a few seconds to pull the door open. Do you want me to... Before I could finish, he had it wide enough to slip outside. Then they all left, walking proudly towards the forest line. It wasn't until about five minutes later that it occurred to me that I should have taken a picture or something, but without any proof, I guess it's just going to turn into one of those weird stories that nobody ever believes. I dug through my backpack until I found a book that I hadn't read yet. I opened to the front page. It was at least another hour before I had another customer come into the store. In case you are following along with the events of the gas station on my blog, I apologize that my website's been taken down so abruptly. For some reason, the city council found my public record of local events to be troubling, uh, to the point that they had to hire a fancy Orwellian legal team to bury me in cease and desists. I'm trying to fight back. But as of last week, it looks like my entire site's been retroactively erased from existence. Presumably, these are the same guys who've been scrubbing all mention of our town from the internet. I know that these are not the sort of people that you're supposed to fight with, but after what happened to Gregory Fitz, I feel like a responsibility to continue journaling in one form or another. Some of you who followed my blog may remember Greg as the lawyer who volunteered to help out pro bono after I first started getting pushback from the concerned members of the city council. He even drove all the way out here last week just to have a talk with them. I'm very sorry to say that they found his remains yesterday in a hotel room, locked from the inside, of course. Officially, his death was declared a suicide before it was sealed. Deputy O'Brien managed to get a look at the police report, which claims he died of blood loss while attempting to eat his own hands. Admittedly, I didn't know Greg all that well. That just doesn't seem like something he would do. Anyway, until I can figure things out on the website, I've decided to continue chronicling the events of my day-to-day -day here. If you haven't been following my blog and have absolutely no idea who I am, that's okay too. Let me just say that there's only two things you need to know that will bring you completely up to speed. One, I work at the shitty 24-hour gas station at the edge of town. And two, weird things happen there.
the owners decided to hire a third part-time clerk. And I don't know if it's because that they're getting tired of all the part-timers mysteriously disappearing, or if it's because they finally decided to fire Jerry. Or maybe they just know that my time here is running out and they're hoping that I can train my own replacement before it's too late. Her name is Rosa. And despite her eager optimism, I guess she's pretty cool. She's a couple years younger than me, smart, very capable, and has exhibited a level of competence that I would categorize as, uh, quote, not at all like Jerry, which is something that I think the owners were really looking for in a new employee. The flip side, though, is that she is always asking questions that I don't have answers to. Why are there so many missing persons flyers on the bulletin board? What's with all the mold on the ceiling? Who's that guy in the trench coat that hangs out near the dumpster at all hours of the night? What's in these boxes labeled non-aspire? The owners asked Rosa to start immediately, as my shadow for the week's overnight shifts. You might think the owners would shut the place down for a couple hours for the holidays, but you'd be wrong. See, it took a literal court order to make them close their doors for a weekend last month after we found a mummified corpse in the walls. That's a story for a different time. She came into the gas station just as the sun was beginning to set, and we started with the basics. How to clock in, how to open a till, how to turn on pumps. Then I gave her the same speech I give all the new employees. Look, there are a bunch of rules to working at any job. We're no different. Show up on time, wear clothing, don't feed the raccoons, the store telephone is for paying customers only, 25 cents per minute, prepaid only, no exceptions, and just like every job, there are the unwritten rules. Here, the second list is a little longer. If something seems weird, you try to ignore it. In fact, the more you ignore, the better off you'll be. Don't keep track of time. Don't go off investigating weird noises on your own. Don't touch the garden gnomes with the green hats. Why? She asked. What's wrong with the gnomes with the green hats? Sometimes they bite. They set a few employees to urgent care for stitches. Wow. What about customers? Yeah, most of them bite too. Okay, what can you tell me about... You know. You know? She whispered this next part with a sly grin. The animals. This was the moment I first realized that Rosa's steadfast and defiant curiosity might be a problem. What about the animals? I asked. Well, I heard a rumor from Jerry that the woods way out here past the edge of town are full of strange fauna, and sometimes, when night falls, the inhabitants of the forest get brave and wander closer to the gas station. She said the whole thing in that stupid, spooky Vincent Price voice you use when reading a ghost story to a group of first graders? Ugh. <sighs> Jerry, you idiot. Look, Jerry says and smokes a lot of things. I wouldn't pay much attention. He also told me something else, she confessed. Is it true that you can't fall asleep? Yeah, it's true. That's pretty cool. No. No, not really. Right on cue, Jerry walked into the gas station wearing nothing but a wife beater jeans and a camo trucker hat covered in fresh snow. Some people like to go home once their shift ends. Some people even manage to stay away from their place of employment all the way until their next shift begins. But as he reminds me time and time again, Jerry is not, quote, some people. You guys, it's colder than a stepmother's kiss out there. As usual, he didn't wait for any response. He just grabbed a bottle of whiskey off the shelf and walked up to Rosa and pointed at a pack of Marlboros. What are you doing? She asked. Aren't you freezing? Oh, yeah. Didn't you hear what I just said? I'm as cold as a witch's dick. Rosa handed over the pack of cigarettes and rang him up, saying, I don't think that's how the expression goes. You ever felt a witch's dick? It's pretty freaking cold. He chuckled. Does that pickup line ever work? You'd be surprised. She gave Jerry his total, but he just winked at her, put it on my employee tab, before turning around and walking back out into the fallen snow. Rosa looked at me with a confused expression. How do I ring something up under an employee tab? <sighs> we don't have employee tabs. So, yeah, Jerry just robbed us. The night passed like most, boring and slow. The snowstorm had kicked up at high gear, dropping the customer count to a trickle, maybe one or two per hour. 
It doesn't take long to show the new girl everything there was to the job, and before too long my brain was back on autopilot, and I was relaxing in a chair with an open book, but a hard-boiled big city detective. Rosa took the utterly pointless initiative to clean the place up a little. I think the dullness of the job was really starting to test her limits. The grind of long hours and the space between those events that form memories is where I like to hide, where I can relax and wait and forget about all the things knocking at the door of my mind. How many days have passed since the last time you slept? I wonder what she who shall not be named is doing right now. She promised you would see each other again. Will your mind still be intact when the disease takes you? Do you think she'll come to your funeral? Yep, take those thoughts, push them back into the vault, and focus on the shitty book you bought from the library clearance sale. Around midnight, Rosa ran up to the counter with a cardboard box and slammed it down in front of me. I looked up to see an enormous smile on her face. Yo, check out what I found in the storage closet! Before I could say, no thanks, she flipped the box upside down and dumped the contents onto the counter. It was a giant, tangled ball of Christmas lights, plastic garland, holiday decorations, and a freshly dead mouse. Oh, she said. Her smile instantly evaporated. I didn't know about the mice. I put my book down and started refilling the box while she went and found some napkins to wrap the rodent. About an hour later, the decorations were back in the storage room. The mice were all stuffed together in an old shoebox, and I was leaning against my crutches in the pouring snow while Rosa dug a tiny grave. There was something particularly cathartic about watching somebody else dig a hole next to the gas station. Thinking to myself if she only knew all the things that happened with that shovel, I highly doubt that she'd be so gung-ho about putting her fingerprints all over it. I selected one of those few spots where we hadn't already buried something horrific, and once the mice were in the ground, Rosa gave a short eulogy. Christmas mice? Oh, Christmas mice, how we never knew ye. I'm sorry you all died in a box in the supply closet, but I'm grateful that at least you didn't have to die alone. We pray that you don't haunt this gas station. Instead, may you find your peace in heaven, or whatever your mouse religion equivalent is. Yeah, probably Valhalla. When they say not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse, we will know that it wasn't for lack of trying. She looked at me and asked, anything to add? My mind jumped to a short list of mouse-based puns, but instead I decided to go with, yeah, somebody once came into the gas station trying to be a dick, and he told me that I was nothing but a little mouse. I think he meant it as an insult, but I didn't take offense. She nodded. That was really nice. We all started making our way back into the gas station. I heard a voice from just beyond the tree line whispering, Hey! Rosa stopped and looked back. Do you hear that? The freezing wind carried with it a noise that almost sounded like children giggling as it blew against the back of my neck. Nope, I said. Let's go back inside. It was sometime later when the store phone rang. Now I had gone to the supply closet to grab a bucket of salt for the front steps, so Rosa was the one to pick it up. I could hear her side of the conversation and didn't think too much about it until I heard the very last words. It's not bad, I think. This is my first day here. Oh. Oh, I like it. I, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Rosa. Yeah, actually. He's right here. Did you want to talk to him? Oh, oh, sure thing. I'll let him know. You too, Spencer. Oh, shit. She smiled at me and said, That was a friend of yours. Spencer... Middleton? I said with a sigh. Yeah! Once again, I watched her smile disappear. I guess she could tell from the look on my face. This was not good news. I need to make a phone call. Then, I think it's probably about time that I told you... Uh, something. Back in high school, we all pretty much knew that Spencer was a certifiable psychopath. But growing up in a small, boring, podunk town, we didn't have the societal framework to process this sort of thing. Finding him the help he needed was simply not a feasible option and most people just said a prayer for him and called it done. At one point, the principal delegated the responsibility to the school counselor slash gym coach, who tried to talk to Spencer about his feelings. All this was just the equivalent of putting a band-aid on a grease fire. 
There was a rumor around that time that Spencer was the one who had killed all those dogs. But when I told my mother about this, she just looked at me and said, Well, don't go near him with any dogs. After dropping out, he joined the army and worked his way up through the ranks until somebody recognized his, let's say, talents, and gave him a special assignment in a black budget program specializing in enhancing interrogation techniques, which is just a flashy way of saying torture. There's no official record of any of this, and the only reason I know is because he told me all these things one night to pass time while I dug my own grave at gunpoint. Now, Deputy O'Brien managed to intervene and arrest him before he could follow through, but Spencer escaped captivity after a few days, and for the last couple of months has been a wanted but elusive fugitive. Sometimes he calls me at work to remind me of the good times we had together, and to assure me that he'll be seeing me again soon. Now, I don't know if it's luck that's been keeping him from killing me, or the sadist in him is prolonging this intentionally. Tonight, he told Rosa to let me know that he was in the area. As for why Spencer wanted to kill me, let me simply say that maybe I deserve it, and maybe I don't, and we should leave it at that. The first thing I did was call O'Brien, but it went straight to voicemail. The second thing I did was tell all of this to Rosa, who listened patiently until I finished to ask the obvious question. So, do you have a gun or anything? In case he comes back? No, I... I'm not really a gun guy. Ninja stars, bazooka, flamethrower, chainsaw, any of the... weapon type stuff? No. Oh, well, shit. Maybe you deserve to be killed. Should we lock the doors or something? Oh yeah, that's another thing. Spencer knows how to get inside the gas station even when the doors are locked. He's done it, like, a couple of times before, and we haven't been able to figure out how. Well, crap, man! Is there anything else terrifying about him that you want to tell me? I once saw Spencer get his head cut halfway off and bleed out on the gas station floor, and he still somehow came back without any lasting damage. No, not really. The gas station door swung open, causing Rosa to squeak and jump. Hey guys, said the inebriated man in the oversized fur coat as he staggered into the store. Hey Jerry, I said back. Where you been? You know the roads are all shut down, he said, avoiding the question. It didn't matter. I already knew the answer. Rosa asked, what about the roads? Jerry braced himself against the frozen drink machine and answered, Yeah, it's all over the radio. If you were a little closer, I probably would have smacked him. God knows he deserved it. Really, Jerry? The radio? We're not supposed to talk about it, but... Some time ago, Jerry started a pet project building a POW-style shortwave radio, just to see if he could. He uncoiled an old Brillo pad and wrapped it around a toilet paper roll for the inductor, went to vulture on a couple of electronics in the storage, eventually ended up with something that actually picked up a few low-quality AM country stations. They'd also picked up something else. The signal is always weak. But if we put the radio in just the right spot, we can hear a man with a Slavic accent reading or discussing news relevant to our town in short, simple, choppy sentences. The weird thing is, he's always talking, no matter what. 24 hours a day without taking any breaks and never repeating himself. The temperature is 84 degrees. There are three more people in town than yesterday. The ratio of pig to human in town is approximately 2.078 to 1. The mayor's wife is asleep. The time is 24 hours and 16 minutes. The butcher shop is closed. The light is on at the high school gym. He talks about people in town. Whether eating for dinner, how many pairs of shoes they own, their favorite clothes and numbers, random facts, sometimes connected, sometimes not. We did a couple of experiments and learned that the radio signal gets a little stronger the further we go into the woods. And once we get past the gas station heading into town, the signal drops to nothing. We listen to him off and on for a few days as well to starve off boredom during slow shifts. But eventually we started to get a little concerned. The things he reported on were always so specific and bizarre. And some of what the voice repeated, nobody should have been able to know. Who didn't love who anymore? What high school student was about to find out she was pregnant? Which local business was about to receive a random health inspector visit? How many days the milk at the grocery store had left before it turned bad? And who was going to buy it? And when? We had theorized it was just an elaborate work of fiction, until one day, the voice announced Sean Buckley's death in a car accident eight hours before it happened. 
Then the voice started talking about us. Talking to us, even. There's a man at gas station. He uses name Jack. He still has one baby tooth. He has been diagnosed with fatal familial insomnia. He is threat level 8. He is aware of transmission. There is another man at gas station. His name is Jeremy. He is threat level echo. He is aware of transmission. He is 30 years old. He is looking at Jack. The men at gas station have built transmission receiver. Jeremy at gas station is moving towards transmission receiver. He is dismembering transmission. After that night, we made a pact to never listen to the radio again. And to add the transmission to that long list of try and forget stories, I think when most people swear on their lives not to do something again, they don't do it. Did I mention that Jerry isn't most people? There is a freak snowstorm, the worst one in a decade. All the roads leading into town are completely impassable. You know the drill. Mandatory curfew. State of emergency. Cats and dogs living together. Jeremy waved his arms in the air dramatically. Two dead, one missing. He grabbed a cup, filled it with cherry cola-flavored frozen drink, and started to down it. If all the roads were impassable, then where the hell did you just come from? That's Rosa. I whispered to her. Remember that thing I told you about ignoring the weird stuff? Jerry screamed, Ah! Oh, what is it? Brain freeze! Well, at least we still have... Right then... The power went out, leaving the gas station in complete pitch blackness. I used my phone's flashlight until I could find our box of emergency supplies, then somehow managed to drag it from the storage room with one hand while holding both crutches in the other. <sighs> I'm sure Jerry was just being kind by allowing me to do it on my own so I could retain my independence and sense of worth. But seriously, dude. You see me dragging this heavy-ass thing. You really just not going to offer any help. Once I had made it to the front of the store, Jerry sat down cross-legged and started going through the box, handing supplies out to the four of us. I had packed plenty of extra batteries, half a dozen flashlights, some bottled water, emergency rations, matches, flares, and more than enough... Wait a second. Four of us? Holy shit! I yelled, fumbling with the flashlight Jerry had handed me. After a painfully awkward few seconds, I managed to get the damn thing to turn on, and I pointed it at the other shadow standing in the room. Jerry, Rosa, and... Oh, Deputy O'Brien. Hey, you mind not pointing that in my eyes? She asked. Deputy Amelia O'Brien was the latest in an ever-growing list of deputy babysitters assigned to the gas station, getting all the way back to as long as I can remember. Some of them died. One of them went crazy. And then there's her. A tough-as-brick Brooklyn transplant with an itchy trigger finger and a long history of giving as many fucks as there are planets named Pluto. She was a very welcome sight. <laughs> Sorry, I said, pointing it back down. When did you get here? Just now, when you were off bumble-fucking around in the closet. I called to check on you 30 minutes ago, but nobody answered, and I nearly killed myself ten times driving through this blizzard to get here. What the hell happened? Rosa perked up. Oh! We were probably outside doing the funeral when you called. She unsnapped the gun in her holster. You... what? I explained quickly. It was for a bunch of mice. Jerry brussled. And you didn't invite me? O'Brien shook her head and said, That actually does not clear anything up. I took a deep breath and broke the bad news. It's a good thing you're here. Spencer called again. Said that he's in the area. Jerry opened the emergency pack of jerky, took a bite, and then said, That kid is... So in love with you. The deputy raised an eyebrow at the new girl. Who are you? I'm Rosa. It's my first day. Amelia O'Brien. Really? You don't look like an O'Brien. What does an O'Brien look like? An awkward silence followed. And then Jerry broke it by exclaiming, Yeah, we finally passed the bachelor test. It's a nice change of pace. Usually, when we end up trapped at the gas station, it's a total sausage fest. Usually? This happens before? Uh, once or twice. O'Brien spoke in her walkie-talkie. Dispatch is O'Brien. You read me? Over. 
Silence. Dispatch, are you hearing me? Over. More silence. She sighed and dug a dollar out of her pocket, handing it over to me, and she said, I need to use the store phone. But before I could even take the money, the phone started ringing. She shot me a look and said, Hey, crutches, pick it up. Put it on speaker. Without thinking, I tucked the flashlight into my mouth, crossed the store, and when I got there, I reached out to answer, then immediately spat the flashlight out and yelled, Oh my god! What? O'Brien shot back. I put that in my mouth and mice have been doing weird stuff to it. I put it in my mouth. Store phone rang a couple more times. O'Brien said, just answer the damn phone. I did. Hello? Hey, Jack. It's been too long. I pressed the button to switch to speakerphone. Hey, Spencer. Who's your new friend? I looked at O'Brien. He made a weird hand gesture that could have meant keep him talking or yeehaw, let's rob this bank. Between the current context, I assumed it was the former. Oh, her? Uh, the girl that you talked to earlier is my new jujitsu instructor. I had to fire the last one because he hadn't already taught me everything he knew. I've been getting pretty rad since the last time I saw you. Also, I'm taller now. She doesn't look like a jujitsu instructor to me. And neither does the lady deputy next to her. And is that Jerry? He looks drunk. O'Brien pulled out her service pistol, crisscrossed it with her flashlight in the opposite hand, and started pointing it at each of the windows and doors. Jerry always looks drunk, I said. Hey, said Jerry with a hiccup. O'Brien took the phone from me and slammed it into the cradle before yelling, Everybody get away from the windows right now! Jack, take the others, lock yourselves in the storage closet, go! I sighed and said, Fine. The next few hours were pretty damn boring. O'Brien had checked our perimeter, called for backup, and declared the situation tentatively safe in the time it took Jerry and Rosa to fall asleep in the closet. I covered them in packing blankets, then put one around my shoulders and tried to read my book by candlelight, but the situation was just too distracting to let myself get into it. O'Brien eventually joined us in the small room, reporting that there were no signs of Spencer anywhere, and if it wasn't for the fact that somebody had slashed all the tires on our cruiser and Rosa's Volkswagen Beetle, she might have been tempted to believe that he was just yanking our chain. So, what's the deal with the backup? I whispered to her as she came and sat down on a milk crate next to me. The others were knocked out, and I was just fine letting them sleep off as much as they could. O'Brien looked at them while she searched for the words. I don't know what's going on with you crutches, but ever since I was assigned to this job, my life has gotten exponentially weirder with every passing day. Yeah, I said picking up the edge from my blanket and putting it over her shoulders. She moved in a little closer and whispered, Talk to the sheriff. He sent in a snow truck out here first thing in the morning. Tried to tell him that this needs to be a priority, but evidently this is a snowmageddon. Can't afford to stretch his precious resources any further tonight. Yeah, that sounds about right. What about her? I thought you and Jerry pretty much ran this place. I laughed. <laughs> we don't run anything. She put a warm arm around my shoulder and said, Yeah, I'm really gonna miss you when you die. Thanks. That's, um, pretty presumptuous of you. So far, I've outlived almost every deputy they sent. Rosa shot up, eyes wide open, with a look of sheer terror. Hey, I said. Did we wake you up? Did you hear that? She said in a voice that did not sound anything like Rosa's voice. A cold shiver ran down my spine. Hear what? He's coming! Almost here! When he gets it, we're all over! We can't let him have it! Girl, said O'Brien, you're freaking us out. Who's coming, Spencer? She's dreaming, I said. One of my foster brothers used to do the same thing. Her eyes are open, but she's talking in her sleep. Right then, her eyes rolled way back into their sockets, revealing nothing but veiny white bulges. Did your foster brother do that too? Okay, I admitted. That is different. She slowly began to stand up, clutching the blanket to her chest, and then continued speaking in the same weird voice. Every living being! will be transferred into a conduit of agony and suffering if he finds what he's looking for. You will all beg for death, but it will never come. An unfathomable horror of worlds, inconceivable, is at your gate. Do not open the door. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Is it a gate or a door? Fix your metaphors, creepy nightmare Rosa. O'Brien stood up and looked at me. Should I wake her? Right then, Rosa dropped her blanket, revealing that she was actually floating about eight or nine feet off the ground. 
Oh, we both said at the same time. He might have been a little bit of an overreaction to shoot Rosa with a taser gun, but then again, it might have been that there was no changing what already happened. Rosa fell into Jerry, waking them both up in a screaming fit of expletives and confusion. It took a good 20 minutes before Rosa was calmed down enough for us to pull the prongs out of her skin and get her patched up. We were all in front of the store, Rosa sitting on the counter while O'Brien put the finishing touches on her bandages. Why the hell would you shoot me with a taser? Always with the questions, Rosa. You were sleep floating, I explained. Oh, she said. Sorry about that, I, I didn't mean to. Hey guys, said Jerry. What do you suppose that is? He pointed at something just on the other side of the glass door that looked at first glance like a body slumped against it. On closer inspection, I became certain that it was, in fact, a body slumped against it. O'Brien drew her gun and carefully walked over, undid the lock, and opened the door just enough for the body to fall halfway into the gas station along with a freezing blast of wet air. Crap on a cracker, said Jerry. Is that Spencer? It was. He had a busted lip, swollen black eye, scrapes and bruises covering his face like he had gone ten rounds with a dump truck, but O'Brien was smart enough not to let her guard up. She kept one finger on the trigger while she checked for signs of breathing, which, sadly, she found. She put the unconscious Spencer in handcuffs, dragged him into the store, and then handed me another dollar before calling into the sheriff's office. Do you think this is going to be enough? I asked. One pair of handcuffs? He's unconscious and unarmed. What exactly did you have in mind? I said, I don't know, maybe we can tie him up. At the same time that Jerry blurted out, wooden stake through the heart. We compromised, found a roll of duct tape, and secured him to a rolling chair, then pushed the chair into the supply closet that then was nailed shut. Thirty minutes later, we heard the pounding on the roof. Slam! The first one jolted us all to high attention. We didn't have but maybe two seconds before the next. Slam! Maybe a tree branch had fallen over in the storm. Slam! 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 They started coming frequently, like a muffled machine gun. Slam! 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 What the hell is that? O'Brien bellowed. Slam! 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 They came together. Five to ten each second, and then... Just as suddenly as it started, the pounding on the roof came to an end. Maybe it was Hale, I suggested. Or maybe, offered Jerry, it was him. Escaping. He pointed at the room Spencer was in. Now, how does that make any sense? Asked O'Brien. Lady, we are way past the point of making any sense, he answered. Then added, I think you know that. That was all it took to convince O'Brien to pry the nails back out of the door to Spencer's makeshift prison. But once we got it open, we saw that he was still there, duct taped to the chair. We all breathed a collective sigh of relief before. Hey, well, hey there, everyone, Spencer said with a sly smile. Merry Christmas. Now which of you wants to let me out of this chair? Spencer Middleton, said O'Brien. You're under arrest. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say... Christ, O'Brien, are we really going to do this again? Just set me free. Give me a weapon. You clearly have no idea what's out there right now. You think I did this to myself? Trust me. You're going to need my help. We probably should have gone with a stake. Spencer was still yelling at us as O'Brien closed the door again. Okay, she said. We need to check out what that noise was. Uh, no, no, we really don't, I responded. Rosa grabbed me by the arm for some reason, then said to the deputy, You can't leave us alone with this guy! Jeremy announced, I'll go check the noise. If I'm not back in five minutes, assume the worst. You're not going by yourself, snapped O'Brien. Fine, he said. Let's all go together. Rosa squeezed my arm tighter. I'd, I'd rather take my chances in here. Okay, said O'Brien near her wit's end. Then we split up. Are you freaking kidding me? I said. Are we really going to Scooby-Doo this? Apparently, we Scooby were. And after a few more rounds of discussing, we Scooby did. It was decided that Jerry and I would go check out that noise while O'Brien and Rosa stayed and watched the prisoner. Hey, O'Brien told me just as we left on our wholly unnecessary suicide mission. I can handle Floaty Girl and Duct Tape Boy on my own, but you need to take this. Just in case. I don't know why people are always trying to give me guns. I'm not a gun guy. Last time I had a gun... You know what? Don't even worry about the last time I had a gun. Plus, I need both hands just to move around. I'll take it, said Jerry. 
You ever fired a gun before? She asked. That depends, he answered. Are you a cop? She let out a defeated sigh and handed him her pistol. Try not to die, guys, okay? Rosa looked at us nervously and tried to offer some words of support. Be careful. I'd hate for this night to turn out to be a... What's the opposite of a sausage fest? Jerry answered, a clambery. Right. I'd, I'd hate for this to turn out to be a clambery. Jerry led the way with his two perfectly functioning legs pointing the gun and flashlight in front of him while he kicked a trail through the thick pile of snow that had settled knee-deep outside the gas station. We trudged through the frozen landscape until we were safely under the vehicle overhang next to the fuel pumps. Then he scanned the area with the light, revealing dozens of small holes in the fresh snow, like tiny baseball-sized craters. From here, he could see the roof of the gas station, as well as the piles of tiny winged creatures caught up in the gutters and slowly being swallowed by snow. I dug my own flashlight out of my coat pocket and scanned the area under the overhang, finding six or seven dead birds around the edges. It wasn't the first time I'd seen this, but it was the first time I know of where it happened right on top of the store. You get strange weather patterns out here, and every once in a blue moon, birds get confused and forget which way is up and fly straight into the ground in mass. Local scientists blame everything from fireworks to pesticides, but officially, the cause is unknown. All I know is that it's frickin' weird. Hey, check this out. I turned to see Jerry had plucked one of the creatures out of the snow and was holding it in his hands. Dude, don't touch that! It might have herpes! Look, he said, and pulled a long coil of copper wire out of the bird's corpse. I shrugged. But times are tough. He threw the bird back into the snow and wiped his hands on his pants. Should we go back inside? Yeah, in just a minute. But first, we need to talk. I really hate this part. Honestly, I'd rather face one of the creatures from the forest than have a serious chat with Jerry, but sometimes we don't get a choice. Fine. I'll come clean, he said. The mice were mine, but they were dead when I bought them. I, I used them for, for snake food. I, I didn't know. The radio, you, you put it back together? He blinked a few times and slowly pulled out his pack of Marlboros. So he put one in his mouth, slowly lit it, and took a drag, and then said, I really didn't have anything planned for this part, so I let his question hang there in the air for a minute. Did it say anything else? Oh, not much. Mostly about the snowstorm and... He trailed off. And... I asked. And it said that... Sagoth has risen. He took another drag. Are you sure he didn't say a savior has arisen? Like some kind of Christmas thing? He said it like ten times in a row. Sagoth has risen. Sagoth has risen. You get the point. Sagoth has risen, etc. I thought that it was kind of weird because I'd, I'd never heard him repeat anything before. We stood there in silence until he finished his cigarette. Then he looked back up at me. So, you ready to go back inside now? We both heard the sneeze at the same time. It came from somewhere down the road, leading into the forest. And if I could have jumped, I probably would have. What the hell was that? Jeremy said in a frantic whisper. It was a sneeze! Where's the gun? Jerry looked at the ground. I followed his eyes and pointed the flashlight at the blank spot in the snow next to the set of raccoon feet shaped prints leading off into the forest. I repeated the question slowly. Jeremy, where is the gun? I set it down to pick up the dead bird. You don't think Rocco made off with it, do you? Rocco, our resident mutant trash panda. I highly, highly doubt that Rocco didn't steal it. We both looked at each other with that what do we do now look, and then Jeremy yelled out, Bless you! all the stupid ways I've imagined of dying at the gas station. This was not one of them. A voice called back from somewhere deep in the blizzard. Hello? Is anybody there? No! I yelled back. Huh. Sure sounds like somebody to me. The voice was getting closer. I tried to do some quick math. Could I run back to the gas station before the source of that voice reached us? Probably not. 
A figure started to emerge in the snowstorm. A man-shaped figure. As it got closer, the details came into focus, and before long, the man was underneath the awning with us, casually walking towards us, his hands in his pockets, snow covering his hooded blue jacket. He walked right up to us and asked if he could bum a smoke. I watched the guy light it up, take a drag, and notice that there was something strangely familiar about him. He was five foot ten, early thirties, dark brown eyes, short and well-maintained beard, thin but in good shape, and he was wearing a coat that was way too big on him. After a few moments, he asked, You guys know if a gas station is open? His voice was tip of the tongue familiar. Yeah, there's no power, I answered, but the phone still works if you pay in advance. Who are you guys? You part of the emergency service crew or something? No. Uh, we work here. Uh, we got snowed in. No shit. I was driving through, I got stuck. I've been waiting in my car down the road for the past couple hours, but the engine just died. I thought I was gonna freeze to death out here. We shook our hands, and we introduced ourselves before Jerry finally asked the question that was on my mind since we first saw the guy. Hey, uh, you aren't Donald Glover? He laughed. <laughs> yeah, I am. I knew it! We were standing outside talking to a famous actor slash director, Donald Glover, at my gas station! Holy shit, I said. What are you doing here? I was driving through, answered the Grammy Award-winning musical performer, Donald Glover. You were just driving through? On Christmas Eve? He shrugged. He got lost. I looked at Jerry, and then I looked back at primetime Emmy awardee Donald Glover, who asked, So, is it cool if I come inside and warm up? Of course! Yelled Jerry before handing a spare flashlight to multiple Golden Globe winning writer slash comedian Donald Glover and leading the way back to the store. Once we were back inside, we introduced O'Brien and Rosa to five-time WGA award recipient Donald Glover, and I thought it was pretty cool. This was the second most famous person to ever step into the store. As, as if that really was Elvis that one time. But the girls were not impressed. In fact, they seemed more concerned about why we were returning without O'Brien's pistol. Jerry explained that we were attacked by a herd of ninjas. But O'Brien wasn't buying it. Before I could tell them about the birds, the store phone rang again. I was the closest, so I picked up while O'Brien gave Hollywood superstar Donald Glover a packing blanket to wrap up in. Hello, I said. The owner of the store was on the other end and let out an annoyed growl, then said, Jack, it's me. Benjamin? How many times have I asked you not to use my name on the phone? Oh, I'm sorry. It was Benjamin. <laughs> the crotchety bearded man that occasionally shows up at the gas station and shoots and blows things up. I would say more, but that's literally almost everything I know about him. What's going on over there? I'm looking at the weather reports right now, and the gas station looks like somebody opened up a portal to the center of the ninth circle of hell. Yeah, I said. Thanks for checking. By the way, I found your blog online. Oh? <laughs> yeah, what'd you think? I think you don't know the difference between a clip and a magazine. From here on out, I'd appreciate if you left me out of those little stories. Okay. I will. Um, are you going to be showing up this time? Thank you, Tori. I'm in Greece right now. Looking for a status report. Something, uh... Something beat the shit out of Spencer. Um... Oh, and then we lost power again. Oh, uh... Oh, by the way, uh... Does Sagoth has risen mean anything to you? Sagoth! Yeah, that's the name of the shape-shifting demon. If he's anywhere near the gas station, you boys need to hunker down and pray. Because that son of a bitch can look like anyone. Feeds off pain and leaves his victims stripped of all their skin. Oh, damn! I said. It's a good thing we found Donald Glover when we did. What followed was an agonizingly long pause. Hello? Did I lose you? Who the hell is Donald Glover? You know, the critically acclaimed musical genius. He performs under the pseudonym Childish Gambino. He's a rapper. He raps. Yeah, okay. I bet he's a great kisser too. Jack, did you somehow become dumber? Since the last time I saw you. What do you mean? Motherfucker! I just googled him! Donald Glover is at home with his family in Atlanta right now. You're in the presence of a shape-shifting demon! Or maybe... The one in Atlanta is the double, and the real one is in the gas station. He made that growling noise again and said, mm, Only way to kill a demon like this is to take off his head. Goodbye, dumbass! And the line went dead. Jeremy came 
and sat on the counter and said, All right, I'm not making any offers or anything. I just want to know your opinion. Do you think we're more likely or less likely to have an orgy now that Donald Glover is here? Jerry, listen closely, I said in a low voice. We have to kill Donald Glover. Okay, he said, hopping back to his feet. Let's do it. How? Jesus. We didn't even need an explanation or anything. We, we need to cut off his head. Nice! Well, I... I had one ally on board. That I knew that convincing two more people to help us cover up yet another brutal murder at this gas station might be difficult. Assuming we could figure out a way to kill not Donald Glover, and also assuming that he really was a demon, and also assuming that demons are even real. Benjamin was feeding me true information, and none of this was just a vivid hallucination caused by a rapidly deteriorating mental state. Man, when I lay it all out like that, it's a lot to take on faith before committing decapitation. I'm not sure how differently the night would have gone if Spencer's phone hadn't started ringing right then. And I'm also not sure how I keep forgetting that he has the only private cellular network on the planet that reliably gets service out here at the gas station. You guys hear that? Asked Not Donald. We all stood in a weird semicircle around him. And there was no possible way we didn't all hear the ringing noise coming from just behind the supply closet door. O'Brien and Rosa were between Not Donald and the supply closet, with Jerry and me on the opposite side. We had him surrounded. And if only I could somehow telepathically convey to the others that we needed to jump him now, while his guard was down, we might have a shot at incapacitating him while our skin was still intact. I don't hear anything, blurted Rosa between rings. She was probably the worst liar I had ever witnessed. But now that she had set the narrative, the others decided to commit. Yeah, me neither, said Jerry. Prob's just the wind. Donald, the demon, pointed at the supply closet and gave Jerry a raised eyebrow. You don't hear that? The ringing coming from right behind that door? No, said Jerry. Okay, what about you? He said to the deputy. Are you going to gaslight too? For some reason, O'Brien looked at me. I tried to make a hand gesture to say, He's a demon! We need to cut his head off! I think he just kind of confused the hell out of her. You should never play charades together. Yeah, it's nothing, she said. It's nothing? Why are you people being so weird right now? It was a scoff and said, We're not being weird. You're the one acting weird. Okay, he said. A silent moment passed. Then, Demon Daniel pointed his flashlight right at O'Brien's eyes. She flinched for just a second, enough time for Demonold to dart past her to the supply closet door. Wait, I yelled, but it was too late. Demonold opened the door. What the hell is going on? He asked, pointing the flashlight at Spencer. O'Brien put up her hands and said, It's okay. I can explain. Spencer started shouting, Oh my god, please! Please help me! You've got to save me! These people are maniacs! They beat me and killed my wife! You have to get help! Rosa, bad liar. Spencer, freaking amazing liar. O'Brien yelled, Close the door! He took a step forward. Hey! Yelled Demonold. You stay back! You stay away from me! All of you! Please, untie me! She's not a real cop! They killed people! So many people! Spencer started crying. Like, real, actual crying. I couldn't help it. I started slow clapping. Everyone turned their flashlights to me except for Jerry, who was... Um, clapping along. You got something to say? Asked the shapeshifter formerly known as Donald. Y yeah, uh, but how we don't turn this into a big, huge farce? How about we all... Come clean in the spirit of Christmas, okay? You're not really musical icon and fame television and movie star Donald Glover. You're really Sagoth, the shape-shifting demon. Do you have any idea how ridiculous you sound right now? Asked, hopefully, Sagoth. Yeah, I do, because I just said it. <sighs> These people, sobbed Spencer. They're crazy. Talking about demons and angels. They're killing people. There's something wrong with them. Please run, get help. Wait, why was Spencer staying in character? I just told him that this was Sagoth. Why didn't he drop the act? Oh, unless... Sagoth wasn't the one that had beaten him senseless, 
and left him propped up against the door? I felt a sudden pang of dread. The sensation was spiraling out of control way faster than I could keep up with. O'Brien attempted damage control. Everybody calm down. Donald, my name is Deputy Emilio O'Brien. You're a deputy? Yeah. And you think I'm a demon? No, of course not. But that guy does. He waved the flashlight at me, then pointed it at Spencer. And this guy right here? He's a wanted criminal. Okay, so that's why you beat him up and duct taped him to a chair and hit him in a dark closet? Is that something deputies do? Well, no, no, not exactly. But fuck this, I'm out. Before she could say anything, Donald? Question mark? Turned and ran out of the back door, letting another cold blast of freezing snow rush into the store before O'Brien raced out after him. The only sound in the room for the next minute was Spencer laughing. No, not laughing. Cackling. When he had finished, he said with a shit-eating grin, <laughs> This is getting fun. I wanted to run out after them. As stupid as it sounds, if I had been able to run, I would have. They were gone. You know, Brian was an adult who made her own decision. All I could do was wait. Time crept by slowly, waiting for her to return. Intrusive mental images of demons flaying my friend did not help. And neither did Spencer's comments. Hey Rosa. She looked up. Shut up, I said. Let me just ask you one question. What exactly did Jack tell you about me, huh? Did he try to sell you that horse shit about me being some kind of sociopath? Rosa answered. The exact word he used was psychopath. Spencer laughed again. Nah, I never heard anyone before in my entire life. Came back out here for Jack. Worried about him. You know what he is, right? You know, what FFI does to your brain? Shouldn't be out here near other people, no. He needs to be in a hospital where he can't hurt anybody else. What do you mean, anybody else? I crutch walked over to Spencer and considered hitting him, but then decided against it for two reasons. First, that would have been embarrassingly ineffective. And second, it was obvious that that's what he wanted. He was trying to flip Rosa and prove that I was the bad guy. I don't know why I thought it was a good idea to engage in conversation. Do you have any idea how annoying it is to live with what you did to my leg? Yeah, I bet it's not half as bad as what you did to the folks you killed. Why don't we ask Kiefer, or ask about my old boss? Hey, I didn't kill your old boss. A second passed before he cracked a smile and I realized what I'd done. What about Kiefer? Asked a soft, nervous voice from behind me. Oh, I said, turning to Rosa. Yeah, well, him either. Yeah, I didn't kill anybody. Let me ask you a question, Jack. You know. Because you're in such an honest mood right now. Whatever happened to Carlos, huh? I've been sitting here in the dark all night, and I can't shake this weird thought. Am I the only one who wants to know why Carlos isn't here? I looked at Jerry and said, Put him in the cooler. We wheeled the psychopath into the walk-in, double-checked that the duct tape was secure, then closed the door and propped a chair up against the handle. He could scream to his tiny black heart's content in there. It wouldn't bother us. Ten minutes more passed before O'Brien returned to the store. <sighs> he got away, she said as she dusted the snow off her jacket. Jerry shattered a glass beer bottle against the wall and pointed the jagged fragment at her, yelling, Nice try, demon! She glared at him and said, if you come near me with that thing, you better be ready to use it, because either I'm going down or you are. He's right, I said. What? Asked Rosa and O'Brien at the same time. O'Brien was alone out there with Sagoth. For how long? We have no idea if you're really you anymore. Jack. Yeah, I think you're confused. Rosa raised her hand and said, Why don't we just ask you something that only the real O'Brien would know? Yeah, good idea, said Jerry. Is Jack circumcised? Dude! How the hell would I know that? She screamed. Jerry looked at me, then back at her, then back at me. Oh, were you two not? Oh, I'm sorry. I think I totally misread that whole situation. Remind me to kick your ass later, she said, taking the words right out of my mouth before pointing her flashlight at the empty supply closet. Where's Spencer? I explained that he was trying to get into our heads. We had no choice but to put him in there. It was self-defense. Amazingly, she didn't disagree. It took a minute for the situation to calm down, but eventually, Jerry lowered his bottle knife and agreed that we would all just keep an eye on one another until daylight. And backup came. 
I lit the last of our candles and placed them all around the store, then got O'Brien alone in a corner. Jerry was still eyeballing us pretty hard, so I whispered quietly, There's something I think you need to see. What is it? She whispered back. I can't say exactly. Okay, I need to show you. Okay. Where is it? I need Spencer's phone. Let me guess. It's still on him? I nodded. In the midst of Spencer's mind games, I forgot to steal his cell phone again. I definitely didn't love the idea of opening the cooler door. Every time I think of Spencer, I convince myself that he's figured out a way to escape, and he's just a few seconds from falling down on me from the ceiling like an evil Spider-Man. I'll be right back, she said. I followed as close behind as possible as she went to the cooler and pulled the chair back. What is she doing? Asked Jerry in an atypical voice that I would call concerned if it was coming from anyone else. We didn't answer. Instead, O'Brien opened the door, pointed the flashlight at the still smiling Spencer, and walked up to him. I waited until she had put her flashlight on a shelf and reached her hand into Spencer's pocket before I sprung into action, slamming the cooler door shut, pushing the chair back into place. I could hear her muffled scream and slams against the other side of the metal door. I'm sorry, I whispered. Dude, what the hell? I leaned my back against the cooler and looked at the shocked faces of Jerry and Rosa. And I made a mistake? If that really is O'Brien, then we'll know in a few hours when help arrives. If it isn't, we've got the demon exactly where we need it. What demon? screamed the ever-inquisitive Rosa. When did you start talking angels and demons? I'm willing to give the benefit of the doubt, but a, a person has their limits. All I know is that you've been acting strange all night, and then your friend shot me with a taser in my sleep, and then you come with this guy that, that you're all fanboying over so hard I expect you to start drinking his bath water, and then out of nowhere you start saying he's a demon? Well, when you put it like that, sure. I guess this does look bad. Where's the gun, huh? You two go outside and then Jerry loses the gun. How do we know that you didn't take it? Yeah, yelled Jerry. How do we know that you didn't take it? I gave him my coldest stare. I want you to let O'Brien out of the cooler right now, please. She crossed her arms and started tapping her foot. I, I can't do that. Why not? She called me Jack. So? Yeah, echoed Jerry. So what? So she never calls me Jack. She calls me Crutches, or Weirdo Boy, or some other slightly insensitive pet name. I, I've never heard her call me Jack before. Hmm, said Jerry. He does make a compelling point. Rosa screamed, shut up! It was too late. Spencer had put the roots of doubt into Rosa's mind, and there was nothing I could say that would get her back on board. Fortunately for me, I didn't have to say anything, because right then, the front doors opened and O'Brien walked in. He got away, she said as she dusted the snow off her jacket. Jerry shattered another glass beer bottle against the wall and pointed the jagged fragment at her, yelling, Nice try, demon! She glared at him and said, If you come near me with that thing, you better be ready to use it, because either I'm going down or you are. How did you get out? Rosa stammered. Get out of what? She asked. Oh, check it out. Jerry said to the room. It's Rosa's first time witnessing something paranormal. Let's see how she reacts. O'Brien put up her hands and said, What the hell are you talking about? And why is there a chair next to the cooler? And where is the duct tape boy? Rosa fainted. And as strange as this sounds, probably a good thing that she wasn't conscious for this next part. Did you ever hear the one about the guy who thought that a fireman was an arsonist? Admittedly, it's not a very good joke. And even if it were... I'm awful at delivery. People usually think I'm trying to be funny when I'm not, and same for the other way around. But at any rate, the punchline is something to the effect of every time there's a fire, he's there. Feel free to forget the joke if you want to. Not important, just something I was thinking about. Well, Jerry covered Rosa with a blanket and made every attempt to keep her comfortable while I tried to explain the situation to O'Brien. Wait, so you're telling me that there's an evil doppelganger inside that cooler? Yeah. And... How do you know that's what it is? A magic radio and a monster hunter told us? No, I just do. I need more to go on than that. Okay, please, just don't go into the cooler until after help has arrived. You can wait a few more hours, right? I could see the gears turning in her head, and I had to wonder if she thought I was crazy. Or if she was about to rip off our flesh and feed on our suffering. 
Surely, if this actually were the shapeshifter, there wouldn't be any better opportunity to start picking us off. Two of us were locked in the cooler, one of us was unconscious. I'd never been much of a fighter, even with all my limbs. And Jerry was... Well... Jerry. Obviously, she didn't kill and eat me, so I was forced to assume that this really was the original O'Brien, and the one in the cooler was the double. But my confidence level, in anything, reality included, had hit zero and started digging a long time ago. A pair of headlights lit up the room and we both looked outside at the snow truck pulling into the parking lot. I couldn't believe it. The cavalry was early! In my experience, anything can happen at the gas station, but seriously, that never happened! The cavalry was Saul Berthelot, the retired school bus driver and owner-operator of the only snowplow in town. He must have had plans for Christmas because people around here aren't exactly known for finishing ahead of schedule. And especially on the taxpayer dime, but I'd take my miracle where I can get them in these days. Saul pulled up next to Pump 2, honked a couple times, and waved at me. O'Brien stated the obvious. I think this Jagoff wants you to turn on the pump. Come on, he knows the pumps don't work without electricity, doesn't he? I'm guessing he doesn't. None of us wanted to open the door and go back into the freezing cold. But when the pumps hadn't magically switched on after a few seconds, Saul decided that it would be a good idea to lean on the horn until somebody came out to help him. O'Brien pulled out her car keys and started for the door. Where are you going? I asked, stumbling after her and trying my best not to make it sound like I suspected that she might be on her way to kill him and strip him of his flesh. I was going to help him on his way, if that's alright with you, Jack. I suddenly felt very small. It's bad enough not being able to trust my own eyes, or memories, or mine. It's so much worse not being able to trust my friends. Hang on a second, Jerry said before O'Brien pushed the door open. You just called Jack, uh, Jack. Yes, so? Yeah. Jerry looked at me and waved his hands in the air. Your entire basis for locking the other O'Brien in the cooler was that she called you Jack! O'Brien shook her head at me. I called you Jack all the time. It's your name, dumbass. Don't open the door! Behind Jerry, Rosa was floating with her eyes rolled back into pupilless white bulges. He looked back at her and casually said, Oh, snap! She's floating again. It's not safe! Something has found you! It's waiting! Hungry! Outside! She slowly started to rise into the air by a few more inches until Jerry grabbed her around the waist. I'm gonna have to tie her to a chair or a, a doorknob or something. Do you remember where Benjamin left all the paracord? There's something on the roof! I looked her in the... Uh... Eye... Area. And asked... Now, is this like a metaphorical something on the roof? You fools! There's something on the roof! With that, Rosa pointed out the glass doors, up at the covered awning over the gas pumps, and the thing, leaning over the edge, stared down at the snowplow. What followed is actually pretty difficult to describe. See, when I saw it, the three of us had a shared memory, a visceral animal reaction, like a, like a nut punch to the soul. Before that instant, I had seen some things, like truly bizarre things, that many people may have considered horrific. My own exposed bones, uh, a clan of nudist zombies, um, a snake and spider hybrid. I could keep on with the list of things all day, but my point is, after this, I'm going to have to completely re-examine my concept of horrific. The very image of the creature, which is not even the right word for it if human language is capable of one, was something that eyes were never meant to see. It forced our minds way past fight or flight into some third option, like my brain simply gave up and shat its pants. We all said it at the same time. Fuck! Fuck! Rosa fell into Jerry's arms with her eyes closed, and he dropped her onto the ground like a sack of dog food. We were all transfixed at the horrendous beast on the ledge of the pump awning. Its head was the size of a beach ball, shaped more or less like an enormous skull. The eyes were sunken charcoal pockets that didn't appear to move in time or relation with the rest of its body, sort of like balls of smoke. Two nostril slits above an open mouth filled with disorganized rows of serrated chalk white teeth like those of a shark, each one about the size of my thumb. It had two spinal horns, both at, at least a yard in length and its shiny black marble in appearance 
It, the thing's clawed hands were tipped in jagged talons, blacker than black, and its skin resembled that of a third-degree burn, pinkish deposits of scar tissue glued upon layers of giant, ropey muscle. Even more interesting was that we could see the beast in all of its monstrous glory outlined against the sky, even though there was no light out there other than the ones on the snowplow. Our eyes were picking up a whole new wavelength outside of the normal visual spectrum. It was all coming from this thing. Three-way jinx. Temporarily snapping the rest of us back to reality and all likelihood saving us from losing what's left of our minds. O'Brien fell to the ground and started violently barfing. Hey! Yelled Saul from inside the truck. You guys got any gas left or what? At first, I didn't want to look back out those doors. I had to. Saul was about to do something that he had no idea would be the single worst mistake of his life. I feel I should tell you maybe just like a little bit more about Saul. When I was still too young to drive, I would have to walk half a mile every morning to my area school bus pickup spot at 5.30 a.m. My house was close to Saul's hunting camp where he parked the school bus, so that meant that I was always the first on the bus route, and if I was ever late, he would leave without me. But depending on how hungover he is, he might not start driving until 6.30 or 7, which meant that I would have to stand there in the middle of a dirt field next to the road for up to an hour, an hour and a half, at the point of each day when mosquitoes were waking up. After his wife left him, he became much more intolerable drunk, and his kids would show up to school with bruises and broken teeth. He would spend hours at the gas station sometimes, refilling the same cup of coffee over and over, droning on to anyone that would listen to him about what new group of people he had decided was ruining the country. One time, his name came up on the transmission. There is a man, Saul Berthelot. He cries alone in Deerstan. His blood alcohol content is 0.3110. He owns 42 firearms. His favorite color is purple. I guess my point, um, if I even have one, is that Saul is a shitty bus driver. And a shitty husband. And, and father. Shitty customer. Shitty person. But yeah, shitty hunter, too. He was a lot like most people in this town, actually. But even still... I did not want to watch him get his skin ripped off. I got to the front door and pushed them open at the same time Saul was stepping out of his snow truck. I screamed, STAY INSIDE YOUR VEHICLE! Either Saul hadn't heard me, or he decided to ignore it, choosing instead to down the rest of his 40-ounce snatty light before tossing it into the snow. Saul, go back to your truck! There's a gas leak or something! He was a couple yards from his truck when he looked at me and yelled back, FUCK YOU, I NEED TO TAKE A PISS! The creature lurched forward from the edge of the awning, reaching its left arm down with the speed of a mousetrap and snatched Saul into the air by his feet. The beast pulled Saul, dangling upside down, screaming and cursing close to its mouth. Saul was extremely lucky that he always kept a loaded pistol tucked into his pants. Not because it helped him survive the situation. No, he died. Like, so much dead. But at least the pistol saved him from what could have been a feast of agony for the thing on the awning. Which I had deduced by now was actually the real demon's soga. He popped off a couple of rounds into the demon's face, but the mortal weapon was ineffective as a bee sting, and all it did was piss the demon off enough to slam Saul full force against the concrete pavement below. When he picked the man back up, his broken body dangled lifelessly in the monster's hands. With its other hand, it poked at Saul a few times, then with one of its talons, opened the man up and spilled his blood out into the snow. As far as last words go, fuck you, I need to take a piss. Or Probably not the ones you want on your tombstone. Uh, I felt myself being yanked backwards by my shirt collar and tossed onto the floor of the gas station before O'Brien closed and locked the door. Yeah, nice. Lock the door. Deadbolt will be sure to stop the 20-foot-tall demon creature from coming inside. She pulled me to my feet and said one word. Weapons. We stayed as far away from the door as possible while we turned the place inside out looking for whatever we could use to defend ourselves, but it was seriously slim pickings. Broken glass shards, chair legs, a pair of spare crutches, three pocket knives. We didn't have what it took to kill the thing outside if it wanted us to. I can't believe he's dead, lamented O'Brien as she collected a few bottles of our more flammable liquor. It's like that. Well, Jerry answered as he duct taped a pocket knife to the edge of a chair leg. 
He died doing what he loved. Shooting stuff. O'Brien shook her head in disgust. Jerry caught the gesture and asked, Oh, I'm sorry. Were you and Rando close? Dude, they said. I know tensions are high because it's Christmas and all, but read the room. A man just died. So what? Said Jerry defensively. Somebody dies every 600 milliseconds. We get focus if we have to grieve every single one of them. Are we really going to pretend that any of us are broken up about that red shirt? If we can be perfectly honest for a second, the value of human life out here at the gas station is grossly over-exaggerated, and out of the six people inside this building, Rosa is probably the only one of us that hasn't killed anybody. He stared at me and O'Brien, daring us to call him out on that. We all just stood still, trying to think of what to say. But there really wasn't anything to say. For all his faults, Jerry could be very... Jerry-ish sometimes. And it's easy for me to forget that when I first met him and he was trying to get me to join a murder cult. Well, I said finally, it's only her first day. We allowed ourselves a short awkward laugh before going back to hunting for weapons. I can't say exactly how much time had passed, but the three of us were ripping open every box in the supply closet when we heard Rosa say, Hey guys, what happened? We looked back and saw her standing in the doorway, pointing Saul's revolver at the floor. Where'd you get that? asked O'Brien. I saw this thing sitting there on the ground outside. Did you guys know there's a snow truck out there? How did you get it? O'Brien asked, even though I think we all knew the answer. Just walked outside and picked it up. Why? The annoyance in her voice had ticked up a notch. Don't do that again. Why not? The annoyance in her voice had ticked up a couple more notches. Don't worry about it. Jerry jumped in with, You don't, you didn't happen to see a terrifyingly huge hell monster while you were out there, did you? She squinted at him and said, No. Why did you lose one? O'Brien reached out and snatched the gun from her. Hey! Sorry, I didn't feel like explaining to everyone why I'm the only one here that should have a gun right now. Well, that's fair. I wasn't even mad. I was, however, mad at the plan that she laid out next. Desperate times call for desperate measures. And there was one resource that we had purposefully neglected to tap before now. Whatever was left inside the cooler, we were going to need help fighting the thing outside. And whether I liked it or not, Spencer was a survivor. O'Brien checked the revolver to see that we had four bullets left. That would almost certainly not be enough if we needed it. The deputy opened the door, gun in hand, while the rest of us stood close behind, holding flashlights. Our job was to collectively point them into the eyes of anybody or anything that might try to jump out at us. It came to that. We didn't know what to expect when we opened the door, but the first thing we saw was the empty chair that Spencer had been duct taped to. Hello? Is anyone in Is anyone alive in here? After a few seconds with no response, she stepped into the cooler, and I immediately regretted going along with this plan. Spencer flew in from next to the cooler door, hooked an arm around O'Brien's gun hand, and spun her into the wall. The gun clacked to the ground, and we all tried pointing our flashlights at him, but he was just way too friggin' fast. He planted a solid boot into Jerry's solar plexus, sending him crashing into the wall across from the cooler door, snatched a handful of Rosa's hair, yanked her into the cooler with him. Before O'Brien could even stand up, Spencer had Rosa in a chokehold with a pencil that he had used for inventory counts pressed tightly against her neck. You guys get bored without me or something? He taunted. I kept my flashlight trained on him as he slowly backed into the cooler. The deputy's handcuffs were still around his wrist, but the chain had been snapped. And now it was nothing more than a pair of fancy bracelets. Dude? Listen, I started- Shut up! He yelled. Here's how this is gonna work. First, crack! Spencer released Rosa and fell to the ground, his head colliding with the floor and bouncing. Behind him- Ah, oh shit, not this again. Spencer- Holding the weapon he had just bludgeoned the other Spencer with, the same flashlight that the O'Brien double had taken into the cooler, and I was just starting to realize the same exact flashlight I had given to Donald Glover earlier that night. Damn, said Spencer, the conscious one. Is that what I look like? I'm one sexy motherfucker. The expression on his face changed once he spotted something in the cooler floor. I followed his eyes to where he was looking and saw it. Saul's revolver. 
O'Brien leapt for it at the same time as Spencer, and they both collided before reaching it. They were flying into the shell, O'Brien catching most of the impact, and I dove into the cooler, finding the disgusting sticky ground and feeling around in the dark until my hands felt something cold. A heavy piece of metal. I pointed it at Spencer. But there was no way I was going to get a clear shot, especially with Rosa's wild flashlight job. Spencer threw O'Brien into the rolling chair, and she flipped over it onto the floor. He wiped a bead of blood from his face and took a step towards me. But that's as far as he made it before another body jumped out of the dark and tackled him from the side. And here's where things get even more confusing. Pencil Spencer landed on top of Flashlight Spencer, started punching him hard, but not hard enough. In no time, Flashlight Spencer had slammed his flashlight into Pencil Spencer's fist, then flipped him onto his back and started wailing on him. I had my gun aimed right at them both. Completely not sure what to do. I looked at O'Brien and said, I don't know which one's the real Spencer. Who fucking cares? She yelled back. Shoot them both! Flashlight Spencer stopped punching. He and Pencil Spencer both looked at me and said, Huh? I hesitated. Pencil Spencer stabbed the pencil into Flashlight Spencer's shoulder and twisted. Flashlight Spencer winced and jumped off him. Right then, Jerry called out from the cooler doorway, Hey, butt brain! He was holding a lit Molotov cocktail. Not for long, before I had time to scream, Bad idea! He had pitched the damn thing at Flashlight Spencer. He caught it in his fucking hand. This is when I thought things couldn't get any crazier. Pencil Spencer punched the still-burning weapon hard enough to shatter it into a blue fireball that lit up the entire room for just a moment before burning out and leaving us all in the dark trying to catch our breaths. Rosa pointed her flashlight at the figure running out of the cooler. The Spencer ran right through Jerry like he was made out of balloons, then disappeared out the back door. After a couple of seconds, we collectively remembered that there was still a Spencer in the room and pointed our flashlights around to find him. I looked at where he just was, finding nothing but specks of blood and broken shelves. Then I pointed at O'Brien. Then Rosa, who was sitting on the ground, pointing a flashlight at me. Then the other Rosa, who was sitting right next to her, holding an identical flashlight. The Rosas both crawled quickly to the opposite sides of the cooler, and then stared at one another with the exact same look of frozen shock, while O'Brien stood between them and spoke. All right, here's the deal. One of you is a shapeshifter. That's the one I'm talking to right now. We didn't come in here to hurt you. We came in here because we need your help. There's something outside the gas station that just killed a man. I watched both of their faces and instantly knew. One looked up at O'Brien and asked in a soft voice, Somebody died? The other waited about a second too late to mimic the look of fear and concern on Rose's face. I walked right over to the shapeshifter and said, You're busted. She looked at me with a sweet little, What did I do? look. But it wasn't fooling me. And then the look changed into a wry smile, and she chuckled. Hi. What can I do? You got me. So, I started, Who is Sagoth? She got to her feet and answered. Oh, I don't doubt you've got a ton of questions, but I don't have the time to desire to answer them. This has been a nice distraction, but if what you say is true, I need to get to work. You can't... You could have escaped any time you wanted, I surmised. Well, yeah, but you humans are such curious creatures, and I needed something to do to pass the time until Sagoth showed up. Well, I'll be off. And when you wake up, you won't remember any of you. The double waved his hands, and Brian, Jerry, and Rosa Prime all fell to the floor unconscious. I looked at each of them, just trying to make sure that they were still breathing, then back at the mimic Rosa in front of me. Well, that certainly is strange. But this time, but it's time for you to go to sleep. She waved her hands again. I blinked a couple more times. What? I don't sleep, I said back. I thought I told you that. You may have told Rosa, but I can't copy memories, Jack. Just voices and faces. Now, who are you? I, I really don't have time for... I pointed the revolver at her and squeezed the trigger. Okay. Hold on. I know that sounds bad, but I'm sure you moral absolutists out there are probably thinking to yourselves, I would not have done that if I were in this situation. Well, you know what? You weren't. I was, and I was actually pretty pissed off. Not just because the asshole had been screwing with us, using us as bait to lure out the real demon, and, like, letting us all go super paranoid on one another this whole time, but also because after all this, after everything I'd been through, that night, he announced that I was going to be the only one to remember any of it. <laughs> Besides, 
I had already worked out that a bullet to the chest wasn't going to kill it. Ah! It screamed, immediately transforming into O'Brien before my eyes. Why would you do that? All I wanted to do was help you. But if I had to kill you to get to Sagoth, I will. And you're not- I shot again, aiming for the center mass like Benjamin always said. The creature immediately transformed into Jerry. It smiled and I shot again. And that's when it turned into someone else. It turned into her. She who shall not be named. The girl that would haunt my dreams if I was capable of having any. The creature looked at me with her green eyes and asked, Well, are you going to shoot me again? I sighed and lowered the gun. What's the point? It changed one last time. And then I was standing in my own presence. And I gotta say, I didn't realize how rough I was starting to look. I desperately needed a haircut. The circles under my eyes had their own shadows. My cheekbones were getting more pronounced, and I was even skinnier than I looked in the mirror. Jack, I'm gonna tell you something I've never told any human before. To me, your kind are a lot like hamsters. I don't feel compelled to explain my actions or motivations to people because you're so primitive and unevolved that you simply couldn't wrap your tiny mind around it. Okay, I said, that's fair. There's no such thing as demons. Say, Goth, is my responsibility. Okay? He sleeps inside of one of the wrinkles in your universe, but something has woken him up. Something I even I don't know. Every century or so, I have to put him back to sleep, which is why I'm here. Okay, not to hurt you, but to help you. Benjamin, in case you're hearing this right now, you were wrong. Again. Also, fuck you. The legend states, A long time ago, of demons, people saw a shapeshifter every time Sagoth awoke and feasted. Before long, humans confused us. Oh, I see. Firefighter. I'm gonna stop Sagoth from destroying your world now, Jack. But before I do, there's one last piece of information I want to leave with you. When I take somebody's form, I don't see memories, but I can feel what's inside them. In a lack of better terms, I'm what you call an empath. Okay. You and your friends here are all kinds of messed up. You'd need an army of psychologists to untangle the mental slinkies inside your mind. Okay, thanks. That's not what I'm trying to say. Your fucked up brains aren't all that special. But the other one, Spencer, I looked inside of him and I saw, all I saw was like, nothing. Absolutely nothing. Same as I see when I look at a, a table or a rock. Just a black void. Yeah, I responded. I actually knew that. I take a step back and let my doppelganger walk out of the cooler. And then right out the front doors. The rest of the night passed on without incident. The others slept where they fell. But I tried to make them comfortable with blankets and pillows made out of bags of stale bread. While the sun came up, I cleaned. Enough to fill four contractor bags. And then I started writing up the inventory loss slip for everything that had been damaged in the fights. It's amazing how productive you can be when you don't sleep. After everything was back in order, I sat in my chair behind the register and read for an hour or so while the others slept off whatever the shapeshifter had done to them. Our first customer walked into the store a little while after that. I didn't bother looking up for my book because I had already posted a sign on the door that said we didn't have any electricity and couldn't sell gas or run cards or accept cash, and nothing worked. I added my own festive touch to the bottom, the drawing of a Christmas tree. The customer walked up to the counter and interrupted my book right when it was finally starting to get interesting. Excuse me. You have any band-aids? I looked up from my book and I saw the man standing there was Spencer fucking Middleton complete with a pencil still sticking out of his shoulder. I quickly reached for the gun, which I had left on the counter, and realized it wasn't even there anymore. Spencer lifted the revolver and asked, Was this what you're looking for? Feel a little light. You think you were going to take me out with the first shot? I slowly dog-eared my page and placed the book on the counter before asking, Is there any way you're actually just a shapeshifter? Spencer shook his head. A minute later, we were back outside in the knee-deep snow behind the gas station. Spencer dug the barrel of the gun into my back and walked me towards the woods. When we got there, he yelled, STOP! He looked around, smelling the air, smiling, and pulled a long knife out of his sheath on his belt. Yeah, this'll work. Are you left-handed or right-handed? Why? I asked. Never mind. He grabbed my left hand and sliced my pinky clear off 
and then grab both of my crutches and yank them away from me. I hit the thick blanket of snow and hugged my rapidly bleeding hand wound against my stomach. The hot, wet liquid pouring out felt strangely comforting as it warmed my torso. It's nothing personal. Yeah, I just need some bait. Got a new boss now. He wants me to bag and tag something special. Do me a favor. Keep on bleeding. Won't take long for the thing to catch your scent. For what it's worth, if this thing doesn't kill you, I'll let you live. He turned and began to walk away. Hey, Spencer! I yelled after him. He stopped. Yeah! You're a dick. He laughed and walked back into the gas station carrying my crutches under his arm. I laid on my back, looking up at the sky and hearing the familiar sound of that gas station door closing, followed by the familiar scraping noise of the deadbolt pulling into place. If I was going to give survival the old college try, it would have to be now or never. I pushed myself along with my good hand and leg, leaving a sloppy trail of bloody snow behind me. Maneuvering in my condition was going to be difficult, to say the least, and I could sense that my vision was beginning to tunnel, which for me is a particularly bad prospect. If I lose consciousness, well, it means I'm dead. I managed to pull myself all the way to the side of the gas station before I finally decided that this was a waste of time. I wasn't getting inside, and even if I did, Spencer would just pull me right back out. There was something left to do but hope for one more miracle. Hey, Jack. What are you doing out here? I looked up to see my old friend Tom, with his white hair perfectly matching the snowy landscape. And Tom was the first deputy that they sent out to babysit us, and the first one to die. I squeezed my bloody nub against my armpit to try and slow the bleeding as I worked out if I was looking at a ghost, a hallucination, or the shapeshifter, and realized that I generally couldn't tell. Spencer's using me for bait? Tom instantly morphed into a seven-foot-tall, 400-pound Samoan covered in scars and tribal tattoos that limited the options down to hallucination or shapeshifter. That punk is back! He barked. Yeah? Well, I guess I need to teach him a lesson about- He stopped and turned back to the woods. Something out there was crunching loudly through the forest, snapping through the branches and causing a hell of a lot of noise as it approached. The Samoan figure crouched next to me and whispered, Sorry. Looks like we don't have time to get out of here. Sagoth has smelled your blood and now he's coming for you. Oh, that sucks. Listen to me very closely. There's one thing you need to know about Sagoth. He has one weakness, and that is this. He cannot hurt you if you do not look at him. Do you understand? No. Close your eyes. No matter what happens, no matter what you hear, keep your eyes shut until you hear me say the words, Salute him! Till then. He'll do everything he can to trick you into opening your eyes. Once you do that, all bets are off. He'll start with your eyelids. Do you understand? Still no? Shapeshifter sighed and said, Close your eyes! Right then, I saw it. Sagoth. Pushing his way through the forest, he stood as tall as the trees, horrendous and humanoid, with an aura of inconceivable terror and a face that screamed all things dark and hateful. I shut my eyes and instantly felt blessed relief. It's okay said a sweet, gentle voice. You can look now. It's safe. He will do everything he can to trick you to open your eyes. Um, no, that's okay, I said. From behind me, I heard O'Brien screaming, Jack, help me! I have to do better than that. All at once, I felt them crawling all over me. Insects, they chirped and squeaked as they flooded my pant legs and under my clothes and even into my nose, ears, and mouth. I gagged and swatted at them, but still pressed my eyes shut as hard as I could. A burning heat blasted across my face. I heard the giant being scream from inches away. Maggot, open your eyes and behold your damnation. Uh, no thanks, I yelled back. And then he brought the big guns. The next thing I knew, I was falling. There was no earth beneath me, only air whipping past my skin as I plummeted down, down, down. It's a good thing I'm still a coward because I think squeezing my eyes shut in a situation like that was actually my natural reaction. And after falling for what felt like ages, I finally landed on a warm ocean. This was about to get really tough. I kicked and screamed at the water around me with no idea which way was up or down. I was certain that I was about to drown, but still, I kept my eyes shut. Eventually, I could feel myself rising. The air left in my lungs was maybe possibly enough to pull me to the surface. I held off for as long as I could until my lungs ached with a pain that was almost as bad as death, and still, I had not broken the surface. This was it. 
The moment I would finally die. But if I had to go, I wasn't going to give that douchebag demon the satisfaction of knowing that he'd beaten me. I kept my eyes shut, put up two middle fingers, and took a deep breath of water. Which, of course, turned out to be air. And as soon as I inhaled, I was transported back to the snow-covered patch of dirt next to the gas station, completely dry and still freezing to death. The air suddenly reeked of boiled eggs, and a girl's voice said into my ear, Salute him. You can open your eyes, Jack. Say Goth is back where he belongs. I cautiously opened one eyelid and looked at the amazingly beautiful woman standing beside me and asked her, So... He's gone? For now. It's interesting. Most people crack at spiders and look, but you got all the way to the ocean. I, I don't expect this to mean much to you, but I'm actually impressed. A metal pole erupted from out of the center of her chest. She fell to her knees and coughed up copious amounts of blood. She looked down at the thing with a bewildered expression and fell over onto her side. The pole was thin like an arrow, covered in serrated hooks and... Once she hit the ground, I could see that it was actually a spear. The other end of it protruded from her back with a black cord connected to it, running all the way across the yard to the feet of Spencer Middleton. He dropped the harpoon gun and whistled to himself as he walked the distance to where the shapeshifter was still gagging, still twitching, and grabbing onto the pole that impaled her. As he came closer, she started changing. From one form to another, a giant bodybuilder, an Olympic-style wrestler, a morbidly obese man, a child, Jerry, O'Brien, me, Spencer, and then it started switching faster and faster, ten different people each second, all of them holding onto the spear and bleeding out into the snow. He went through a hundred of them before finally stopping and settling on that of a frail, old Asian woman. Tiny and wrinkled, more white hair than black. Huddled in a fetal position, his tears rolled down the side of her nose into the snow. Something told me that if the shapeshifter had a true form, I was looking at it. Struggle all you want, Spencer said to her. This spear is tungsten. You can't pull it out or break it. I own you. And in a minute, dead or alive, I'm going to sell you. He grabbed her around the neck and dragged her away. All I could do was watch them go. She connected eyes with me. Until Spencer had dragged her around the side of the gas station. And then... That was it. I was alone. I couldn't move anymore. Even breathing was... Beginning to become a near impossible task. I thought about how strange this was going to look. To Jerry, or O'Brien, or whoever was going to be unlucky enough to find me out here. Clutching my four-fingered hand under my armpit and staring into the forest. The blood in the snow was already being erased under a slow flurry of snowflakes, and after an hour or less, it would look like none of this had ever happened. People knew I had mental issues, so this wouldn't even be front page news. The only curiosity will be, I wonder what happened to his finger. Oh well. There are certainly worse ways to go, especially in a world with monsters like Sagoth and Spencer. I watched the snowflakes fall and focused all my effort on the labor of drawing in one last breath. And one more. And then one more after that. It might be pointless, but I'm going to get my last few seconds. And then the back door opened and somebody came over to my side, grabbed me by the shirt collar and started dragging me. He dragged me through the back hall and instantly I felt the blood rushing through my veins all over again. He took me all the way to the front of the store and dropped me onto my back before crouching down next to me and smiling. I told you I'd let you live if I caught what I wanted. And a deal's a deal. Right? I took a deep breath of warm air and tried to find the right words to tell Spencer just how much I hated him, but I couldn't. He didn't seem to need me to anyway. You know, Jack... Maybe things aren't meant to change. Maybe things are the way they are for a reason. I mean, it's been up and down for both of us. We've both lost so many friends here at the gas station. Kiefer, Carlos, Tom, that hunter asshole from this morning. But, at the end of the day, only two things are constant. You and me. You're like that shitty Batman to my awesome Joker. And don't worry about the shapeshifter. Just handed her over to my new boss. So, she won't be bothering you anymore. You stared out the doors at something, something I couldn't see. 
Smiled big. Smug. Self-satisfied. Yeah, you're right. Some things never change. How you never remember that I can pick your pockets. Hey, Spencer? I said as soon as my voice had come back to me. Yeah? He said. I'm right-handed. <laughs> I stuck the tip of the revolver into his stomach and pulled the trigger. The look on his face was that of... Oh, I cannot believe that shit just happened. He fell onto his ass and looked at the gun in my hand. And then the rapidly growing circle of blood on his shirt. You little piece of shit. O'Brien finally fuckingly woke up and ran out of the cooler into the front room yelling, What was that noise? Jack, are you okay? Spencer grabbed his stomach and bolted out the front door. I tried to yell to O'Brien to go after him, but I had lost the ability to talk again, and instead, I just closed my eyes and waited. But I got to ride in an ambulance, which is pretty cool. I also got to take Christmas Day off of work, which is about the closest thing to a Christmas miracle I can get, so I'll take it. The others all came and visited me at the hospital in shifts. No, I mean, somebody had to stay and watch the gas station. And I even got to eat like 10 packs of chocolate pudding. There's a nurse here that I suspect has a thing for me because she keeps sneaking me extra desserts. Once again, the official report is that nothing supernatural happened. Saul's disappearance, my beating, and the damage to the gas station and all the blood were blamed on Spencer. The others have absolutely no recollection of the night, and I'm left with no proof besides my notoriously shaky memory, which is why I decided to write it all down before I forgot anything. All in all, it wasn't the worst Christmas I've ever had. On Christmas Day, the nurse brought me a neatly gift-wrapped box. I asked who it was from, she just smiled and said somebody special had dropped it off for me. I unwrapped and opened it to find another, smaller box. I unwrapped that one and found another box. And inside that box, an another smaller box. And the last one was small enough to fit inside of the palm of my hand. Someone had gone through a lot of trouble for this. And I was starting to get a very uneasy feeling. Finally opened that last box. It confirmed my suspicion. Inside the last box were two things. A small paper note. And my severed finger. The note only had three words written on it. In a dried brown ink. Merry Christmas, Jack. I learned something pretty interesting today. Apparently, hanging upside down for too long can be fatal. Now, I'm not going to everything that led us to the moment of this discovery because most of it isn't that important, but believe me when I say it was weird and stupid and involved thousands of leeches. We were suspended by rusty chains wrapped tightly around our bottom halves some 10 or so feet off the ground in a mysterious underground building that had somehow gone unnoticed for decades in the forest next to the gas station where I work. It was cold and damp and our only light source were the trio of burning barrels organized in a triangle around us and I'm pretty sure this place wasn't ventilating any of that smoke. I was annoyed, at least I had my co-worker Jerry there hanging next to me volunteering as a distraction from the situation at hand. To pass the time, he showed off his impressive repertoire of show tunes and told awful dad jokes, despite my repeated requests for him to stop. Around the two or three hour mark, our captor came back to check and see how we were doing. Maybe he was there to taunt us, I don't really know. His motivations were unclear. At first, when I heard the metal door scrape open, I was relieved that we were finally getting this show on the road. I don't want to sound ungrateful, but there's only so many times I can hear Jerry ask if his joke had gone under my head. <sighs> he walked into the room slowly, one deliberate step after the other, and I'm sure he had theme music playing in his head and probably thought that he looked way cooler than he actually did. He was wearing cargo pants, a black leather jacket, and an apron spattered with blood. In one hand, he held a machete, in the other, an oversized hook. And on his face, he wore these stupidest mask I had ever seen, like some kind of nightmare Bugs Bunny with black fur, sharpened buck teeth, and a, a pointy, elongated ear that scraped the top of the door frame as he entered. 
He pointed the machete right at me and said something in an, uh, an intimidating yet muffled voice. What? I asked him. He repeated himself, now slightly more annoyed, but still equally as muffled. What's he saying? Asked Jerry. I have no idea, I answered. The man in the mask made a muffled scream and shook his weapons at us. Dude, just take the mask off, Jerry said, interrupting the muffle. Yeah, we know that's you, Bo. We're, we're not idiots. You smell like Axe body spray and you've been casing the gas station for like a week now. His name was Bo Kavia. From those of you who aren't from the Deep South, that's B-E-A-U-X-C-O-U-V-I-L-L-I-O-N. And he had been a huge jerk for as long as I had known him. We met back in elementary school and established on day one that we weren't going to be friends. He wasn't the first person that I would have expected to resort to kidnapping and torture, but I wasn't all that surprised by this development either. It would be generous of me to say that Bo was a product of his upbringing. Sure, he came from a stupid, angry family in a stupid, angry town, and one might be tempted to say that he never had much of a chance of breaking the cycle, but I feel like maybe that's letting Bo off the hook too easily. My memories of Bo growing up most revolve around attempts to avoid him in gym class, and out of gym class, and everywhere. In 10th grade, Bo had a brief stint of popularity after the school board refused his grant request for $5,000 to sponsor a high school clan club. The student organization intended to celebrate Anglo-Saxon heritage by driving four-wheelers around in the mud. He and his father, well, mostly his father, sued on the basis of racial discrimination and settled out of court for an undisclosed sum. After that, he started shopping for clothes exclusively at Hot Topic and wearing his ginger orange hair in spikes like a 90s punk rocker. Then he printed off a bunch of copies of the anarchist cookbook from the computer lab, started selling cigarettes in the school parking lot, spray painted a bunch of swastikas on the teacher's cars, and eventually made a name for himself as the edgy too cool for school kid. Shortly after that, he literally became the too dumb for school kid and got kicked out for bad grades and chronic truancy. They sued the school again, but I never heard how that case turned out. I didn't keep up with him, except for what I overheard at the gas station. He was still stupid and angsty, and he blamed everyone else for everything, from his multiple DUIs to his sudden and inexplicable weight gain. Bo was always pretty husky, but these days, he was about four feet tall, lying flat on his back, which was one more reason why it was so pointless for him to wear a mask. When we first noticed Bo hanging out in the gas station, I assumed that he was just planning on robbing us. See, he was never anything even remotely clever, but the level of suspicious that he was behaving was... Um, he was on the verge of comical, wearing a hat and a trench coat, parking his truck at the edge of the lot, squinting to see if he had any security cameras anywhere in the building, coming in twice a day and never buying anything. The last Friday, he tried to talk up the female cashier while they were alone, and I'm sure that he thought that he was being seductive. But, and that's the power of self-delusion for you. Rosa told me all about it after I came in to take over the safe. He asked if we had any hidden weapons in the store, because if I needed it, he was more than happy to stick around and offer me his um, protection. Well, I said, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? Uh, did he open with that? He started by being super creepy and asking me where I was from, um, how long I worked here, yada yada. Then he asked if I was alone. Why would he think that that was okay to ask? What, what'd you tell him? Oh, I lied. I said you, Jerry, and Mac were in the back, uh, rotating inventory. Wait, whoa, what? Who's Mac? He's a guy I made up to tell Bo. Mac is an ex-marine with impulse control problems. He's just trying to do right by his ex-wife ever since they let him out of the slammer where he did time for a crime he didn't commit. All he wants to do is be a part of his kids' lives, make some extra cash here at the gas station while he tries to take night classes to get his MBA. But an old acquaintance from his days in the service comes back into his life suddenly and unexpectedly, pulling Mac back down a dark rabbit hole that will change everything that he stands for. Will Mac make the right call? Find out on Mac the Knife. Anyway, I think we need to call Deputy O'Brien. Yeah, well, there's really not much that she can do until he actually breaks the law. You know, we can put a gun under the counter. Do you have any idea how ridiculous it is that we don't keep a stash of weapons here at the gas station? 
Um, I'll think about it. I did think about it. I really did. And I even came to the conclusion that Rosa was right. We should start arming ourselves, just in case. But then I got lazy and started reading a book. And then I forgot about it. And then last night I came in to take over for Jerry and start my overnight shift. But he wasn't there. Instead of Jerry, I found this fat dummy holding a machete and a gun. Wearing this silly rabbit mask. Forcing me into the back cab of his truck. And then he drove me out to the woods, down an old dirt road to a giant metal bunker door, and forced me inside. Down a concrete hallway, coated in dirt and graffiti, past rooms, half-filled with stagnant rainwater. Uh, uh, past giant metal silos, crumbling columns and metal beams, and finally into this huge empty room where he tied me up with chains and hoisted me to the ceiling. Next to Jerry. And that's how we got here. Between knock-knock jokes and Jerry's terrible a cappella rendition of Broadway hits, we wondered out loud what Bo's endgame was. The room he had us placed in contained a giant pentagram freshly painted on one wall with a ladder, a brush, and uh, an open can from Sherman Williams sitting next to it. After that, I surmised that all the blood on Bo's apron was actually just paint. The best theory we could come up with was that he had gone off the deep end and he was planning to sacrifice us to the devil. Turns out, our theory wasn't that far off. Bo finally took off his mask, revealing the look of annoyance on his chubby round face. You shit bricks don't even know what kind of hurt you're in for, do you? A moment passed, and I said, Oh wait, were you were you waiting for an answer? I'm I'm sorry, I thought I thought you were being like rhetorical. You think you're so smart, don't you? Well, you know what? You aren't. Come on, Bo, I said. Just let us down from here. We can pretend this whole thing never happened. No, we won't, interjected Jerry. As soon as you let us go, I swear, I'm heading to the sheriff's station to hand your ass in, and there's nothing you can do to stop me or change my mind. I cut my eyes at him and muttered a quiet, Hold up. Something must have clicked in his head because Jerry started to backtrack. Oh, oh, yeah, you're right. Never mind, Bo. I forgive you. Now, let us go. Or else. Bo let out a forceful laugh that didn't sound even remotely convincing and then said, <laughs> You're staying here for the rest of eternity. This is where you'll die. Did you know that the Chinese use death from hanging upside down as their most fierce form of torture? Again, I thought myself waiting for him to continue, only to realize he was asking us a question. Oh, uh, no, 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 I, I didn't know that. But let me explain to you the different stages of pain you'll go through before death. First, you'll feel your lungs slowly being crushed under the weight of a, your other organs until the very act of breathing becomes nearly impossible. Then, your heart will overload from the extra work of pumping blood all the way to your toes and back. And then, the vessels in your eyes will rupture. You'll go permanently blind as you struggle for each breath. And then, after you're finally dead, I will bleed you dry and leave your bodies down here to rot. I mean, I'm not a doctor. But none of that sounded right. However, I wasn't about to tell Bo that he needed to, you know up his torture game. Hey! Bo yelled, pointing his machete at the guy hanging to the other side of Jerry. What's going on with that one? By that one, um, he was referring to Mel. The new part-timer that Jerry had trained when Bo had come in earlier to kidnap him. It was his first day, and the poor guy was already in a secret underground torture chamber. Jerry answered, Yeah, he passed out right off the bat. Uh, yeah, we tried to wake him up, but he's lights out hard. Hey, Mel! Mel, wake up! You're missing the villain monologue. Jerry swung an arm at Mel, but we were all suspended just out of reach of one another. Is that guy dead already? I studied Mel for a moment. I couldn't see any breathing or other signs of life. Yeah, I said sadly. I think he is. Wow! Bo said with a strange smile. I did it! I took my first life! Now I know how it feels. This power is amazing. It's something you pathetic sheep are never going to feel. You'll never know the power of snuffing out another person's very existence. Jerry chuckled and said, <laughs> Okay, dude. Oh, this is it. I have everything I need. Do you idiots want to guess what's about to happen next? No. 
We both answered at the same time. Now I have what I need to summon forth the beast, Kergon. He is an eternal being from another world, stronger than you could have ever fathomed. I've given him everything he needs to enter our realm, everything except for the final ingredient, the blood of a man in tortured anguish. Bo went to the corner where the chains were all connected to an old crank device. He turned the wheel until Mel's body was lowered all the way to the floor. Then he unhooked Mel's chains, listened for a heartbeat. Really, I guess he should have done those, those two in opposite order. Then he dragged Mel across the floor to the spot in front of the pentagram. Hey, dude. Jerry whispered to me. Can we get out of this? I think we should seriously reconsider buying a shotgun or something for the store. Bo got down on his knees and fished a large pocket knife out of his cargo pants, flicked it open, and kissed it. You losers are about to see something that you're not even worthy to behold. The gates of hell will open, and you will literally be in the presence of the Dark Lord, Kerrigan. Tell me, have either of you seen an actual god before? Yeah, we both said in unison. I look over to Jerry. Wait, really? Where did you see a god? Oh, it was back when you were in the hospital for a few days, getting your, like, leg thing taken care of. There was this bat god named, uh, Labu or something. He was trapped in a small universe thing in a bottle of, of strega liquor. Of course, I was on a lot of mushrooms at the time, so I might have imagined it. What about you? I answered, remember that time we were all escaping the zombie nudists in that underground cavern and we got separated by those giant hands that burst out of the walls? Yeah, I got I got sucked into that throne room of a dark tree god. Turned out to be a really cool guy, though. Um, of course, I was on a lot of painkillers at the time, so I might have... So I, I might have imagined that. Our lives are weird. They responded. Hey! Bo yelled. I'm being serious here. This is real, and you're about to see for yourselves. Watch. With two hands around the hilt, he plunged the knife into Mel's chest. Mel's eyes shot open and he screamed and bolted to his feet. It worked! Jerry yelled. Mel is a zombie! Mel screamed again and looked at the weapon sticking out of his chest. Mel! Go get help! I yelled. Bo struggled to get his fat ass to his feet, but Mel turned around, punched him in the face, and darted out the door down the hallway. Get back here! Bo screamed as he threw his hook after the escaping victim. It clanged against the wall several feet from the door and fell to the ground, and Bo huffed and ran out after him. A few minutes later, Bo came back into the room with his head hung low, his eyes red and watery, and snotty blood flowing messily from his nostrils. It looked like that punch might have left Bo with a broken nose, and as pathetic as he looked, he couldn't possibly feel sorry for him. <laughs> All your fucks, he growled at us. Yeah, how do you figure? Asked Jerry. You lied to me. You tricked me into believing Mel was actually dead. Jerry snapped his fingers and said, Bitch, get off this persecution complex. You're the one that brought us down here to torture us to death. You don't get to cry over how we weren't nice to you. Now I'm gonna kill you! Bo hollered. Yeah? So you say, Jerry taunted. Bo wiped his bloody nose off on his sleeve and flung it onto the ground and screamed again. You have no idea how powerful I'm gonna be. You're gonna learn your place. You're all gonna respect me. And when I'm done, I... He stopped mid-sentence. And his face went pale. And then he turned and looked at his bloody spatter on the floor. Then at the pentagram on the wall. <laughs> what? He stammered to nobody in particular. Jerry gave me a look that said, This dude is four equal sides short of a square. Oh, yes, of course. He was speaking to the wall. So, like, uh... You wanna let us down now, or what? I asked. Bo looked at me with a giant ugly smile and asked, Do you guys hear that too? Hear what? He responded. That voice! He's right there! Bo pointed at the pentagram. He can hear me, and he's telling me that I've done well. The blood was good, my blood, he just needs more. Of course, all he needs to come forth is to, to make for me to make the ultimate sacrifice. Bo picked up his machete with his right hand and held it to his left wrist, then closed his eyes and took a deep breath 
This is it. This is why he chose me to summon Kerrigan. Because he knew when the time came, I would have the strength to do what's necessary. Uh, wait. Oh, hold on. Who chose you for what? I said, I'm lost. Yeah, Jerry said. Me too. I, w I wasn't really paying attention. Was Mel a zombie or what? Bo opened his eyes, forced another fake laugh, and said, <laughs> There's a man in town. I never got his name, but I, I didn't have to. He found me. He offered me a job. He gave me purpose. And now I'm part of something greater than myself. All he asks is I summon Terragon into this world. It's all part of a great plan, and soon, soon it'll be finished. He closed his eyes. He lifted the machete, then slowly put it back against his skin. Then we waited. For like 30 seconds. Eventually, Jerry crept into the silence in his best Emperor Palpatine voice. Yes, that's it. Do it. Let the darkness be your strength. Let the anger guide you. Let the hate flow through you. Dude, I said, quit it. You're, you're going to mess him up. Bo threw the weapon to the ground and screamed at us again. You bitches have no idea what it's like. How hard I have to struggle. I've gone my entire life putting up with... with Shit stains like you two, trying to keep me down, and I'm sick, and I'm tired of it. Soon, Terragon will come, and all the people that make life worse, all you people, will get exactly what you deserve. I had actually forgotten that he still had a gun until this moment, until he pulled it out of his waistband and his, his cargo pants and said, This is what real strength looks like! I put it into his mouth. I closed my eyes and said, you, 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 gross, 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 gross. After a few seconds, he still hadn't pulled the trigger. And I opened my eyes to see that he was frozen there with the gun still in his mouth. Uh, hey, man, I have an idea, Jerry said. You're, you're clearly having trouble riding that, uh, that struggle bus over there. Why don't you let me down from here, give me the gun, and I'll kill you. Yeah? What? Sound good? You want to die. I want to kill you. It's a win-win. Bo pulled the gun out of his mouth and spat on the ground. You don't have what it takes to kill anybody. Oh, no, really. I've totally got a hard-on for homicide. Just ask Jack. It's true, I said. Before he worked at the gas station, Jerry was the only surviving member of a murder cult. Bo walked angrily over the crank wheel and started luring Jerry to the ground. Oh, shit. Is this actually working? Bo took the chains off Jerry, tossed the gun next to him, and then held the machete like a baseball bat right underneath me and said, Okay, asshole, here's the deal. You can't back out now. If you don't spill my blood and open the portal, I'm going to kill your friend and- <coughs> Jerry didn't hesitate for one second to shoot. Bo screamed and flopped under the ground, hugging the foot with a fresh bullet hole. <clears throat> then Jerry fished his pack of smokes out of his pocket, lit one up, and took a puff. Hey, uh... Dude, I said, you want to let me down from here now? But before we could answer, the fire from the burning barrels started flaring up, roaring, and growling. And before we knew what was happening, they had formed giant cyclones of burning red and blue blazing swirls that climbed up to the ceiling. As the heat from the fire swept over me, I saw a chrysalic sparkling light in the center of the pentagram, growing from the size of a pinprick to an enormous swirling vortex of pure shimmering lights. Well, check that out, Jerry said. Bo started frantically laughing, and I think that he was just about to give us a smug, I told you so. But before he could, an enormous skeletal hand reached out from the void and grabbed him around the waist. I can't exactly describe um, what this hand looked like. It was... That's because I don't think the, the entity it belonged to was part of our world, or, or understands... A physicist. He was, at the same time, the size of a normal human arm and the size of of Manhattan Island. It was a color that had never existed. It had five fingers, and each fingertip split into five more fingers, which each broke into five fingers, which broke into five more fingers ad infinitum. I could somehow hear the creature's arm moving with my eyes, and the smell of its flesh was very similar to gumdrops. Uh, Jerry later insisted it smelled more like spiced rum. Bo let out a gasp as the infinite fingers squeezed around him, and then the arm dragged him slowly through the swirling void. Holy shit! 
Jerry yelled, that asshole had my wallet! Jerry! I yelled to get his attention. Then he looked up at me. I pointed at the spot on the ground where the dumbass Bo's foot blood had started the pool. You have to figure a way to close the portal! Jerry put his lit cigarette between his lips, unzipped his fly, and started pissing into the puddle of blood. And amazingly, it worked! A noise like a crack of thunder filled the room and the portal disappeared, along with all of the light as the fires from the burning barrels immediately extinguished themselves. In the darkness, all I could hear was the sound of Jerry pissing on the floor. After a while, he finished up and said, Wow. That's a relief, man. I gotta tell you, I've been holding it ever since he kidnapped us. Do you let me down now or what? Oh, yeah, sorry, I'm on it. it took about ten minutes for him to find the wheel in the dark and lower me to the ground. And by the time we got the chains off, you'd hear sirens going louder in the distance. Deputy O'Brien took our statements, then threw them away and told us to try again. Our second version of the events left out the part where an evil being reached into our world to grab Bo and drag him into a hell dimension. She informed us that the building was some kind of satellite power plant for, I don't know, since the 50s? And the place was shut down and demolished, but they forgot about the basement level. And after a few years, nature reclaimed it. From the look of things, Bo had been trying to live out there by himself. Officially, he was a lone gunman. A single maniac. With him gone, we had nothing to worry about. Unofficially. We're all a little on edge about who hired him to summon a demon. Maybe we'll find out. Maybe we won't. Either way, we need to hire somebody to replace Mel because something tells me that he isn't coming back to work. But in other news, I just learned that the carnival is coming to town soon, so that's pretty exciting. Until next time, this is Jack from the gas station. My parents will be gone for most of tonight and Christmas morning tomorrow for some stupid work thing that they both have. We usually have Christmas at 6. But we have to wait for Mommy and Daddy to get home first. Mom told Brad, my oldest brother, that we would have a babysitter because she didn't trust him to watch all five of us by himself. Mom often let Brad watch us, but we had broke a lot of things the last couple times we were left alone, so Mommy said that she would get Rebecca to watch us. Rebecca came to the house at five. She was very pretty, and Brad couldn't stop staring at her. Mommy and Daddy left a couple minutes after Rebecca got here. This was the first time Rebecca had watched six kids at the same time before, and I don't think she knew what she was getting herself into. My youngest sister, Molly, who's three, threw a tantrum after our parents left. Levi and Garrett, my younger twin brothers, who are both five, started fighting. Brad talked with Rebecca most of the night, and... Rachel spent most of the night in her room. Mom and Dad said we would get Christmas gifts tomorrow, but we had to wait to open them until they got home. We made hot cocoa, but the cocoa maker is broke, so the hot chocolate burned our mouths. And we got candy canes, too. Rebecca started to put us to bed at 8, and finally succeeded at 9.30. Even though she was clearly exhausted and frustrated with us, she told us she had fun and that she wouldn't have had Christmas Eve any other way. I awoke in the middle of the night at around 11 to see a crimson moon casting a dim red glow on the winter snow. I looked out my bedroom window and saw a real object coming towards us. I looked out my window and saw a red object coming towards our house, fast. It was hard to make out, but it looked like a red sleigh being pulled by reindeer. I instantly recognized it as Santa's sleigh, and ran to hide on the stairs and wait for him to come down the chimney anxiously. Out of the window to the right of the fireplace, I saw the sleigh fly overhead and heard many hooves trotting on the roof. I made sure to remain perfectly still and silent as a mouse, 
I made sure to remain perfectly still and silent as a mouse. I waited for what felt like an eternity while soft footsteps echoed on the roof above me, getting closer to the chimney. I heard scuffling as ash and dust started falling from the fireplace. Soon, two black boots landed, then the rest of jolly old St. Nick came out through the fireplace with a bag of toys on his back. Without speaking a word, he went straight to our tree. He took gifts from his bag and scattered them under our lit-up plastic evergreen, then started on the milk and cookies we left him. I felt that I held my breath the entire time I was hiding on the stairs. I couldn't believe I was spying on the real Santa Claus in my own home. Eventually, he made his way over to our stockings and started putting various knickknacks and candies in our stockings, starting with Molly. When he got to Levi, he took out a small black rock and eyed it sadly before placing it in Levi's stocking. It took me a second to realize that he gave Levi coal. I tried to stifle a laugh to the best of my ability, but a small squeak escaped my lips anyway. Santa turned around and scanned the room. I remained as still as ever. He turned back to the stockings, this time keeping his back to me, and put a piece of coal in Garrett's stocking too. He put a candy cane in Brad's stocking, along with a pocket knife. Rachel got a new phone and some Kit Kats. Finally, he moved to my stocking, which is always furthest to the right, even though I'm the middle child. He began rummaging through his sack as I leaned forward excitedly to see what presents I got. Santa pulled out a large, jet black piece of coal and stuffed it into my stocking. I felt a wave of anger, sadness, and regret all at once. I almost stood up right then to tell off the jolly old elf, but when he turned around, I saw tears in his eyes. He looked as if he was filled with similar emotions as I was, like he didn't like to have to give bad kids coal. It was for this reason that I remained quiet. As Santa climbed back up my chimney, got into his sleigh, and flew away. I watched out my downstairs window as the sleigh flew from the roof and into the black abyss of Christmas night. I sat there still in place for a very long time, pondering how I could be a better child next year when I spotted something out the window again. It looked like the same figure I'd seen before, but this time, the sleigh looked as if it was black. I wrote this off as it was really dark outside except for the moon's red glow. I wondered why Santa would come back. Maybe he forgot something. Maybe he had made a mistake. Maybe I wasn't naughty, and he was on his way back right now to fix his mistake. My mind was racing from one thought to another as I began to hype myself up for all my possible Christmas presents. I'd stopped watching the window and had begun to daydream about the next morning. Until hooves on the roof interrupted my thoughts. I heard loud, heavy clacking, this time as he got closer to the chimney. Ash began to fall down the chimney, creating an ashy cloud around the fireplace as what I assumed to be Santa began coming down and landed with a loud crash. My final thought before seeing what came next. How has no one noticed all of this? Through the cloud of thick, black ash protruded two large horns with stripes of red and white like those of a candy cane. As the dust settled, the rest of the figure was revealed. His skin was pale, icy looking blue. His beard was like Santa's except it was black and came to a point. His nose was long and his face looked grizzled but more human than I thought. His horns looked like they'd touch the ceiling if he jumped. His body looked human in shape, but animal in appearance. His legs were twisted and ended in hooves like that of a bull. He had a long tail. His torso was contorted and his torso was contorted and everything but his face and palms were covered in fur. He had broken chains around his wrists, and what looked like a heavy red Christmas ornament attached to his tail by another chain. His ears were pointed, and so were his yellow teeth. Despite his horrid, outlandish appearance, the most noticeable thing about the creature were its bells that it wore, and the basket on its back that had the limp arm of a child hanging from it. The stories were true, and so is Krampus.
I couldn't believe my eyes. I had seen sleighs go by, magic reindeer fly overhead, and had even seen Santa Claus himself, but none of that could have prepared me for the beast that is Krampus. He moved around the room with such speed that I was caught off guard. This thing looked about eight feet tall with its horns, and with them he towered over everything in our large home. He made his way to the fireplace and took the coal from Levi's stocking. He rolled it around in his long bony fingers for a moment. Then he took the coal from Garrett's stocking. Then finally... Then he took the coal from Garrett's stocking. Then finally... Mine. He studied the coal for a moment. A wide smile full of pointy yellow teeth beamed across his face. Naughty little children, I heard it say in a cold, raspy voice. A shiver ran up my spine as it spoke. I was paralyzed in both fear and awe at the creature that roamed my living room beneath me. I thought he was moving towards the tree, but it walked past it and started going down the hallway into... into Levi and Garrett's room. I remember the things my father used to say about it, that he whips bad kids, takes them away, sometimes he eats them, sometimes he shakes them and scares them into being good. All these horrid things and more danced through my head as the monster crept into the twins' room. I tried to scream with all my might, but no sound would escape my mouth. As I finally was able to choke out, Levi! Garrett! Screams had already filled their room. Levi came out of his room, screaming his head off as Garrett followed suit. The creature's long, twisted arm reached out from the room and grabbed Garrett's leg, pulling him back into the room. I stood up from my spot on the stairs and motioned for Levi to come to me. Garrett's screams fell silent. The Krampus emerged from the room alone. His nose seemed shorter now, his face even more deformed. I gripped Levi's hand tightly and we ran for Brad's room. I wailed on his door again and again, but he wouldn't come out. I would have tried harder to get his attention, but I could hear it come up the stairs as each hoof hit each step. I took Levi to the laundry room and told him to hide in the laundry chute. Once he was inside, I began lowering the laundry hamper so that he could get downstairs without confronting the monster. Before he was lowered out of sight, I told Levi to start the hot chocolate maker because I had a plan. He nodded. And once he got to the bottom, I felt the hamper get lighter as he climbed out. I heard the hoof's footsteps getting louder and closer to the laundry room. I began pulling the laundry hamper up and climbed in just as the door was violently flung open, despite the locks on it. The beast licked his lips with his long, skinny tongue as he slowly approached my trembling body inside the hamper. I began to bounce myself and rock the hamper as Krampus got closer. The hamper wouldn't fall no matter how hard I rocked it and the creature was nearly upon me. I felt its breath on me as it excitedly panted getting further. I expected its breath to be hot like that of a dog, but instead it felt like the coldest winter chill caressing my skin. I shook the whole hamper as savagely as I could before it finally budged. The hamper fell, and before I knew it... I was on the first floor. I crawled out of the chute and ran to the kitchen as the demon rampaged upstairs. As I came into the kitchen, I noticed no signs of my little brother. But I did see that the hot cocoa maker was on. The stomping of the creature upstairs continued, but didn't seem to be near the stairs, so I focused on finding Levi. He wasn't hiding in any cabinets, and he wasn't anywhere in the living room. So I decided he might be in his room, so I quietly crept to it slowly. But steadily. Twins' room was trashed entirely, and Levi wasn't there. There was blood on the wall. I shuddered to think that it once belonged to my baby brother. A small bloody handprint was smeared on the wall by the door. Dread was all that I could feel in that moment. Dread for misbehaving all the year. Dread for what had become of my little brother, and dread for the silence that fell in place of the hooves stomping around upstairs. I quickly and silently made my way back to the kitchen and took out a large coffee pitcher of scalding hot hot cocoa. And I crept, as I crept out of the kitchen into the living room, I had an ominous feeling of dread, as if I was being watched. I could barely see in the dark of night, and I couldn't locate our light switches. The only source of light I had was the dim, eerie glow of the lights from a Christmas tree. As I scanned all the entrances to the dining room, something moving caught my eye. 
the chandelier had begun to swing, as if something had bumped it, or hit it. There was a soft thudding as I looked around to make out another vague shape in the glow. I saw what bumped the chandelier. The monster was crawling on my ceiling like a large, twisted spider. His arms were bent in excruciating-looking ways to grip the ceiling and watch me with his eyes that burned like fire. I wanted to scream at the top of my lungs at the very sight of it, but instead I held my ground. A cruel smile spread across the face of the predator who was stalking me. He undug his fingers from the ceiling and landed on the floor in front of me with a thunderous crash. Mere inches from me. This was his mistake. I threw the entire pitcher of burning hot cocoa on his face, and the beast immediately started writhing in agony. He covered his hands over his quickly blistering face. He took his hands off, just as it began to melt and peel, the bits of flesh and blood melting away to reveal his horrible skull with its eyes still in its sockets. It froze for a while, and for a brief moment I was happily assured and content that the Krampus was dead. But then, it only started cackling an awful and disturbingly malevolent laugh. It pierced my ears like knives and loomed over me to instill as much fear as it could. It was working. Before my very eyes, the muscles around the creature's skull started to grow back, and in seconds, its new face had formed. It looked more like a goat with pointed teeth than a human, but you can still partially see it in there. Its beard was still as long as before, but now it looked almost out of place on the demonic beast's head. I turned and ran behind the Christmas tree, avoiding the abomination's lanky arms as I ran by. The Krampus immediately started coming towards the tree, intent on harming me. I pushed the large plastic evergreen onto the monster and ran back upstairs to find my little brother. I wailed on my other siblings' doors, but nobody would wake up, no matter how hard I pounded. Everyone locks their doors to their room when we go to sleep. Everyone locks the doors to their rooms when we go to sleep, so we're not bothered. But the doors are also heavy, and not much sound gets through them. I began to shout for Levi as loud as I could, in hopes that he would respond. Then Levi appeared at the top of the stairs. We stared at each other. He looked terrified and sad. I started to walk toward him. And suddenly my baby brother was impaled by Krampus's horns. His body was thrust up and thrashed around by the savage creature as he convulsed and shook spasmically on his horns. I've seen people die on TV before, but... Watching it in real life is entirely different. No one should have to go through it. My brother didn't deserve that. No one deserved that. Santa and Christmas are about love and cheer. Krampus made Christmas about hatred and retribution. I watched helplessly while the thing ripped my brother's shaking body from its horns and dropped his lifeless body into the basket on his back. The demon began to strut towards me with malicious intent, so I ducked into my mom and dad's empty room and opened the top drawer in my dad's dresser. I wasn't tall enough to see what I was reaching for, but when I felt it, I pulled out my dad's pistol. I opened the other dresser and had put two bullets in the pistol by the time the creature burst in the door. I shot it twice and hit it both times, but it was unfazed. The loud noises clearly hurt both our ears, and as the monster clawed at its ears while screaming in pain, I began to quickly crawl towards the window until something long, thin, tight, and slimy gripped my right leg and began pulling me back. I looked behind me in terror as the Krampus was using its incredibly long tongue to pull me to its mouth full of sharp, jagged teeth. I began to breathe in and out quicker and quicker and began panicking as my foot got closer to its mouth. I lifted my left leg and kicked it in the face twice before its tongue finally loosened. Before I could breathe, Krampus picked me up and began shaking me wildly. I kicked him a second time, this time with my right foot, and he flung me into the nearby hallway where I began limping away. I had reached the end of the hall when I heard a loud popping crack sound. Moments before feeling a sharp sting across my back, I looked back to see that the holiday devil had whipped me with a long whip like a lion tamer would use. I felt warm ooze on my back and a new pain started to set in. I started to limp away to safety when I picked up I started to limp away to safety when I was picked up by Krampus again. His long cold fingers wrapped around my back and stung my cut even worse. He looked at me right in the eyes before lifting me behind him and dropping me into the birch basket on his back. On the outside the basket, it looked like it could only fit a couple kids inside, but the inside, the inside was massive. 
I fell into a mountain of bodies. There were hundreds or thousands of kids in that one basket piled on each other, not all alive. Where you couldn't see other kids which made up the trembling ground, you saw only darkness. No sounds could be heard from inside or outside, really, either. Kids would scream, mutter, shout, until their throats clearly hurt, but no sound came from their mouths. Every time I thought the situation couldn't get any worse, it got way worse. I waited for what felt like millennia to escape, as new kids would fall in and join the confusion and show how much time had passed. Eventually the Krampus reached into the basket and began to pull out another child. His arm became longer as he reached into the basket and stretched out to a panicked girl. I grabbed onto her leg and let myself be carried to salvation. When we were pulled from the basket, I let go of the kid and fell behind Krampus. He didn't notice. I escaped. He was focused on the girl. He looked at the small girl for a second, before biting into her flesh with his large, sharp teeth. I never knew the kid's name before the creature devoured her. But I owed my life to her for helping me escape. I backed away slowly from behind as Krampus feasted on my fellow child at the dinner table. I had no idea where I was now, but it was dark, and it was cold. I think it's where the creature lives. After the monster was finished eating, he picked up a small wooden box, opened the top, and spat something that glowed a bright green into it. He then took the box over to a rusted door, and he opened, entered, and left a few minutes later without the box. He then left the room leaving the child's remains on a large platter and a rusted door to my curiosity. I opened the door to see dozens I opened the door to see dozens of more wooden boxes. I also saw many creepy looking porcelain dolls and other creepy toys. The door behind me closed and I was emerged in total black. I got up my phone and used it to barely light my way. I walked past a jack-in-the-box with a scary face. I looked past a baby doll that looked withered and old. I found a sack doll that looked like a skeleton. I thought it looked like Santa's rejected toy shop until I found the words Misfits smeared in red paint next to the clown with a skull for a head. Blue eyes on its sockets and big fleshy hands. I was terrified that someone was caught in that room before. When I got closer to the clown, it jumped towards me and yelled, Wanna play? I jumped back as the clown let out a creepy laugh. I heard scurrying and tiny footsteps from the other toys from around the room. I started catching the dolls and gingerbread men, turning their heads as I ran along the walls trying to relocate the door. I found another message on the wall. Why can't we die? was scratched in by something. I wanted nothing more than for this night to end. When I located the door, I bolted for it as soon as I saw it, but was tripped by a toy soldier with realistic burns on his face. I kicked the tiny hunk of plastic away and moved closer to the door when a deformed baby doll appeared from the darkness and sank her teeth into my leg. I felt a surge of pain and fell to the ground. I furiously punched the doll's head until it unlocked its teeth from my flesh. The porcelain atrocity scurried off as the terrible toys danced around me in darkness. More and more of them kept popping up and coming out of... out of... the boxes. Like the one Krampus spat the glowing thing into. The toys began muttering words, but I couldn't make out what they were saying. The muttering got louder and louder until I understood some of them. Feel our pain. He killed us, but not entirely. He gobbled me up spat my soul into a puppet. Kill us. Let us die. The things they said were terrible. Dreadful to say the least. I got up. Started to make my way to the door as the dolls chanted more obscene things to me. We're going to eat you alive. Like he ate all of us. I'm going to rip out your eyes. Although they continued to chant, none of them came towards me again as I moved around the dark room. 
I saw a small toy skeleton in Santa clothes, with a beard. A puppet with many nails sticking out of its head was strung up to the ceiling, moving and wrestling with its strings. I spotted a stool that was... I spotted a stool that was... I reasoned that this was Krampus's demented toy shop and decided to leave before it was too late. I walked past the workbench and started pulling on the rusted metal handle. The door was extremely heavy but slowly budged and started opening as I pulled it back with all of my might. Light began to bathe the room and the misfit toys dashed to the shadows to avoid the light. I ran from the dark room, closed the doors behind me, and leaned on it for a while to catch my bearings. I looked around at the only other room in this place that was familiar to me. I went by the long table the monster ate the nameless girl at, trying not to think about it, trying to think of something, anything, to distract myself from the horrors that I had bared witness to in the most unsuspecting and happiest times of the year. I walked to an open door and poked only half of my head out to scan the perimeter of the room. It led to a large room that had various whips, saws, and other torture devices. I crept in and kept to the wall. I spotted three dark wooden doors amongst the darkness and concrete walls. I also found a window, a sm and the snow outside was falling so slowly, so peacefully. Two doors were on one wall opposite of the window, and the other was on the wall to the right of the window. The walls were lined with racks, and racks were lined with hellish masks. Some held horns, some had long serpent tongues sticking out, some had teeth, some had patches of skin, some had antlers. One was a wired skull with candles on it. It was so strange. The room was so large. The other door led to the same room. And the other doors led to the same room. I left without moving the door in fear that closing the heavy wooden door would create noise that would lead the creature directly to me. I walked along the side of the wall to avoid the equipment, straight to the door that I had left. I opened it slowly with caution. The first thing I noticed was a strange tree that looked like an upside-down purple Christmas tree. The trunk was on the bottom, but the pines and branches looked upside down. The tree was decorated with red and green lights and small bones. There was another window in this room, but it was on the same side as the last. There was an open doorway that led to a hall that branched off and two signs labeled directions. That branched off and two signs labeled the directions. Surveillance room. And stables. I went to the stables thinking I might be able to find a reindeer fly out of this place. It seems like a silly plan now in hindsight. I opened the stable doors and awful smells invaded my nostrils immediately. There was frost on the floor. And there were eight stables lined up along the wall to the right. Each with demonic reindeer heads sticking out. Below each head was the door to each stall each with a pendant of names on them. I read the names out loud as I started down the row. Each deer was grotesque in its own right. One or two had exposed skulls. Each had jagged teeth. Some had manes and others had dried blood on their fur. Seven of their eyes glowed red. Slasher, I said as I passed the first one. Wrathful. Gorgon. Putrid. Cyclops, Rabies, Goner. The last monstrous reindeer looked like a hellish Rudolph. His head held flames that danced from its gnarled snout to the back of its mane. Between its sharp and bloody antlers furiously flickered bolts of electricity. Blitzkrieg. I decided writing one of these was out of the question, and began searching for an exit. I realized the only door to the room was the one I came from. I looked all over the room looking for some way out and saw the reason for the cold. The top crease and upper part of one wall was missing and led outside. It was far too high to reach. I left the stable room and went into the surveillance room. The handle felt icy cold as I slowly opened the door. This room, like all the rest, was large. One wall was covered with monitors, 
The bottom middle the bottom middle monitor stuck out more than the rest and had a keyboard below it. A chair was also pulled up to it. Each screen had various kids on it. Some in dreadful conditions. Others minding their own business. No sound came from the monitors, but I started to notice I was hearing a ticking noise. A clock above the door I came in read, 5.45, Christmas Day. The wall opposite the monitors had many names scribbled into it. I wondered if the dead girl's name was scratched into the wall. A door that read Exit was to the right of the monitors, but the computer said, Search Name. I sat at the large chair and typed in Garrett Rockford, a nutcracker that had two bodies attached from the sides of its head popped up. Each body seemed to be trying to yank away from the other. Its face looked like it was in pain, and it had the same color of eyes as... Levi. And Garrett. I looked up. Levi Rockford. And the same thing popped up. I sat frozen in awe for a moment. Tears filled my eyes and ran down my cheeks. The ticking of the clock seemed to turn into clops as I sobbed. I was crying more than I ever cried before. I cried so hard I began hearing a ringing. And the chair I was in was spun around. And I was face to face with him. Krampus. He looked menacing and insidiously sinister. His horns were partially covered in blood. His long fingers looked sharp and his eyes burned like never before. He waved his long, sharp, bony finger at me and tisked. Naughty, naughty. He said cruelly and mockingly. He licked my face with his incredibly long tongue and then began wrapping it around my throat. He started constricting his tongue and choking me. I was gurgling and coughing and struggling did nothing. I started feeling weaker and weaker as my head heated up and my lungs screamed for air. My vision even started to become blurred. But I knew if I didn't do something quickly, I was going to die. I punched blindly with all of my might and knocked him back for only a few moments as his tongue recoiled into his mouth. I utilized my time and ran towards the exit. I felt the ground shake directly behind me as heavy hooves shook the floor violently in its wake. I felt the creature's cold breath on the back of my neck. I pushed the door open and ran into the freezing cold as my pursuer followed suit. I ran until I was knee-deep in snow, until a lanky hand grabbed me and started dragging me back. The dark sky slowly lit as the sun started to emerge from the bottom horizon. The Krampus stopped dragging me. He dropped me and stared briefly at the rising sun. I'll come get you. Again. He said, as he dropped my leg and retreated to his lair as I lay in the snow. A silhouetted figure came from the distance. I closed my eyes for what felt like seconds, but when I opened my eyes, the sun was higher in the sky, and the figure was closer. I could make out that he was wearing red. And I passed out again. child, he said in a soft, soothing voice. Let's take you home. The next thing I remember, I was waking up in my bed at home. Levi and Garrett were kidnapped in the middle of the night. I found this out from Rebecca, Brad, and Molly, who had already told our parents and the cops. I tried to tell them what really happened, but no one believed me. They only got mad when I tried to explain it to them. So I gave up on trying to tell them. So I gave up on trying to tell them. That's how I spent my Christmas.
It all began in November. It was a benevolent November. The ambient air was kind enough to stay lukewarm, so the wind did not blow so hard as to rip through the coats and scarves and hats. And what breezes there were seemed to be in the, the medium. Not as warm and comforting as the ones in the summer months past, but not as cold and harsh as the winter months yet to come. Snow had not yet fallen, which most considered a blessing. Except for those whose business depended on the snow, the ones that fell in flurries most years around this time. I was sleeping soundly at about five in the morning. And I was dreaming that my girlfriend Kelly was still alive. She had died about three years back, in an accident that occurred due to a drunkard driving down the highway. I blame myself. We had a big fight before she stormed out. I was the only reason she was on the road at that time. In my mind, I had killed her. I dreamed that she was on the couch with me. We were watching our favorite movie while cuddling. A bowl of popcorn was on my lap and she was eating handful after handful. She was beautiful, with sparkling emerald eyes and dark chocolate hair flowing down to her shoulders. She smelled like vanilla, and for a moment, it was as if she was actually there and everything was fine. She turned to me. I felt so full of guilt and grief. I'm so sorry, I told her. She just smiled. I woke up at the start. I, I thought I heard whispering. I stood up, putting on slippers and a robe. Looking out the window, I saw nothing but black. When I showed my phone through it, I saw what appeared to be a plane of white outside. Though I attributed this to the glare. Joshua. Slowly I turned and faced the darkness. There was nothing there, just empty. Darkness. Turning my light on the room, illuminating the dark, I saw no trace of anything. Shrugging, I turned to face my bed. I shuffled through the inky blackness, trying not to trip on anything. I placed the phone back on its charger, eager to return to sleep. I stepped towards the bed. Joshua. I turned around. This time, I was sure that I had heard my name being whispered by... something. However, I still saw nothing. But the room felt cold, like some of the bitter outside air had leaked in. I did not pause to consider why the outside air would be bitter, for as I said, it was a very nice November. I decided there must be an open door or window in the house somewhere. Knowing I couldn't sleep with this much cold in the house, I stumbled towards the door. Funny. It seemed to lock itself when I approached. I tried it, and no matter how much force I exerted, it wouldn't budge. With one final shove, I managed to push the door off the hinges. It fell forward, landing with a large thud. Carefully, I stepped over the door as I made my way down the hall. Silently, though I don't know why, I searched for the open door or window from which the breeze, it had to be a breeze, was coming. I made my way, still silent, as if I dared not make a sound. And though the rational part of my brain said I was alone, still, I felt the shiver down your spine that comes with being watched. Through the living room, the TV was on, even though I distinctly remember turning it off after finishing a movie that I had started before work. No regular show played, however, but dark and unnatural images flashed across the screen. I stared, dumbfounded and horrified, whilst images of murder and rape flickered on the screen. Hellish music played, subtle at first, but growing louder as I continued to watch. When I thought the music would become unbearable to hear, the images stopped, and the quiet once again swallowed the room. Still, I stared, my mind refusing to process what I saw. What I stared at, brain reeling from the shock of the past few minutes, was something horrible, something that preyed on my fears and guilt, something I refused to believe I saw. I saw a message. Looking at the crimson font and remembering the images that still burned on my brain, I could believe with all of my heart and soul that it was written in blood. I began muttering to myself, denying the existence of what I saw. 
The message read, Joshua, you killed me. As I stared at the screen, I knew from the bottom of my heart that what I read over and over was Kelly's last message to me, though I wished that this this so desperately to be a dream. I knew no man on earth could imagine the images that still flashed through my mind even now. The way I turned, my soul burning in my body as I remembered the quest I embarked on originally. I could still feel the cold biting me, but I felt numb as if my nerve endings were, were severed by what I had seen. As I stumbled through the dark house, not daring to turn on a light for fear of something finding me, though there was no clear evidence of anything besides me inside, I prayed that this was just sleep deprivation. Finally, finally, I saw the open window. As I approached the window, I could not help but notice, as my mind screamed at me not to think this, that the window seemed to have been opened from the outside. As if some ethereal specter, a wraith of despair and hate, had forced its way in. Shaking, I closed the window and hurriedly turned, eager to rest my head on the pillow and forget this horrid experience. What I saw when I turned made me scream a sound of pure terror. Standing there was a corpse. Dressed in a white gown which hung torn and tattered from its near skeletal frame, its gnarled hands and the dim light provided by the moon alone appeared as claws curved and thin its frame. The horror of the sight is such that I cannot begin to describe. It was painfully thin, as if the moisture in its body was drained, its face... No, I cannot. What I saw was enough to drive another man to drink, but the sheer terror managed to somehow ground me to the present. I stared in fear as the thing that was once human screwed its face in what might be considered a smile. It uttered a word, a single damnable word that just nearly brought me to tears. Joshua. No longer frozen, I made the same decision that all of you would make had the same events happened to you. Without a moment's hesitation, fled the once human thing, searching desperately for a room to call sanctuary as the thing opened its mouth and uttered a horrible screech, as if the pits of Tartarus had opened and the cries of all the tortured souls of the underworld had come forth into our world. Aghast, I found a room in my house, down a flight of stairs that believed the creature could not find. I closed the door, locking it and barricaded it, just to be sure. And when I was satisfied that the creature wouldn't get in, I sat in a chair and thought. I tried to plan my escape from these cursed grounds, but no coherent thoughts could be formed, partially due to the fear of being caught, partially due to the screech that had echoed throughout the manor. There I sat, trying to think, when the scream that had become like background noise faded into oblivion. Relief should have flooded me, but all I felt was the icy grip of nervousness. If the creature stopped screaming, then it must have fled the house, or worse. Though I hated myself for even thinking this, the creature was lurking, attempting to be stealthy. As I sat alone in the room, the door blew asunder, managing to throw across the room all the objects I had used to keep the demonic thing out. I cannot believe what I saw, yet there it stood, like my thoughts had summoned the creature staring at me. It opened its mouth, and I cringed, expecting the horrific scream of before. But I was dead wrong. The ethereal whisper that came out of its mouth chilled me to my very core. No large sound came forth, but only a whisper, a horrible whisper. My love's last words. I'll see you soon. Tears welled up as I heard this. Those words had haunted me since the day the officers had shown up at my door. The moment I saw the squad car driving up the long, twisting driveway, I knew with a certainty beyond understanding that the love of my life had gone to rest. Now I stood, looking on a creature that was beyond human comprehension, some, some thing that could not be the love of my life. It was something completely different. As if sensing my thoughts, the face of the monster twisted into a snarl and uttered a sound. A terrible sound of hate. It raised its arms and still howling its ghastly war cry, charged towards me, intent on ending my life. I would have fled, but the thing blocked the door and there was no way I was going towards the evil thing. Instead, I reached for the nearest object, a fireplace poker, and as this was the only furnace room before the house had been upgraded to the modern age, wielding my weapon like a spear, I thrust the sharpened end at the monster and felt my weapon enter 
the living corpse that was besieging me. It fell forward. Limp and cold, colder than the bitter wind that now howled outside, and as I dodged the falling monster, I dashed for the exit. Running, I fled the room and decided then and there that this house needed the attention of someone who had experience in these matters, and I should run as far as I could from the monsters and spirits that haunted my family home. But as I made my way towards the front door, a sound, nearly imperceptible, drifted through the silence. As I climbed the stairs, the sound grew in volume slightly, and I could make out... Weeping. Female weeping. I stopped to listen. The sound had no placement in the house, as if it came from every corner of the manor. As I strained to listen, I missed a step and fell down a few stairs. The noise I made echoed throughout the house, and from the room I had fled in such a hurry, a slight moan escaped, as if the thing I had killed was stirring. However, no, the sound was perceptible. And I decided it best to run now whilst it was dead again. As I crested the stairs, the weeping once again grew in volume so I no longer had to strain to hear it. I turned the corner, still listening to the weeping and straining to hear if the monster had woken. Hurrying, I made my way through the dark room that stood between me and the door. And as I passed a window, however, I saw a sight that forced me to stop and gape. Even as the weeping grew in volume and the moaning started again, I saw the snow. Illuminated by the brilliant full moon, sparkling like a winter morning. I gazed at the fields of it, much more than should have been possible in such a short hour. I followed the drifts to the end of the lawn, which was normally lush and green. There the drifts ended. Beyond my lawn, it was as if it was a summer day. I knew then that I was not merely cursed by chance as some are in stories that you read, but cursed by something beyond what man can comprehend. Something straight out of the mind of a madman, a man driven to the brink of sanity by grief and fear. Shaking myself out of my daze, I once again sought the exit to this nightmare. The moans of the creature became wails, and I swore that I heard footsteps. The weeping grew once again louder, becoming now almost painful to hear. Still, I ran, for what else was I supposed to do? As the footsteps and the weeping still managed to grow louder, I could not speak from the fear, but I thought that the very instant I was free from this nightmare, I would burn this cursed mansion down, not sell it and have some other poor souls live with this. My thoughts were interrupted by the front door, which I very nearly slammed into. Elation crept into my chest, and I grabbed the knob and I pulled. No. No, the door was stuck, as the door to my room was, but this door was ten inches of thick oak. I couldn't simply hit it as I had the first. My elation turned to despair as I pulled and pulled. The footsteps became thumps as the creature began to climb the stairs. The cursed weeping grew in volume so that I wanted to cover my ears had I not had a task that I needed to complete. Still pulling and pounding, shouting obscenities at the door. All the while, the thumping of the monster on the stairs turned once again to footsteps as the monster crested the stairs. This gave me more incentive to kick and scream at the door, which seemed to be laughing at my efforts to open it, or possibly... That could be my imagination. As I still worked, the adrenaline in my body reaching a climax, the moans that had ceased before returned to the air. I turned and I saw the monster shuffling towards me as the weeping reached a crescendo, the noise seemingly assaulting every pore of my body. I would not be beaten, not here. With a tremendous shout, one I did not know I could make, I shoved the door with all of my might and with a mighty crash. It fell forward, me falling outside with it. Clambering to my feet, I turned, expecting to see the monster. But it was nowhere to be seen. Even the weeping had quieted. Believing myself to be free, I walked forward three steps before seeing... something. It was like a dream. I was standing near an accident scene with a large truck having a severely damaged bumper and a small car. By the heavens, it was Kelly's car. I was witnessing by some supernatural power the accident that fateful night. The car she drove was barely recognizable, a mass of tangled chassis. I drifted over, having no control where I went. Inside the mangled mass, 
I saw. She was horribly disfigured. More so than the officers had explained when I had asked to see my beloved's corpse, to say my final goodbyes. Blood ran everywhere. Leaking from many of Kelly's wounds, worse still was the fact that she was still alive. Her breath came shallow, but still there. Her eyes were moving, but likely due to the trauma of her accident and the fact that she was about to die, they were unfocused. The worst part? Her face looked exactly like the one of the corpse, dressed in the white shroud which had pursued me. With certainty, I knew that the corpse, that horrible monster, was my lovely girlfriend. She began to hyperventilate, and with what I somehow knew was her final breath, she looked up at the sky and cursed me for killing her. And then she was still. Her eyes closed. She slumped against the, the marred seat on which she sat. Seeing this, I knew that I would never be the same. I could not survive, knowing my wife-to-be had cursed me with her dying breath and made this all happen, and even as the dreamscape faded and I was left outside, I cared not, for I wished for death. As the snow and wind swirled around me, I fell to my knees, ignoring the stinging wind and the biting cold, and as I knew in the drifts, the more piled around me, I once again heard the weeping, and with a dark certainty. I knew from who and where those cries came. And as the dawn broke, and the sun peaked, its golden crown above the horizon, I gazed upon nothing. The snow, my corpse, and the manor had all vanished. All evidence washed away by the tears of my beloved. The snow rests pale on the naked metal of the shacks around me. The pastel paint stripped away in ugly patches. The rusted iron underneath layers orangish red at my intrusion, like a thousand fiery eyes set on the suffocating whiteness that's all around me. There's no one here in this deserted little village, this island in an endless sea of white and caprice cold. There's nothing else for miles, it seems. I'm all alone here. All I can do, all I can do is wait for the ceaseless wind to dismantle me, to chip away at me until the red rust underneath my painted facade is all exposed, and I become as silent as the town around me. I press myself up against the side of a shack to get out of the wind. Your shrieks and murmurs fade ever so slightly as I hide. I slowly ease myself onto the porcelain white ground and draw my knees to my chest to protect the waning heat in my core from the lashes of the cold. Daniel. No louder than a whisper. I'm sure I've imagined it. My name called from across the village, sounding as if it was shouted. But the wind rushing through the squat houses almost stole it away before it reached me. I stumbled to my feet heaving my body upward and craning my head towards the voice. I take a few steps towards it, the ice and snow forcing deliberate and careful steps, taunting me, who has no energy for such things. I walk onward, and even as I approach, I feel the wind rushing by my face, taking with it bits of warmth, chips of paint. I reach the farthest flung house. There's no one here. Everything is silent and still, besides the shuddering of my shoulders as the coal lifts the warmth from them in sheets. 
The wind strips away the paint from everything. I'm raw, red, rusty. The orangish red eyes grow wider, amazed that I persist in movement amongst them. Daniel. Again, the voice calls. No louder than before. I must have missed it in the din shrieks and murmurs. This time, though, the voice comes from behind me, on the other side of the village, back where I was. My eyes water as the wind tries to pry them out. I begin trudging towards the voice. Perhaps we pass each other. Perhaps whoever is out there is pursuing me, just as I pursue them. As the wind passed both of us, I march in loose, fumbling steps towards the voice, back through the town back through all the red eyes. I fall once or twice. <sighs> it feels so good to rest. I might just fall asleep there. I rise each time, however. The voice draws me onward. I reach the other end of the village, looking out into the stormy sea of ice on all sides of this little island of paint and bleary red eyes. There's no one here but me. Daniel. The voice calls once again, with muffled insistence, but no closer than ever. Somehow now, from the opposite side of the decrepit shacks that beckon me, I turn to it, but I can't face those eyes. Not again. Oh, I'm so very cold. Yeah, it's so good to rest. God, I love Christmas. Out of all the thoughts swirling around in Andy's mind, that one was front and center. The house before him was perfect. A two-story European style with tall windows outlined with sparkling Christmas lights. A wraparound porch with two antique rocking chairs and a curving driveway with a gleaming blue Lamborghini and a brand new GMC Savannah parked at the end. In the backyard, he could see a swing set, the three swings, and three miniature electric play cars, two bright pink, one dark blue. Such opulence, in and of itself, was enough to fan the flames of greed within him. But the kicker was that the place was secluded, the only house at the end of a long offshoot of a small road, which ran through a small town that was a full two and a half miles away. The Rochefort's. The family in question had all left, going out on the town as they did every Thursday night, perhaps this time to celebrate Christmas Eve in style. Ah, oh, these asshats are just begging to get robbed, he thought. His frozen lips curled into a smile. It had taken three weeks of near constant observation for him to memorize their daily and nightly patterns. If he was being honest with himself, he could have done it in one week. The Rochaforts were a very punctual family, with set routines that they rarely ever broke. But he had to be more thorough than usual. He had far more to lose this time around. He had been caught twice already. Smaller felonies both times, but he knew realistically that he wasn't the type who could survive while in prison. Plus, he had done some research on the Rochaforts and had found that their father and mother were both heads of the respective companies, both of which, by his math, brought in a little more than two billion dollars a year. If the robbery ahead of him was a success, he could live out the rest of his days without needing to resort to crime. He could get away from his hellhole of a house with its clinging, sour odor, stained ceiling, and groaning pipes. He wouldn't need to listen to the mice moving behind the thin walls, wouldn't need to awaken to the tickle of insect legs on his bare skin. 
He could run from the crumbling neighborhood that he had been holed up in, with its leering gang members and filthy vagrants. He wouldn't need to watch his back every time he left his house, no more ignoring the taunts of crips and bloods and bold addicts. No more stepping around puddles of vomit, no more living in fear of getting skewered by a stray needle at that dingy local Goodwill. He'd be free. Andy smiled brightly as he envisioned himself speeding along a sunny, warm stretch of highway in a car that cost 20 times more than what his job as a grocery clerk paid. He saw himself amidst a tangled, breathing knot of naked women, all beautiful, all hungry for him. He saw himself sleeping on a bed the size of a car, in a penthouse, where there were no mice, or stains, or weird smells. His reverie was cut short by a sudden blast of snowstring wind that almost made him gasp. Shaking himself free from those happy might bees, Andy stood up from behind the snowbank he had been using as cover and took in the area. Behind him was a sprawling field. Before him was the road and the house. To the right, the road ended in a small cul-de-sac, and to the left, the road led out to its larger sibling. High above him, a full moon hung low in a starless sky and cast the snow-covered grounds in a ghostly light. All was silent save for the whistle of the wind through the trees which bordered the area in Andy's own breathing. All right, he thought, his breaths turning to vapor on his lips. Time to go. Andy hopped over the snowbank and moved across the street and up the driveway, a large bag clutched in his gloved hands. Managing to keep his eyes off the shiny sleek metal of either one of the cars, which was quite the feat for him. The security systems on the door which led into the garage were easy to unlock. The thumbprint scanner which safeguarded the door inside of the garage, the one which led to the house, was a bit trickier, taking a good 20 minutes to bypass, but he got the job done. Upon entering what he supposed was the mudroom, Andy nearly retched the sudden tidal wave of odor that crashed into him. God, it reeks like St. Nick's shit party, he thought, wrinkling his nose. The stink of artificial vanilla mixed with the burning spice stench of gingerbread-scented candles and spine-scented cleaning fluid hung in the air like an invisible fog. A miasma of the most Christmassy smells possible. Once he was able to get past the initial nausea at the all-encompassing stink, Andy moved into the foyer and looked the place over. The foyer was large and spotless. Its hardwood floors glowed in the dim light of a dozen candles. To his left was the media room, a Christmas tree weighed down by so many ornaments that only a few green patches of pine were visible. It stood next to a media center with a 50-inch plasma screen and more game consoles than he thought existed. To his right was the kitchen. Done up in stainless steel and sleek chrome. Beyond that, there was a window that looked into the backyard, and in front of him was the staircase which led to the second floor. Andy glanced between the three ways, and quickly decided upon the second floor, where the family members' rooms would be. And reason stood. They're more valuable trinkets, too. As he ascended the stairs, a family picture caught his eye. He had only observed the Rochefort's activities from a distance, only seeing them as vague, far-off figures milling about their activities like ants in an ant farm. So Andy stopped and stared. The picture showed all four family members crowded together, a mother and father standing behind two little girls, all of them smiling widely, showing off their blindingly white, perfectly capped teeth. Andy grimaced. Everything about their appearance, from their perfect hair and teeth to their obviously expensive clothing and the stunning, unsubtle makeup which plastered their gaunt, aristocratic features, all screamed that these were the kind of people who had no care or consideration for anyone but themselves. And he hated those types of people. 
the soccer moms, the royalty of the PTA meetings, the ones who looked down on people who hadn't been able to afford college, the modern-day aristocrats. The thief raised his fist and brought it down on the picture, grinning as the shattered glass cut the picture behind it, ruining those perfect faces. He continued on his way, his steps muffled by shag carping. When he reached the top, he found that the hallway which curved to his left was dark as night. Briefly, he considered finding a light switch, but he didn't want to chance someone coming by and thinking that something was up. So he reached into his pocket and pulled out a small flashlight. The flashlight's blue beam cut through the darkness and allowed him to see the five rooms ahead of him, two on each side and one at the end. That one was, he guessed, the master bedroom. Save the best for last, he thought, turning to enter the first room. The room belonged to one of the girls. It was spacious enough to have a tiny bathroom that held nothing of interest within. The main room was filled with high-end toys and painted a red-pink color that awakened discomfort in him. The paint mixed with a lack of light made him think of the inside of a mouth. With an extra burst of speed that he told himself wasn't due to unease, he cleaned out what he thought would fetch the best price on one of those deep web black market sites and then moved on to the next room. This one was much the same as the other room, but the bathroom in this one was larger, and a quick search of the cabinets revealed several bottles of Prozac, Ritalin, Thorazine, and a tiny tin of small black pills which he couldn't identify, but looked worth taking anyway. He was about to leave when his eyes landed on two objects in the sink. Two small plastic jars filled to the halfway point with blue liquid. Are those... denture containers? Andy moved closer and looked at the rest of the area surrounding the sink. He saw several high-end toothbrushes, several stacked rolls of dental floss, and a tube of bubblegum toothpaste. Maybe the kids have braces or mouth guards? Maybe the silver spoons in their mouths fucked up their teeth. And he snorted and backed off, shaking his head in annoyance. Maybe I should take some of that riddle and get my head in the game, he said tersely, turning around and walking out of the room. The two rooms opposite him were locked, but the door to the master bedroom was wide open. Inside was a massive wardrobe which sat next to another bathroom, a bookshelf filled with books on physics and New Age spiritualism, a mirrored dresser and a massive canopy bed with silk sheets above which sat a large painting. And he took note of the painting as he cleaned out the room, taking gleaming jewelry from an ornate box on the dresser and several higher-end pills from the bathroom, which he saw had two more plastic jars. Once he was satisfied with the work, he turned and jumped up onto the bed, wincing at the muffled shriek of the springs. The painting was large and set in a gold frame. If he was being honest with himself, Andy had to admit that he had seen that gold frame and remembered the old spy movie trope of the safe behind the painting. He had barely glanced at that painting, and now that he had, he was a bit disturbed. It was a pretty simplistic painting, all things considered. Just a dreary-looking field of brown flowers underneath a swollen gray sky, with a shadow of a farmhouse in the distance. But there was something about it. Something about the limited color palette, the way the grass was caught in mid-sway in that faint... And the decrepit building in the background, all framed by an ominous, sunless sky. And he couldn't help but marvel at how utterly out of place it was. A stain amidst all the glamorous, shiny wealth. Still, he had to see if there was anything behind it. His bag has grown heavy. So he sat it down beside the bed and gently pulled the painting off its hook. There was no safe behind it, no high-tech vault door with chrome keys and complex dials or fingerprint scanners, but there was something. Two 
small gold key pressed into the plaster. This, these must be the keys to those two doors, he thought. Hell of a place to put them. Sparing a quick backwards glance, Andy took the keys, hopped off the bed, and went out into the hall. The first key he tried to open the second door. A second after, the darkness inside poured out like water from a burst dam. He turned his flashlight on. The click of the press button sounded like a gunshot to him. Has the house always been this silent? He wondered briefly as he shone the light into the room. The beam illuminated a vertical stripe of wood-paneled floor. And the edge of something he couldn't fully see. Grumbling in annoyance, Andy fumbled round until his hand landed on the light switch. He flicked it on and the room was bathed by the harsh white light of a fluorescent bulb. Andy had expected a spare bedroom or maybe some kind of high-end kinky sex dungeon. Instead, he found himself looking into a plain, unpainted, windowless room which was filled with display cases and shelves and cardboard boxes stacked in neat pillars. A storage room? And he moved into the room and went to the shelves nearest him. They were dusted and well maintained, but simply made, and filled with an assortment of seemingly random things a rubber ducky, a walkman, an old bust of some philosopher, a Swiss army knife with all of its attachments extended, an orange peeler, and a worn elf doll with its bendy legs dangling off the lip of the shelf. And he felt the tiny hairs in his arms stand up. It wasn't the cold that was doing it. He turned and took in the rest of the room. Almost every shelf was filled with the same sorts of random knickknacks with the exception of one. For that shelf held rows of books, each without titles on their spines, each one old and disintegrating. And in the center of the opposite wall was a large, dark purple flag with what looked like small hieroglyphics sewn into the edges. At the center, dyed in blue, was a serpent eating its own tail, surrounded by eight green stars. What the hell are these people into, he thought, moving towards the flag to get a better look. As he did, his foot caught on a box and he stumbled, putting his hands out to protect him from the collision, slamming into the wall with a grunt. He pushed himself upright and then stood still listening for any sounds out of that long cultivated instinct. There was nothing. The house was silent. Letting out a relieved sigh, Andy turned his attention to the box which had tipped over, spilling its content on the floor. Andy's eyes went to them. He bent down and picked up one of the objects. A wallet. Andy opened it. Inside was a picture of a young woman, with black hair and freckles. Her license identified her as Alice Whitmore, age 23. And he looked at the date. 1987. A sliver of ice speared his heart. The thief grabbed the box and opened it, sending dozens of wallets of every type, from glossy leather to cheap bacon print, tumbling to the floor. And he took several and read names and dates on them. Young black man named Howard Morris, whose license had expired in 1980. A shy-looking woman with an upturned nose, Angelica Pritchard, 1977. A thuggish bald man whose face was adorned with piercings, Andrew Bennett, 1976. As Andy read each of them, the coldness in his chest grew and tentacled outward, making his fingers shake and fumble, sucking the moisture from his mouth and muting the sounds around him so that all he could hear was his own rapidly degenerating breaths. The glass wallet in his hand was cracked and worn. A smiling man with a strong jaw and happy eyes stared out from a black and white photo that was yellowed with age. Warren Meeks, 1923. Below him, a muffled sound echoed up through the floor. A door opening. Andy, his heart already racing, gasped and dropped the wallet. Oh, God, they're home. He turned and left the room as 
quietly as his trembling body would allow, returning to the master bedroom to get his bag before exiting via the window, and he stopped when he entered the room. I left my bag next to the bed, right? He thought, feeling the first clammy beads of cold sweat starting to form on his brow. He bent and quickly checked under the bed, hoping that he had accidentally kicked it underneath and not noticed. He could see nothing but dusty bunnies. What the hell happened to my bag? He thought frantically. From downstairs, several voices began to converse, their low tones creeping up on him from the stairway. Soon, he knew he'd hear their footsteps. They'd no doubt want to come up and get ready for bed. There was no time. Thinking on his feet, Andy grabbed the keys and went to the first door the one that he hadn't opened. He unlocked it and slipped in, pressing his ear to the door in time to hear the sounds of the family's conversation grow louder as they ascended the stairs. The conversation died down when they reached the top. A door opened. Then another. He could hear them whispering to each other. They knew something was wrong. Andy's stomach clenched. A sudden shout high and shrill and very angry tore through the silence. It was followed by the sounds of running feet and low curses. Andy backed away, a fearful whine building in his throat. He had never in all his life been so frightened as he was now. A memory came to him, a memory of him playing hide-and-seek with his father out in the woods at dusk. His dad had been a complicated man, an early age traumatic head injury having burdened him with episodes of forgetfulness. That day, as the sun had started to go down, he had one of those episodes. He had left little Andy all alone in the cold woods, waiting for his father to find him as the sun sank beneath the horizon and darkness fell. Andy shivered and turned away from the door. He wasn't too high up. If he could get to a window, he could escape, could run from the house, and the Rochfords could be... Andy stopped in his tracks. There was a window and the ghostly light of the moon shone through the pane to reveal another bedroom. It didn't look like a spare bedroom, no. This room smelled of stale sweat and old food. The large bed in the corner was unmade and its sheets were stained. An IV stand stood guard at the foot of the bed, gleaming silver in the moonlight. The exception of the bed... The only other furniture in the room was a small desk with a TV on it. What the hell? I thought the Rosharts were a family of four. A light clicked on in his periphery. He turned, feeling the terror rise in his gorge like vomit. The light of the bedroom, which he hadn't noticed in his unease, was on. A tall, bulky figure stood in the doorway. The light behind it obscured its face. Andy tried to speak, tried to will his hands into fists, tried to force his body to move, but he couldn't. The tension in his body made his muscles feel like cement, tiny beads of moisture walled up in his eyes. The figure spoke, its voice deep and slightly garbled. Howdy, friendo. Andy's bladder had released as the figure charged at him. A massive shadowed fist rose and fell. and the world went black. Andy awoke to the feeling of a cold finger pressed into his side. He jerked upright or tried to. His sudden movement was arrested by a painful tightness in his throat, wrists, and ankles. Tied up. Tied up. Oh God, I'm tied up. He took stock of himself. He was naked. The binds around his wrists and ankle chafed at his skin, and the one around his throat gagged him if he moved his head even the slightest inch. Whimpers forced themselves from his clenched teeth as tears leaked from his eyes. Hey! He's awake, da! roared a voice next to him, the suddenness drawing forth a frightened scream from Andy. A door opened, and several sets of feet entered the room. A quartet of shadows clustered around him. The overhead light blotted over their bodies. Silence fell. He could feel the Rochefort's eyes on him, scanning every inch of him. And he whimpered again and wished that he could curl into a ball or use his hands to cover his genitals. The feeling of vulnerability, the sheer humiliation of being examined in such a way felt wrong beyond words. 
Hands grabbed his thighs and squeezed painfully, eliciting a shriek. The family laughed. This one's got some fat on him, said the mother. Yeah, but not as much as some of the others. Why can't we find a fat man? The city has lots of them, whined one of the daughters. The last one we had was that skinny brat from the homeless shelter, so stop being so picky, growled the man who had called for the father, the one whose room Andy had intruded upon. Yeah, Lori, plus the city's a few hours away and it's too big. We probably wouldn't find anyone before the sun rose, and I doubt the car would hold him if we did. The voice belonged to the other daughter. Natalie's right. I think he'll do just fine, said the father. Now let's lift him up so that he can see us. I want him to know just how badly he's fucked up. He found the wallet, Star, said the son. I think he knows already. The father shushed him. Shush now. What we're doing is tradition, and you know what your mother and I say about tradition. That is important to keep some things constant, said Natalie and the son at the same time. Very good, kids. Andy could hear the smile on the man's face. Then, with a loud ratcheting of gears, the table that Andy was strapped to lifted up until the faces of the Rochfords came into view. At first glance, the faces of the four in the photo were exactly the same with their high and hollow cheekbones, their aquiline noses, and their perfect hair. But they smiled at him. Their teeth weren't the straight white teeth that he had seen in the pictures. Instead, he saw rows of triangular, yellowed fangs set in swollen, liver-colored gums. Shark's teeth. Get over here, kiddo, said the mother jovially. Show the man your chompers. The sun came into the light, and Andy wailed like a puppy with a broken leg. The other members of the family at least looked normal if they kept their mouths closed and their lips pursed the sun. The sun was something that couldn't be called human in any light. A swollen, hairless head with almond-shaped eyes set in sunken sockets set far apart from a crooked nose that overhung a maw. A red gash in the doughy white flesh that was bristled with black and sharp teeth. Nice to meet ya, said the sun, his mouth curling to a distorted facsimile of a smile. Andy felt the horror of everything roar through his body. It burned past the muscles and viscera, burrowed through the veins and arteries with lamprey teeth, and plucked at the nerves like guitar strings. His body went limp, his tongue felt thick and dry, and foreign in his mouth he had been rendered mute. The mother gasped, revealing a second set of glistening fangs behind the first one. Well, goodness gracious me, look at the time, it's one on the dot. The faces of the sun and both the daughters broke into wide, excited grins, their teeth shone like yellow Christmas lights against their pale skin. Does that mean we get to open our presents? said Natalie. The mother nodded, smiling. Of course you can. Do you want to open the biggest one first? Yes, yes, chorused the children. The mother turned to the father, whose predatory gaze was locked onto his captive and asked, You know where the knives are, right? Yep. The father's smile widened, and he clapped his hands. Okay, kids, I'm gonna go upstairs, and when I come back, we can start with the unwrapping. He turned and left, whistling Holly Jolly Christmas through his teeth. The song sounded high and keening sibilant and filtered through fangs. Andy whimpered and prayed for the nightmare to end. It didn't.